very good morning to all of you and greetings from St. Xavier's College. I am Dr. Vijay Lobo, Assistant Professor, Department of Botany, St. Xavier's College, Mumbai. It gives me immense pleasure to welcome you all to the one day national webinar on tree ecosystem restoration organized by St. Xavier's College in collaboration with National Society of Friends of Trees. Tree planting as a way to restore local ecosystem is fast becoming popular. Trees have many advantages. They capture atmospheric carbon, protect and fertilize soil, supply firewood and timber. Forest also plays a cultural, spiritual and recreational role essential for human well-being. The new enthusiasm for trees is therefore crucial. Individuals and organizations can make an impact through tree eco-restoration on various scales. The United Nations has declared 2021-2030 as the decade of ecosystem restoration, giving five basic principles for getting it right. And one of them is ask an expert. And this is what our webinar is doing. We have brought together six such experts from across the country to share with us their knowledge and experience on this topic. I again welcome you all, our distinguished speakers, Dr. Kirti Ghate, Dr. Usha Lachumpa, Dr. Ranjan Panda, Sri Srinivas Kashinath, Dr. Nitesh Joshi, Professor Dr. A.D. Savant, who is also the chairman of National Society of Friends of Trees. I welcome our respected principal, Dr. Rajendra Shinde, Saint, Principal, St. Xavier's College, and Dr. Firoza J. Godrej, President Emirates, National Society of Friends of Trees. I welcome all the members of National Society of Friends of Trees, teachers from all over Mumbai colleges, and students from all over the country. I now hand over the program to the anchors for today, the very enthusiastic Ms. Anush Anushka Agarwal, our MSc Part 1 student, also President Xavier's Association of Botany, and our ever ready Mr. Shubham Patikar, Vice President Xavier's Association of Botany. Firoza, ma'am, our students have very enthusiastically planned and are eager to participate in this program. I hand over this mic to the anchor for now, that is Ms. Anushka Agarwal. Good morning, everyone. I am Anushka Agarwal, and it gives me immense pleasure to welcome you all to our national webinar. I surely do hope we learn a lot by the end of today. Before we move forward, I'd like to read out a few instructions that will remain the same for each session. Firstly, please keep your mics on mute throughout the session so as to block out any disturbances to the speaker. Towards the end, we will be sending you a feedback form which you'll need to fill in to get your certificates. At the end of every session, there will be a Q&A round where you will get to ask our speakers a few questions for which we encourage you to type them down in the chat box so that they can be addressed then. This seminar is being recorded, so please do make sure to respect the organizers and speakers and maintain all basic netiquettes. This is the end of our in instructions. Now, before we begin with the seminar, it's just right to offer a prayer. And with that intention in heart, one of our FYBSE students, Pratiksha, has recorded a prayer song, which I will now be presenting. Let's 
सूरज के ओट में माटे के कोख में सूरज के ओट में माटे के कोख में बूंदों से पाल मैं छाया धूलन चला मैं छाया धूलन चला वहीं पे मैं छाया धूलन चला मैं छाया धूलन चला खुद ही बनाओ अपना गरोंदा रोंद के डालिया बड़ी हवा जो खेले जिंदगी से औरों को दूंगा लिया नीर बहाता वो धीमे से मुस्कुराता वो भी है उसमें भी प्राण भरा हंसते मिटाकर खुद के मन के बन खुशबू मिलती है उसमें भी प्यार भरा फिर भी मैं मूर्ख ही रहा छाया धूलन चला मैं छाया धूलन चला वही पे मैं छाया धूलन चला मैं छाया धूलन चला Beautiful. <laughs> Moving on, it's a pleasure to tell you a little bit about our organizers of today. Saint Xavier's College, Mumbai, was founded in 1869 by the Society of Jesus, and has recently completed its 150 years of excellence in education. It was awarded academic autonomy by the University of Mumbai in 2010. The college mis- mission stands on its vision of provokins ad volandum, which means challenging to fly. The college endeavors to create an environment that generates a love <coughs> of learning, the habit of critical thinking, and the ability for accurate expression. Our bladder herbarium has plant collections from India and abroad, made by Father Ethelbert Blatter S. J. His associates and students from the beginning of the 20th century laid the foundation for one of the best herbariums of its time in Western India. It provides facilities for the studies of plant systematics and has a well-stocked library on systematic botany. The herbarium has received the Sir Ratan Tata Trust grant to upgrade and digitize the plant database. The National Society of the Friends of the Trees was founded in 1957. The activities of the society include public lectures, exhibitions, sapling distribution, tree plantation programs through educational institutions, housing societies, corporate and government agencies. Annual events include vegetable, fruit and flower shows. nature drawing competitions for school children and a seminar varnashobha the journal of the society is an annual publication devoted to environment conservation regular nature outings are conducted for its members throughout the year the patrons of today are dr firoza j godrej president emeritus national society of the friends of the trees and dr rajendra shinde principal st xavier's college autonomous mumbai and the organizing committee includes the department of botany st xavier's college autonomous mumbai and the rapporteur for today is dr shashi rekha suresh kumar former head of the department of botany mithibai college mumbai for the inauguration i'd now like to call upon dr rajendra shinde principal of st xavier's college Dr Shinde has done his MSc and doctorate degree from our very own St Xavier's College and after that 
he joined Blatter Herbarium as a curator for nine years and then the teaching faculty in the Department of Botany. He also served at the University of Guyana, South America as a senior lecturer. He has successfully guided his PhD and MSc students and has been an author of over 20 national and international research papers. He has successfully completed research grants received from various funding agencies like Rajiv Gandhi Science and Technology Commission, Government of Maharashtra, UGC, and University of Mumbai. He also has international collaborations with the Burbeck College, University of London, and University of Bonn, Germany for various research activities. He also received various scholarships and awards during his career. And to name a few, the Fulbright Scholarship 2012, the Rotary International Award Pittsburgh 2000, and the N.A. Irani Memorial Scholarship during his MSc. Sir, it gives me immense pleasure to now open the online dais for you. Thank you, Anushka, for setting the tone. You didn't have to... There was no need to introduce me. You could have saved time. Anyway, uh, very good morning to everyone. A warm welcome to our chief guest, Dr. Firoja Godrish, President Emeritus National Society of the Friends of Trees. Professor Arun Savant, former Vice Chancellor, University of Rajasthan, and former Pro Vice Chancellor, University of Mumbai. And now the President, the National Society of the Friends of Trees. Father Keith D'Souza, Rector, St. Xavier's College. Our, all our distinguished speakers for today's webinar, all the participants, all the office bearers of FOT and FOT members, my colleagues and fellow students. I'm very pleased to see so many of you have registered here today for this virtual national webinar to participate, to discuss, learn and act on the serious issue like trees and their role in eco-restoration. I'm told that we have more than 200 registrations from across the country. The word nature lets one imagine a beautiful picture of sparkling white and surrounded by emerald green water or a calm green forest with a glint of sunlight or a snow-kissed mountains with encircling clouds. Just we saw the prayers ha had all these pictures in the prayer in embedded. The nature is indeed synonymous with exotic, beautiful and serene. But what happens when nature gets furious? Tsunamis, cyclone, hailstorms, floods, earthquakes, etc. And, and those then we call natural disasters. These natural disasters claim thousands of lives all over the globe every year, causing the great economic and human losses. Many ecosystems are affected by these natural calamities. The main question is, is nature to be blamed solely? Aren't we human majorly responsible? Since the beginning of civilization, the trees have furnished us two of life's essentials, food and oxygen. As we evolved, they provided additional necessities such as shelter, medicines and various other things. Today, the value continues to increase and more benefits of trees are being discovered as their role expands to satisfy the needs created by our modern lifestyles. Trees contribute to their environment by providing oxygen, improving air quality, climate betterment, conserving water, preserving soil, and supporting wildlife. During the process of photosynthesis, trees take in carbon dioxide and produce oxygen we breathe, what we have learned from the childhood. Both above and below ground, trees are essential to the ecosystems in which they reside. Ecological restoration is an inten intentional activity that initiates or accelerates the recovery of an ecosystem with respect to its health, integrity, and sustainability. Frequently, 
the ecosystem that requires restoration has been degraded, damaged, transformed, or entirely destroyed as the direct or indirect result of human activities. In some cases, these impacts to ecosystems have been caused or aggravated by the natural agencies such as wildfire, floods, storms, and volcanic eruptions to the point at which the ecosystem cannot recover its pre-disturbance state or its historic developmental trajectory. I'm sure we all will learn more about this three eco-restoration and ecosystems methods and need to do these restorations from our experts today. Though Dr. Vijaya and Anushka has mentioned about the college, I would like to add few things about our college. We have, we have since Avis is established in 1869, and we've got autonomy in year 2010. This year is our 153rd year. We have been NAC re-accredited three times and all three times we have scored top, top grades. Last four or five years, we were the only college from Mumbai to acquire a spot in top 100 colleges list of national institutional ranking framework. We have been awarded College of Potential of Excellence, CPE grant, twice and now College of Excellence C award in 2014 by the UGC. In addition, the best college of University of Mumbai, Department of Science Technology, FIST DBT star status of our science departments are just a few to mention here. RUSA has recognized our contribution to the higher education by giving five crore grant for our infrastructure development. Department of Biotechnology Government of India recently gave us three crores under the builder scheme for research component. We also like to sensitize our students towards inclusion and their social responsibilities. And our very student does a minimum, every student does a minimum of 50 hours of compulsory social involvement program. Through various programs, seminars, webinars, lectures, our students are also made aware of various other social issues and among these issues, environment is one of the top, top priority. Today's webinar is also one of such activity. I would like to thank the authorities of the National Society of Friends of Trees for supporting and giving us this opportunity to host this webinar. I'm also grateful to all the speakers for agreeing to share their experience and expertise today with our participants and students. Thank you so much. I wish you all a very fruitful deliberation in today's webinar. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir, for your words. I'd now like to call upon Larissa Kohelo, a student from second year BSc, to introduce Dr. Firoza J. Godrich. Dr. Firoza J. Kotrich, President Emeritus of the National Society of the Friends of Trees, FOT, has been instrumental in raising awareness about the importance of trees. Through various plantation drives and nature trails, FOT has played a significant role in bringing attention to the reducing green cover in Mumbai. She is an art historian and a PhD in ancient Indian culture. As a member of the Apex Committee of the National Gallery of Modern Art, and former chairperson of the advisory committee of the National Gallery of Modern Art Mumbai, a valuable contribution enhanced the cultural fabric of the city and was recognized by the Ministry of Culture, Government of India. Dr. Godrich also serves as a trustee of Dr. Bhavatachi Lad Museum, Impact India Foundation, and C. Cabot Corp. India. She is the chairperson of the Museum Society of Mumbai which stimulates interest in art and culture among the general public. Earlier, she was a former vice president of the Bombay National History Society and helped raise money through the art for the BNHS. Dr. Godrich is of the view that it is essential to bring in the younger generation, the likes of students and faculty of botany and zoology to ensure a sustainable future.
Dr. Firoza, over to you. Yes. Thank you so much, Larissa. Uh, yes, it is very important to raise funds for events. I never had that mentioned in any of my introductions, but I'm delighted to be amongst you. I'm delighted and congratulate uh, everyone at Xavier's College, Dr. Rajendra Shinde, for the wonderful laurels that you have achieved since you uh, became autonomous and your work towards gaining this autonomy and your spontaneous acceptance of participating with FOT whenever we have requested to join hands with you. It is indeed a privilege for us at the National Society of the Friends of Trees, which is an NGO based out of Mumbai, India. And our main thrust is protecting the trees, as our title suggests, but the environment in general. Shashi Rekha, Suresh Kumar, you have also come to the help of FOT and you're a staunch member, as, a, as is Vijaya Lobo, ably led by our professor, Dr. Arun Savant, and his team of Sakina and other long-standing members. I see Dr. Latu here. Uh, we couldn't have survived so long and done so well without the support of such stalwarts. Thank you, Father Keith D'Souza, Rector of Xavier's. You have always extended a helping hand to FOT. What a wonderful topic we have selected for this morning, tree echo restoration. We in Bombay have really faced the onslaught of tree decimation, destruction, some natural calamities and some unfortunately very willfully done. I'm delighted that our six speakers are going to address individual topics in their special field of interest. Dr. KP, I'm looking forward to your lecture as with Dr. Ranjan Pandey, Dr. Usha Nanjukpa, Srinivas Kashinath, Nitish Joshi, and of course, Professor Savan. It's a sad state of affairs in our country that we have such a poor green cover. Statistics are well-meaning, and we need them. Without data, it, do, it doesn't hold good, whatever we're trying to do or whatever you scientists are trying to do in a scientific and systematic way. But sometimes I really doubt these numbers. Yes, we have at our fingertips, literally at our fingertips through Google and all the maps that we have, aerial maps, to show an increase in the green cover. But I think we need very, very serious scientific determination to correct these figures if they need to be, to tap ourselves on our backs if they are actually correct. Because today, anything is possible in this digital mode. And I'm not a doubting Thomas, but we have to be practical. Just talking about Bombay, we're one of the richest corporations in India. And how much are we actually doing for the environment, for trees, for water, for sewage, for garbage, etc.? I don't know. I'm looking forward to the discussions this morning. I know that they are going to be very thought-provoking. It's a uh, Tree plantation is done seasonally with, by our volunteers. It's a distant dream to see these trees grow, but we plant today for the generations of tomorrow. We have to have nurseries, good storage nurseries, banks of nurseries, so that if there is a pandemic or an epidemic amongst our tree friends, we are there to quickly put in this demand of tree saplings. And I find that it's the nursery people who join us do laudable work. We are very conscious that we want indigenous trees, not just pretty flowering trees, which are not non-indigenous to India. And I know in the past mistakes have been made, but they were not done deliberately. They were done for lack of knowledge. 
So with more knowledge at our disposal, I hope the nursery men will also be in a position to give us saplings so that we plant the right type of tree in the right type of soil and in the right type of environment. The ignorance of the past was blissful. We've done our best, but now with the knowledge and the data, we have to improve the circumstances we find ourselves in and restore the damage as soon as it occurs, like we have been facing on both our coastlines with cyclones and tsunamis and high velocity winds, which uh, have reached the shores of India, which they were not there in the past with the force that they have been approaching the coastline recently. We have taken many incentive, in, uh, incentives to correct our wrongs. I'm not focusing on the ills. Students, don't be discouraged. But if we know what mistakes we made, whatever muddling problems we went through, we are better equipped to look at the future and value the undervalued part of nature that we are surrounded with today. Any collateral damages have to be addressed. Thank you very much, everyone, for joining us. We have a large registration list. We have a long day ahead of us. It's going to be extremely meaningful. And speakers, each and every one of you personally, thank you for giving up your time. Thank you for, you know, all your, your, your documentation. We'll be going into Vanashoba, which is really a flagship. We're a small society, but we want to do whatever we do consistently. And we want to maintain the standard that we have set over the last 20 years. Earlier, there were different standards. We are appreciative of our very, very, very appreciative of our founder presidents and um, board that has advised us. And we cherish the history and the legacy that we have inherited. And we're looking forward to the future generations joining us. It's a volunteer organization, but it will be very, very rewarding for every single student who comes in contact with the National Society of the Friends of Trees. That's how I joined, just a sheer love for nature. You heard through the bio that I'm an art historian and a picture researcher, but nature is the best landscape I could have ever worked with. So thank you very, very much. Good luck to all of you. Looking forward to the articles. Thank you for your time and have a very interesting deliberation. Over to you, Anushka. Thank you. Thank you so much, ma'am. It was so good hearing from you. And it really, I think it helped us all build a little bit more love for nature now. Um, now, moving forward, I'd like to call upon Miss Angel Martin from first year BSc to introduce Professor Dr. A.D. Savant. Over to you, Angel. Professor Dr. A.D. Savant is a professor of chemistry. He was a former professor at the Institute of Science, Mumbai. Later on, he was appointed Joint Director Higher Education, followed by Vice Chancellor at Mumbai University and then Vice Chancellor at the University of Rajasthan. He obtained PhD in chemistry in 1979 from Institute of Science, Mumbai University. He joined as a lecturer in chemistry at an institute and rose to the post of professor in 1998. After doing research under an eminent professor, Dr. B.C. Haldar, soon he established a strong school of research in fields of nuclear, inorganic, analytical, solid state, and environmental chemistry. He was the head of inorganic chemistry and environmental science department, was instrumental in starting MSc in environmental science at Mumbai University for the first time in 1997. His work on heavy metal pollution was of special significance and brought many industrial pollution issues, including lead pollution at Dadra Nagar Haveli to notice, which furthermore began an initiative to go for unleaded petrol in India. Professor Dr. Savant guided 26 students for PhD and published over 150 original research papers in high impact foreign and Indian journals. He has also contributed articles to Encyclopedia of Analytical Science, 
published by Cambridge University, also in streamlining administrative issues of universities, establishment of Shikshin Shulk Samiti, Pravesh Niyantran Samiti, and creating way for autonomy to colleges, as well as writing of Private University Act, Law University Act for the state of Maharashtra and Rajasthan. He is a member of many universities and college committees across India. He is a scientist in charge of Indian Chemical Society and member of editorial board for its new Elsevier edition. He has received many Indian and global awards. He is currently director of Waste Energy Research and Technology Council of Columbia University, member of World Water Council, president of Society for Clean Environment, chief trustee of Institute of Science, Golden Jubilee of Trust Fund and Chairman of National Society of Friends of Trees. I'm honored to present to you our patron, Professor Dr. A.D. Savant. A hearty welcome to you, sir. Sir, I'd now request you to say a few words. The dais is all yours. Oh, thank you so much. Uh, um, I feel like refreshed of my own achievements and my biodata. I don't know from where you got it and uh, Thank you very much for all that, but it's good to know that uh, the speakers and have such a strong gathering of 72 participants, I can see here. Uh, at the outset, uh, I uh, thank and welcome. This is a joint uh, collaborative seminar. So on behalf of National Society of Friends of Trees, I must welcome you all, the principal, uh, Dr. Rajendra Shinde, all members of Managing Council, and our most esteemed uh, President Emeritus, Dr. Feroza Gojarich, and many of you. Uh, before I see, because everybody is going to speak on this very important issue, but I have special word of appreciation for the development and achievements which Principal uh, Shinde has said about the St. Javier College. I think institution is really heading fast for its excellence. And we are privileged to have been associated with such esteemed institutions, which is as old as the University of Mumbai. Uh, and we know about it, uh, everybody, and uh, very significantly in the subject we are talking, Blatter, Harbury. Uh, we are going to have an MOU with the institutions because we sought for it because they are in a commanding position. We are the workers in the frames of the trees. And uh, I was extremely happy to have one venture that Uttan. I must tell Madam Firoza uh, that, uh, sir, Madam, we went on there, I myself personally, on the 4th of this month, uh, last month, and uh, a beautiful plantation the students have been involved into. And that day also, we planted about uh, maybe 100 plus trees. And the planning is so well done. So I am so happy for having students participated understood the ecology and role and importance of trees in ecological restorations on which we are talking about it, you know. And with just one guidance uh, and their participations was really with the bottom of their heart and they all exerted. So, so Dr. Shinde, uh, you must take a chance sometime and Madam Firoza uh, will take you around <laughs> to see the plantation development done by the St. Javier College. Uh, friends that uh, Madam Firoza and Dr. Shinde has raised very pertinent issues uh, of ecological disturbances and imbalance rather. And in that sense, uh, you have invited the speakers, particularly, say, uh, Dr. Ketki, she'll make us understand restorations of ecology. Uh, Usha, she's a role like a friend, colleague, and Dr. Shinde is a student of Institute of Science. Uh, moved to the Sikkim and settled there, but she has a great role in NGOs and the work she has been doing, highly appreciated by the government. And uh, Srinivasan is going to talk on degraded rainforest, uh, Western Guards. So that is what Madam Firoza said, that human indulgence in Sintu, and that is what led to Western Guard uh, disturbances right up to Maharashtra and all across uh, and the panda is going to talk, but I have been saying, uh, Dr. Shinde said that the people's participation. So we'll be admiring his talk on, he's talking on the close meet of uh, Adivasi's families 
in restoring the ecologies. And more we talk about it, government talks about it, or forest cover is also, uh, whereas we should be very happy from depleted 16% who are almost gone to 33% required forest cover in this India. And numbers apart, what Madan has raised the issue, that's uh, true. But then we see the cover uh, is increasing very fast and uh, uh, departments are very sensitive in restorations, including now we're very sensitive restorations of the mangrove ecology of the important city like Mumbai. So all these lectures, uh, I shall be talking little really technical aspects because all of you will be talking about plants and the greeneries, then the role and restorations. But now there is also technology uh, concern. Uh, we technologists and the chemists look at the plant in different as a house of reservoir for cleaning, cleansing the ecology that makes uh, habitat for all the concern elements of the, this thing of which uh, you know that industrial pollution is uh, also one of the issue which is killing the trees in fact and flora and fauna and we'll see that some of the slides in fact i'll give you in my lecture at end of it that uh, how the currently the industries that have been pollution certain virgin areas land forests what damage is uh, on slot so this awareness we all talk about shout about it is very important because i shall be giving you very lively side some of those ongoing problems. So, you know, agriculture development, food productions, industrializations for economic development, all that is needed. But sometimes it outweighs the loss of ecology, you know, and that is our concern. So we, on the other hand, are talking about restorations of that. So the environmental problems have been really another important source or the great source, the great threat to the ecology and of which uh, you know that urbanization is an issue. Uh, there was a forest right up to the other end cattle road, you know, and uh, Mithi River you could swim and you can, people used to do boating, you know, in outskirts of this main town. So Borili was a forest land, Borili was an agricultural land. Now you what it has come to, you know. So at the cost of what? Ecological disturbances, imbalances, but then good that uh, we understand all this and uh, city planners, developers and um, administrators have been giving full importance to the plantation of the city of Mumbai. And we should all be proud of that, how green is the city of Mumbai that we have been made and your slogans, green city, green Mumbai, like you know, that awareness that we have been holding and carrying and also participating. These are the hopes of uh, restoration of ecology. And that's what the issue we are going to talk about because ecological restoration I mean, is not only the tree environment and the plants and the forest, but how the other species in ecological aspects, the biodiversity it holds and allows everyone to live. Like we talk Vasudeva and Kutungam. So in the environmental sense also, all species right up to the ants and all animals and birds that all together make an ecology. And so it's very, very important. But now looking at the very fast degradations of this, you know, uh, just planting tree is not a restoration of ecology. You will have to think, you need an experts. We have to say where is what. You just merely can't convert grassland into that of a forest. Or you just can't remove mangroves and have the beautiful panoramic trees like, you know, avenues. No. The grassland must be left as a grassland, wetland must be left as a wetlands, you know, because it has its own ecology, you know, their habitats, they will be holding all those animals, birds and creatures and whatnot, you know. So that is ecological maintenance is very important. So mangrove has to remain mangrove, grassland has to become, remain a grassland, wetland though it seems like something like useless, but no. Wetlands are, are giving a good source of the carbon, the nutrients and water holding, which percolates ultimately into the land and the ground, you know. So that is why the even wetlands are very important. So ecological restoration is not uh, just plantation, is one of the aspects. It takes its own time, you know. And so we all, the experts and technologists and experts, I mean, all participants who are with the science and engineering, you must see that ecological aspects have to be looked into. 
before we indulge into any actions and plans, you know. So there are different methods to have, you know, and you all know that I don't have to tell, you know. But one important issue is that the experts in all is very important and then dispersal mechanisms, seeds formations, and then allowing time to grow, holding the patients to that. And some kind of uh, the trees which can harbor the smaller ones, the grass and creatures, you know. And then they will take over, you know. So these aspects have to be looked into while uh, restoring the ecology, the decade we have been talking about, which will go up to 2030 and uh, one and a half year is over. So ecological balance uh, is important, it's a decade by UN and how it important it is, you know. You see the war going on, you can see the destructions, you know. And uh, who will the first come to the rescue and restorations of the environment, the surviving trees or plantation of trees? So these emissions are really detrimental and they further go on into the spoiling the atmosphere or ambient air. And that is like killing so many other things. So please look at the trees, just not for restorations, holding the root system and balancing, preventing erosions, but they are also phytoremediators. They restore the better environment and that is uh, a part of the restoration of ecology. So little technical aspects of that I shall be talking uh, at, uh, in my lecture that uh, how the plant engineering is also important for all of us to understand. So thank you very much for this and I welcome you all again and thank you the organizers and our students all students and Professor Nishaj, Dr. Vijaya for taking great initiatives and organizing this uh, one day seminar, webinar, conference, anything. And when you talk about the plants, I would say it's Algudet workshop as well, you know. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. We can't wait to hear more from you during your session later on today. And with that, we've completed our inauguration. So let's move on with our first session for today. Our first session is by Dr. Ketki Ghate, who will be talking to us about understanding ecological restoration. And to introduce her, I'd like to call upon Ms. Tanya Vyas from first year BSc to introduce Dr. Ketki. Over to you, Tanya. Uh, Dr. Ketaki Ghate is an ecology expert who has been working in the field of ecological restoration, biodiversity conservation, and land restoration for the last 18 years. A double graduate in BSc Chemistry and Botany, she is currently a co-founder and a managing partner for the OECOS for Ecological Services project. She is a trustee, part of the core team and staff, and is working on subjects like landscape ecology, eco-perspective in watershed management, and alternative livelihood systems. She also studies and has authored various publications on native and invasive species, land restoration and management, and forest ecology. She is a member of the Pune Tree Authority of the Pune Municipal Cooperation and a member of the JFMC in Pune. She works as a visiting faculty for master's in architectural courses at the PNCA College of Architecture in Pune. She has worked on several government and municipal projects on biodiversity and has written various books and articles on the same. Over to you, ma'am. The dais is yours. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, thanks, actually, to St. Xavier's College team and Dr. Shinde, uh, also all Friends of Trees here on this uh, panel. I'm extremely happy. It's, it's really a great pleasure to present the kind of work that we've been doing for the past 20 years on this particular platform. Uh, actually, I would have liked to get introduced to all the participants or even all the fellow speakers one to one, but I think all the situations have made us uh, just have this kind of discussions and workshops online. But I think that's a part of life nowadays, new normal. So, yeah, so I, I think we should also connect this current situations to why ecological restoration. So before actually I begin this presentation and start sharing my slides, I would like to just take a few minutes to talk why. 
because we always believe unless and until we understand why we may not be able to come or reach to a very right or perfect kind of solutions so as all of us definitely understand that all the ecosystems are have been degrading and uh, the kind of rate and the scale at which we are changing our ecosystems be it forests or be it rivers has been increasing every year so there is for forest fragmentations we are polluting our rivers nonetheless we have climate change we are absolutely the the kind of um, last thing that human race could have imagined but uh, but yeah so what is extremely striking i feel is we have lost our almost all mature ecosystems so we don't have any kind of climax ecosystems left so they are maybe there in the on the world maybe somewhere in bits and pieces but otherwise most of our uh, ecosystems are in secondary stage means though we have forest cover somewhere for sure they claim that in india we have almost 12% some people claim that we have almost 30% forest cover but it's all secondary let me tell you means the ultimate forest which should have been there it's not there yeah so it's something else so all this is just because the way uh, we as a human race are uh, dealing with our landscapes yeah and it is aggravated in last 300 years of industrialization because every day we are getting new and newer tools uh, or technology to modify our landscapes yeah so for sure population increases there but along with population increase this technology has changed the system and this is changed to an extent that it is booming back to us yeah in the form of climate change in the form of this novel corona virus because we have disrupted the ecological integrity of ecosystem that's why there is spill over of viruses from the wild animals to human beings so wherever there is ecosystems which are intact and whenever wherever there is no monoculture extreme monoculture of species we don't see viruses jumping from wild species to some kind of human beings or some intermediary species yeah so everything is just because the way we are dealing with the landscapes the way we are dealing with our biodiversity yeah so pollution maybe is the first time in the history so if you look at just evolution it would be so interesting just to know this time scale where when we have come on the earth so if if you know all of us must be knowing that earth's age is 450 crores of years and we came just few lakhs years ago and all this biodiversity and entire srushti that we call it as has been there for like billions and millions of years but what we are trying to do is we are just trying to wipe out this entire biodiversity within just few hundred years and uh, we are absolutely dependent on it yeah we are dependent on it and we are so it's like we are cutting the same branch on which we are sitting so it's absolutely being foolish and just because of that all this is booming back to us in 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 the form of diseases in the form of pollution in the form of what not in number of negative things that are happening this is also happening just because we are absolutely human centric any activity that we do even many times i feel even if we do plantations it's always for the sake of humans how do i wish to see my backyard say for example what kind of um, fruits i need to eat yeah so it's absolutely human centric even if we're doing a forestation or the plantation any kind of thing we hardly think about non human beings yeah so i think that's the very key thing that we need to look at that it's high time we've been thinking about humans for sure we need to but at any point, some point of time we need to also be inclusive for all these non human beings who are actually uh, making this life support system for human beings they are actually shaping the ecological services for human beings so that we can avail bountiful of resources so that we can run our industries yeah so that we eat so that we have medicines in number of things so just because this biodiversity and natural resources are there or the ecosystems are the way there the way they function they are providing life or they are providing services to human beings so i think even if we are calling ourselves wise so if you know homo sapiens we call ourselves homo sapiens sapiens means wise but we are not behaving the same manner so high time we recognize the 
may be worth of our own name and be wise in renewing the thing at least which are renewable so i i absolutely understand that there are certain resources which are non renewable on this earth so we need to maybe definitely use them little conservatively but at the same time whatever resources are renewable if we can renew it and that's why that's how we reach to this today's topic of ecological restoration so we can do this through ecological restoration so it's not so that people have never recognized this kind of problem they have our government also is quite wise to maybe know that there are problems but i think the efforts are channelized in completely different way many times they also go unscientific and that's why problems have been there otherwise if you just uh, take out the kind of tree plantations are being done in last 50 years we would have have like completely green india <laughs> but because most of it is failing that's why problems just persist there and that's why we need to have some kind of alternative and for the same alternative i think ecological restoration is the best tool because it's absolutely with the ecology ecology is a science absolutely one of the very important branch in uh, which connects human life to the rest of the natural systems and that's why maybe we are here and i'm here just to share my so i see there are many professors so i'm not uh, maybe teacher or professor by profession but just here to share my experience and that we've been doing through oikos past uh, few years yes yeah, so uh, as even dr shinde mentioned that what is restoration it just to just bring back the original or known previous conditions um, from the past so which we call it as climax i'm sure we study all this in ecology but many times people don't wish to use word climax but instead of that we can use mature ecosystem do you see my screen i hope you are able to see my screen right yeah yes yeah yes so, so we must remember that restoration is mitigation yeah so it's not the ultimate solution and also we must remember restoration cannot revive the exact original condition of the ecosystem the habitat or the lost species dynamics but definitely we can go near to that and we don't have any choice but to go near to that so restoration needs to be combined with conservation for sure so so like you can't keep on polluting just because you are able to maybe deal with pollu pollution no so ultimately at some point of time you need to work on the source which is polluting so similarly we must work on the source why there is why degradation is happening where degradation is happening we need to stop that also but also at the same time we can restore ecosystems so how do we restore or conserve conserve so there are various ways and it absolutely depend on the availability of land what kind of resources you have the time and also patience we say many times because nowadays people just don't have any patience they just say that you the moment you plant maybe the plant should grow within the 6 months so that doesn't happen yeah so but anyways this kind of things definitely can be dealt with so the best practice to maybe address restoration is assisted eco restoration and you combine it with right kind of plantation so that's how so i'm going to present a case study for this that how you can do it but let's just understand that all this restoration uh, strategy or the techniques they vary as per these three regions so be it a natural area or rural area or urban areas restoration definitely can be some common thread but techniques definitely change so depending on the status of that particular zone so there are very clearly four steps that normally we recommend so what are those steps so first thing definitely you need to have regional understanding of your area where you're working where your restoration project is and second most very important thing is you should study some kind of mature or climax ecosystem within that given region so that we we call it as a reference ecosystem so that you get an idea where you wish to go where ultimately restoration should reach along with that we also recommend that we should be doing some kind of study of socio cultural practices from that particular region so that you you get answers that why degradation is been there and ultimately we you also need to cater to the needs of human beings in a very sustainable way so both things should happen and then lastly you assess current ecological condition of that particular project batch and then design 
right techniques and then select right kind of plants yeah so we'll just i'll just try to take you through all these four steps through this case study from western ghats yeah so western ghats being natural areas means because there is a very less population density in western ghats uh, we call those a fairly natural area yeah? and this is a representative landscape patch so this is how western ghats look like so if you see there are these three patches in the center yeah which are absolutely very thick green so this is a secret group from western ghats in panchit catchment near pune in dapsar village so this is the another view of the secret group and this is how typical landscape is so this is that particular patch which host very special species yeah specialist means what the kind of species that exist within this patch are not seen elsewhere in the landscape though you see that rest of the photograph has green color but there are various shades of green yeah, and that's how it makes it secondary kind of vegetation and which host all generalis species generalis means what these are common species like say for example uh, bulbul bulbul is a bird which is found everywhere sunbird is a bird which is found everywhere so these are the species which can just thrive anywhere these are generally species and if you see this landscape is full of mosaic of habitats so there is a range of species like this particular green dot it's showing karvi patches so in western ghats on very steep slope there is one shrub named karvi karvia callosa which uh, holds the soil on this steeper slope so there are many such green slopes that you can see then this particular yellow dot is representing shifting cultivation patch means what this local people have been doing cultivation on slopes by cutting the existing forest and they cultivate hill millets three hill millets natsni varai anti marathi we call it that so this three hill millets are cultivated for three consecutive years so that's how there is some kind of maybe the, they definitely maintain the trees because that's useful for them but the cut off all the stratification the shrubs and herbs and grasses everything is cut and they burn it so that's how obviously this kind of special forest patches are modified absolutely but somewhere you also see clusters where the orange dot is means the clusters of karwanda means there are certain thorny shrubs all over western ghats and then this blue dot is representing riparian forest riparian forest means the forest on both the banks of any stream or river and that's the those are the only corridors means which connect two patches so these are extremely important so this is how this is a mosaic of habitats and each habitat has a different kind of composition of not only trees but also shrubs and herbs and climbers so what we need to do it's conserve this viable habitats yeah, because if we lose them we won't see the special species at all so our priority should be to conserve them first and then restore rest of the degraded habitats to and it's then try to take them towards this viable habitats which are ultimately mature ecosystems so this is how this uh, mature ecosystem within western ghats look like this is one of the secret grove from western ghats and if you see hardly any sunlight reaches here just on the road and this road is also quite recent means we have seen the secret grove when there was just hardly some very little path was there but as and when as i said the progress happens then they 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 love to take roads inside the secret grove but if you look at the species those are such a special species like this wild dog or malba giant squirrel or this great pied hornbill or maybe birds like shama which is singing birds so this is just a glimpse of biodiversity that i'm trying to show which are maybe thriving in this whatever last bits of sacred groves so hard high time that we conserve this ret species ret means rare endemic or endangered and threatened kind of species which are there so that's why the focus should be to conserve this first and then restore this open areas and open areas absolutely support completely different array of diversity as you see in this particular photograph so as per climate and rainfall in western ghats it should support tropical semi evergreen forest but what you see in this slide which is the condition of almost i think maybe 70% of the western ghats is 
there is a grasslands which are seen there yeah? and also maybe scrub as you see rightly in this particular photograph so scrub means sparse uh, stunted vegetation and most of the species are thorny so continuous canopy is lost some patches definitely you see continuous canopy but it is also of secondary kind of uh, for a species and the birds or the, the fauna that you've seen on earlier slide completely gets replaced by generally species like this like this maybe sunbird and the bulbul and larks and bush chats so all these are open country basically birds so what we need to do is we need to restore this to uh, its original condition but it's a process it doesn't happen obviously overnight and definitely not maybe within few months or sometime not even within few years so what we do is we try to restore the physical structure first so physical structure means what this uppermost top soil layer is extremely crucial crucial if you restore this um top soil and various various functions which goes on in this protected soil that's what you need to restore because ultimately you need to enhance processes like say for example germination germination of seeds seedlings and then making it grow to a large tree so it's a process so unless and until you restore decomposition you unless and until you restore say for example pollination you won't be able to go reach to that particular state so why to restore functions and processes because that takes you towards sustainability otherwise what happens if you do plantation keep on watering the saplings definitely they would grow but they would grow just like a woodland yeah and that's the difference between i think the kind of a forestation maybe uh, what campaigns that we have been taking since past many years but uh definitely a woodland can be created by watering the saplings but you don't restore the function and processes which takes an ecosystem towards sustainability yeah, so that's what definitely we need and ultimately once you restore this physical structure biological potential automatically increases that's what i'm going to show you through this kind of uh this particular case study and restoration is nothing but creating this conditions to facilitate entry of natural communities of flora and fauna so we don't have to plant so definitely some some uh, places where you have good budget or say you have good resources you can plant and you can accelerate for sure but if you look at the the scale at which degradation is happening in india for that matter in the world uh, we should be able to just facilitate this entry so that ecosystems are restored um which is absolutely less expensive and at the same time it's very natural so this particular case study of uh, this project is at one kusavde one kusavde is the name of village in uh, patan taluka in satara district of maharashtra and this land is owned by actors atul kulkarni bollywood actor uh, and his friends and his family members and we've been working on this particular project for past 15 years now so that's why we are able to maybe witness this restoration process very closely this is there in koina backwaters koina catchment towards west of satara and if you again if i take you through all these four stages that i mentioned initially so the regional setting of this project area obviously is being western ghats is a biodiversity hotspot yeah so why biodiversity hotspot because much of the india's biodiversity is concentrated in this tiny kind of belt which runs parallel to the western coasts so very tiny even if you look at the actually percentage wise hardly any thin belt this high rainfall area of western ghat so also there within the buffer of koina wildlife sanctuary 1000 meters above sea level and literally pours during rains it's 5000 mm of average annual rainfall but but still as you see in this photograph there are many degraded areas there is a high speed wind and hilly topography as you see yeah so what was our aim is to restore earlier forest so these kind of forests or secret groves are there within the same one kusavde catchment we studied it back in 2005 and 6 and then we decided after this year round ecological assessment and we that we need to go to go back to this kind of stage yeah so then we also studied the composition of this forest and overall landscape generally the drainage pattern everything and why conservation perspectives because um, even owners of this land believe that as a urban citizen 
uh, who buy land at countryside, we are not dependent on this land, right? We have something else as our livelihood source. So this is, I think, the best perspective to look at any land, to do conservation and just try to give back to nature, which we've been exploiting. So actually, normally, I also talk when I talk such kind of um maybe when i start talking about ecological restoration that working on land definitely is one kind of uh, way to restore but at the same time another way is indirectly if you just reduce your consumption in day to day lifestyle if you reduce extraction of resources because ultimately that would indirectly reduce the extraction of resources from natural system which would also reduce the stress and the pollution in the natural systems yeah so that's the first thing that we need to do reduce your consumption at during day to day lifestyle shift to n number of things that we can do nature friendly kind of lifestyle and then do right kind of work on land in which ecological restoration is one and then if you see the initial status back in 2005 this is how the land was completely open grassland to scrub was lack of canopy absolutely poor fertility of soil so so soil was there soil is there if you see there is almost 30 to 40 feet fine soil is there on this particular land but as you see there is no vegetation because the soil is not live at all and it obviously intense grazing is another one very big threat and also fire and most of the indian landscape this people set the land on fire just because of n number of reasons so just because of that this open areas are continued we don't give chance to ecosystem to restore we don't give chance to ecosystem to success yeah and of course high speed winds are there so this is how the land was so what we did initially so obviously it's a long way to go <laughs> from this barren land to this uh, sacred grove kind of landscape it might take even 50 years for sure but at least our aim was to set the land on a right track towards ecological restoration or towards forest form- form- farming uh, farming so this is the first thing that we did protection and protection also was offered by using thorns thorny plant in the surrounding there is one plant named scushia indica chimut uh, in the surrounding it's absolutely deadly thorny plant so instead of having a wall or some kind of external material from cities to here we thought to use all local materials because this is ki- kind of quite uh, we tried to shape this project with a purist ecological perspective that let's not increase the ecological footprint of this project or the carbon footprint of this project otherwise what happens many times uh, we make greenery at the cost of greenery somewhere else so say for example we get cement and made hot no- what not like high embodied energy materials um, from outside and then do plantation and maybe uh, maybe fence of that particular land so that increases the ecological footprint so we try to avoid it here in this case so what what was the result of protection is basically biomass improvement so as you see in this photograph outside the product land the grass is hardly of any height maybe just 2 to 3 inches and inside it is 4 to 5 feet and all this biomass is going into the topsoil because we are protecting it we are not let it graze letting it graze or say it is not getting burned so just because of that this biomass is texturizing the soil that is extremely important so in any ecological restoration project this biomass is our wealth we call it as we must protect it if you protect it then the physical structure of the land improves another thing we do every year is this fire line just along with the fence this is something that definitely we need to do so that even if fire is there it doesn't continue till the our project land yeah simple kind of uh, logic then we also do hedges or did hedges for this particular project and it's a excellent habitat for smaller fauna at least initially when inside the land it was everything barren so that time hedges offered a wonderful habitat and as you see the species used are non palatable for cattle so cattle don't eat it like this vitex nigundo nilgudi or many ficus species we planted okay then along with that we also did soil moisture conservation but very simple techniques like this stone lines yeah, the stones which is put in your hand can arrange 
to the control so that oil gets arrested behind it. So the way you see in this particular photograph. So each so we made hundreds of stone lines. And, and why we like this kind of um, technique is this doesn't change the landscape to a great degree. So normally government does these trenches. The moment you dig very deep kind of trenches and definitely not even needed in high rainfall areas like Western Ghats because we have enough root mass. So the moment you protect it, grass grows and each grass clump act like a trench. Yeah. So the whole purpose of trenches is to let water percolate into, into the ground and that precisely can be done by the grasses or maybe just to initiate that we can do such kind of stone line and this absolutely gave us wonderful result or some such kind of things like loose boulder bunch. So this was a very deep valley we could cross this initially just because we offered a very simple tool we had and then now you can't even recognize that gully. Yeah, so then Tons of soil got arrested behind this bunds, which otherwise would have landed up in the Koina backwaters and maybe decreasing the dam life. Yeah, so this soil conservation is important. Along with that, we did some such kind of smaller ponds. This pond are not made for storage of water, but just to let water percolate into the ground. And this now, if you try to take photograph from this uh, spot, the very spot, you don't even see house now because everything is changed. This is the photograph from initial years. And we also did stream restoration. So some kind of um, bunds were made. The aim was to just reduce the velocity of water and you recharge the riparian zone. So this zone on both banks of river uh, or streams is called as riparian zone. Also, there is another zone which is called as hyporic zone, which also is saturated with water. And this kind of bunds definitely help to saturate this this particular zone um, with water. So what was the result of all these simple uh, techniques is improved habitat. And micro habitat in terms of say shrub cluster, the pond, or grass clump, any number of things, increase like anything. Yeah. So as you see in this, even this green photograph, so there is some kind of water which is maybe protected, it's staying at least for some time. You see many clumps are there. Yeah. So this is what is needed. Along with that, we also did maybe native plantations, but plantation was not the focus, at least in this case. Definitely, we have projects wherein plantation is the main aspect of many projects, but in this particular project, it was not the focus. So we studied the existing composition uh, or composition of existing forests. So what was that in this one? Pusavda, it is Mangifera, Cisizium, Actinod, and Terminalia. It means mango, jamun, and this terminalia species, which are dominant all over Western Ghat. So we also did seed dispersal of the same species. Yeah? And seed dispersal must be done at a very light, right location. Otherwise, what happens if you do seed dispersal on absolutely barren land? So it doesn't survive. It survives till the time that seed has enough, maybe food to maybe uh, make that little seedling thrive for certain days. But the moment the food source is over and the land is anyways barren, that seeds is not able to thrive. So it's best to do seed dispersal in such clusters. Or if you look at the direction also, because it, it has all westerly, western monsoon, we did in the eastern side of any kind of cluster. So this, this was absolutely important. Yeah. Otherwise, seed dispersal drive that everyone has been taking for past many years, we feel that many times it's just uh, maybe waste of efforts because if you're doing it on barren land, so the soil has to be absolutely ready to germinate and survive that kind of seed. Then another wonderful result we got is improved soil temperature. So in summer, this soil used to get heated till 60 degrees. And just with grass cover, now the temperature is reduced by 12 to 15 degrees. And if you take the temperature underneath any shrub cluster or trees, it's still less. But I have just shown the temperature of grass cover. And this is what is extremely important because in 60 degree, hardly any microbes or in life can thrive. But the moment temperature reduces, n number of life form can stay in soil almost throughout the year. And that was our aim. And that got reflected into biodiversity. So we look at biodiversity as an indicator, just like litmus paper in chemistry lab. Yeah. 
so if so this particular indicator of earthworm so maybe before 2008 um, earthworms were very quite small and slowly they got increased in size and also the castings of earthworm increased in size so earlier or even today if you measure the castings of um, this earthworm from 1 square meter of quadrat outside the project land it's just in few grams yeah maybe 500 grams or 800 grams but if you measure the casting of earthworm from 1 square meter within the project land it's in 3 to 4 kg yeah so that much aeration is happening within the soil so so yeah so as you walk on that project land you actually feel that there are this earthworm castings and also lot of biomass a layer of biomass is there then indicators of new habitat like the signature spider so this is a so at one point of time there were so many signature spiders why signature because as you see it has its own unique sign each this is so this is a female signature spider so again this is an indicator of increase insect population and definitely insects have increased and another indicator of this blue pansy and like this butterfly so certain areas absolutely were having this particular species and their food plants have also been increasing just because of protection also we did to certain extent seed dispersal but this garden lizard is also indicator of insect population and again as we study or maybe we make students learn that particular ecological pyramid yeah in ecology in ecosystem that uh, at the bottom there are producers and then there are primary consumers so this primary consumers are extremely important they must be in very good numbers if at all they are very good number then only your apex species can thrive on that particular food chain yeah so for so actually we could see this theory uh, getting success on this particular patch of land then indicator of low temperature of soil the snake this wine snake we were absolutely happy initially we couldn't spot even a single snake yeah but it has started increasing increased moisture is also maybe increased leeches so leeches is an animal which suck bird uh, your blood yeah so i'm sure many of you know this so they increased at earlier they were there in good numbers local people would say but just because of this dryness of soil we, we lost them so and only along streams we to spot them but now after so many years even if we have just walk of the land we get definitely three four leeches on our legs then watering need of the saplings is reduced that's what many people appreciate that earlier we used to water the saplings immediately after monsoon that is in october but now uh, we water the saplings after april or may yeah so for till that much period this plants are able to survive on the soil moisture so what is restored is soil moisture and that's what extremely important then there are many rare species so as you see atul is holding one little snake in his hand and that's russell's kukri which is a non venomous snake so we were happy to welcome this kind of species another rare species is sicilian so sicilian is the from the group of frogs it's amphibian it's limbless amphibian and we could spot this younger one so obviously some female must have find this site as a safe place to lay uh, this uh, offsprings over there yeah then within this next few slide i'll just show you how the land changed completely so this was the first monsoon the seasonal grass and this is how most of the western ghats are they go green but this greenery is absolutely deceptive because th- these are all seasonal grasses and in as per climate and rainfall western ghats should support some kind of perennial greenery but it's mostly converted into seasonality seasonal uh, uh, vegetation cover so immediately in second third year what increase this increase biomass along with regenerate, regenerating shrub clusters has given it a completely different not only look but also the diversity change so this is how land was yeah? and western ghats are full of such clouds and torrential rains you can't even stand in those particular rains and this is immediately followed by drought completely dry conditions so this is how it was but because of protection 
the seasonal cover got changed to little perennial grasses so seasonal grasses were themeda earlier and few ferns were there like teris they got replaced initially with this arundinella and few clusters of eulalia eulalia is another perennial grass species and this is how it looks like so perennial means it definitely the biomass stays it's not completely green in summers but this is how summers were initially yeah so this eulalia was there along with so many new herbs started coming in like this lucas that you see in this particular slide so again this is the indicator that this habitat for new species are being made on this land and very much naturally we are not doing anything the shrub clusters increase in size so most of the shrubs are um, gnidia glauca in marathi we call it as dakpadi and then glochidion which is a evergreen shrub then memesilons many species started maybe increasing not in size because earlier this would get cut or because of fire the we also call this is a barren land grassland in western ghats is a arrested climax I mean the the land just remained the same state because every year it is getting burnt and getting grazed so as you see in the same photograph this particular patch which is outside the project land it is still the same yeah uh, left hand corner over here you can see but rest of the project land is completely changed with perennial grasses and increased shrubbery then many herbs started coming in as you see there is a layering of many species here as you see in this particular photograph so uh, as again in this particular photograph you see not only big clusters but also various kind of species are there so i don't wish to maybe burden you with this various scientific names but yeah surely this diversity has increased and this is how the land is uh, the land outside project land is keep still the same Yeah. So now the earlier it was a sparse shrubbery. Now it is becoming very dense kind of shrubbery. So these kind of um, leguminous plant like flamingia is one of the leguminous shrub. So role of shrubs and grasses is extremely important. So that's what even I was talking to Dr. Shinde. Though the topic definitely is trees or the role of trees in ecological restoration. the other kind of vegetation is extremely important at least initial years of um, ecological restoration and that's how this leguminous plants become very important now, as you see the same kind of house you hardly see from the same spot and this is just to show you the entire story in one slide this is the first year with barren land with indicator species like bulbuls and bush chat this is some second third fourth year where the perennial greenery is there shrub clusters have increased and also indicator birds so there are n number of other faunal species that i can show but this is just for ease i am showing you just the glimpse of the species then the pipits and this um, many other birds have started nesting here shrike is there so not only nesting not only feeding but nesting so that's a what you can say that's some kind of receipt which is given by the biodiversity to this particular project then the same shrubbery is still increasing in size it is becoming denser and denser and now we can see forest birds coming here in certain parts of the land so these are the spur fowls and jungle fowls which have started visiting this particular patch of land so as you see this is a complete story of this particular project complete barren to dense shrubbery so still we have many years to reach forest canopy but for surely uh this stage has come wherein we can do maybe dense tree plantation so every year we definitely plant some 50 100 uh, plants or uh, plant saplings of certain shrubs and trees but the aim is not that so as i said aim was just to restore land uh, or to set it on the right track to go towards forest formation that is what what is being done so there are in number of social benefits definitely such kind of project get brings in a great employment opportunity for local person yeah and also good quality fodder grass is available for the person as you see in this particular slide kishan is the person who works there and he is able to get enough fodder for his two cattle yeah so this is just to show you this is the grass graph showing that earlier it was seasonal grasses and perennial and uh maybe in 15th year we have reached dense shrubbery so not sure how many more years it would take maybe another what 20 years if we go naturally but if we maybe do dense plantation definitely land, land is right to take that much 
plants or saplings but just because of maybe lack of funds so i'm absolutely happy to share with you that now atul has uh, given this land to our trust for its management and to take it ahead just as a tool for education for sure so that people can visit this particular land so this was a story so quickly maybe in another 5 10 minutes i'll just try to cover rest of the things that i just wanted to talk so there are two kind of approaches for restoration so the kind of approach that we ha- had this particular project is purist approach but for sure you can have integrated approach many a time people feel that it is a practical approach wherein you combine maybe benefits to the community with the restoration and it also considers um some kind of integration with the development whatever development that you do yeah so definitely we need to have such kind of integrated approach in rural areas so this is how most of the rural areas in maharashtra are yeah it's absolutely uh, the main dominant land use is uh, agriculture and very few patches are there which are of uh, trees or shrubs yeah otherwise everything is agriculture somewhere you see old growth trees as i have marked with this red dots so these riparian zones of the streams are extremely important so through this you can just connect the patches so this patch corridor development is extremely important which assures the landscape connectivity it also can be achieved through maybe Uh, by having plantation on the edges of the field or on along all along the roads so here you can have this focus of grassland restoration and forest restoration because grassland are essential for locals because it supplies fodder yeah also you can connect restoration to their livelihood because it supports or say it um, yeah supports many kind of products which come from this uh, the same landscape like forest food or non timber forest produce plants may be plants which are of commercial importance definitely can be planted or can be restored so that they are directly useful for them or they can maybe have a trade of certain plants in the nearby market yeah so surely restoration can be combined with some kind of activities which are little commercially beneficial or economically beneficial for locals also restoration can be done at a city scale at urban uh, in urban area so this is a map of pune city and these are all hills that we have in pune but many times development disrupts this integrity and the classic example i always love to give is of chandani chowk i am sure many people must have visited pune so this red dot is where chandani chowk is in pune so this has fragmented the very corridor and just because of which western ghats was connected to pune city as you see this is this is a khadakwasla dam in the left corner that you see and all the deers like barking deers would come till this chatushrungi hill which is one of the hill in pune city but now because it is fragmented we hardly see any kind of wildlife in pune city so that's why we say that if you just do so so basically restoration uh, the point is restoration various scale like natural areas you can add. definitely there is a great, great scope but at least in urban areas we can maybe deal with it to certain extent you can also you can have biodiversity parks in cities for sure and it's not only floral diversity that needs to be addressed but also faunal diversity also can be addressed along with the other natural kind of processes and then last point in my presentation is region specific plantations so restoration as you have seen in one kusavde case study definitely brings in very positive change in soil which also changes the biodiversity very much naturally and automatically you hardly have to do anything but if you support this kind of projects with right native plants is absolutely wonderful so what can kind of plant reason there it should be very much reason specific and this is a section that i have drawn for maharashtra so this is maybe western region with the coast is and maybe if you just compare the rainfall all over maharashtra this is the medium rainfall zone so as you climb western ghats is high rainfall zone wherein one kusavde is yeah semi evergreen kind of forest and then again as you go to the eastern side in maharashtra it's all mid- medium rainfall and ultimately most of the Maharashtra has low rainfall which we call it as central maharashtra and ultimately if you go to vidarbha it's again medium rainfall zone so as per rainfall 
we have forest types. So this is how moist deciduous forests look like. And I'm, I'll just try to give you a glimpse of species, whatever are present in this moist deciduous forest. So there are a number of species, but yeah, so this terminalia, that is this Ain, Beda, Kinzer are dominant. Yeah, various terminalia species are there. Then there are species like Kadamba, absolutely wonderful, maybe old growth species or individuals are there in, West, in Kokan region in many of the sacred groves. There is another species which we call Hedu in Marathi or Haldina is a um, scientific name. It's also very common in these areas. There are certain beautiful plants which has wonderful, very beautiful foliage like this Lashera, Kusum. <laughs> then there are species like um, Lagerstromias or Xanthoxylum or this Bombax that is silk cotton tree. And maybe another common species is the Sapindus. So Sapindus means it's a, a soap nut tree. Yeah. So earlier people would use the same tree uh, as a means of soap. But now we have completely shifted to industrialized product. So these are the species that are not only useful for human beings, but also are useful for non-human beings. Yeah. This particular silk cotton tree is called a honey cup tree, full of nectar. Yeah, so one of our senior botanists who used to call it as this particular tree as a open air juice bar for birds. Yeah, so these are the species which provide n number of food to the local birds and n number of formal species. So this is how a protected area like sacred grove within Western Ghat look like. Yeah, they are all old growth species. So Western Ghats, again, as I said, most of the Western Ghats are degraded and few species are very common, like this Olea or Macaranga, the Actinodaphne, this Anjani, that is Memesilon, which is the only blue flower tree in Western Ghats, one of my favorite trees. So these are very dominant all over Northern Western Ghats. So definitely, if you're doing plantation, you can have this uh, species, which can be planted very commonly uh, in any area. And then Hirida that is uh, terminalia chebula so these so these five species are representing common species which can be planted generally anywhere if you have project but there are certain species like this so this is uh, the, the first photograph is of iliocarpus means this is what you can say this is a uh, brother or sister of rudraksha yeah and then locally it is called as kasvi then another is um, uh, Ranzaifer, it is Nima species, then there is this fishtail palm, then there's a very wonderful, very rare kind of ficus species, ficus nervosa. Another rare species is Garcinia talboti. Yes, so these, all these five, maybe four species are quite rare in Western world. They are only confined to sacred groves or protected areas. So high time we maybe propagate those and plant it at a very right kind of location. So because today's topic was not, I have not chosen the topic for plantations, but actually that is another very important topic that where you do plantations, how you do plantations, everything is extremely important. So even if I'm showing to you, planting absolutely depends on the soil status. Yeah, And again, within that, you should also be focusing on the kind of habitat which has. And then lastly, this uh, maybe dry deciduous kind of forest. So over here, there are species like acacias and then boswellias and lania, another species which is very important in Vidarbha. So, yeah, do you see my screen yet? There was some problem with my internet. Yes, sir, we can see. Oh, yeah. So then there are this chloroxylon, then very common species in Vidarbha is diospyros, this particular leaf is used for BD making. Then there is this another jangli badam, that is the seeds are eaten, they are edible. That's why it is called as jangli badam. Then palash, I think everyone must be knowing this palash, flame of the forest, very wonderful species, flowering species. And then this is charoli or char, buknania, is also a good species which can be used commercially. And then very common kind of uh, landscape that we have in uh, central Maharashtra are the savanna. So these are not grasslands actually. Many times maybe uh, very in, I mean, in talking terms, we, call, we talk, we, we call them grasslands, but this is savanna. I mean, this must be interspersed with some kind of woody species. So what are the right species for this? All many grasses 
or certain thorny species uh, species like dolichandron or albizias few albizias zizipus are there or say this caparis are there which are wonderful host plants and then this cassias are there which are again leguminous plants so when it comes to grasslands as even uh, dr samant was mentioning that we sh- we should not be doing dense canopy plantation but it should be open canopy along with the right kind of species needs to be planted which restore this ecosystem uh, back to its original state and again habitat specific plantation so if this is a river bank over there as you see in this photograph this is a salic indian willow tree at the background but also you can plant pongamia or certain species of cecisium or say our state flower which is lagostromia and uh, many such uh, species which grow only in the riparian zone so maybe i'll end here just saying that there is a holistic way uh, for conservation and these are certain points that we must remember that like minimum energy use minimum ecological footprint our project should not generate generate any kind of harmful waste also we need to think about future generations and maybe other accommodate other non human beings along with following some kind of threshold to go against nature so i know if if at all we have to leave we have to go against nature to certain extent but we must decide that what threshold we should just uh, follow that's extremely important yeah so thank you so much it's really a pleasure to present this kind of concept and just i'll stop here saying that all this concept for surely we need to take this to kids so that at least down the line 50 100 years we won't have uh, such kind of problems yeah thank you so much if you have any questions i would love to take thank you so much ma'am uh, we are now open to questions so if you have any please feel free to type them down in the chat section or um, raise your hand so that we can ask you to ask out your questions good morning ma'am this is dr ayman from telangana university i have a question that there is a loss of plant diversity in the western ghats are you listening to me am i am i audible yes yes you are audible the ngos or local localites are they alarmed about this situation and are they i mean to say for the restoration are there any steps taken from the people who do studies over there are there any reports such reports alarmed about restoration this question was whether local people are been informed and are alarmed about the about the restoration yes yes so in our on most of our project we definitely involve local people in this yeah but because we mostly work with private land owners but even then for sure the people who help us with plantation or with restoration for fencing definitely we involve them somewhere we also try to take this uh, maybe learnings from restoration to local people there are few of our projects recently in yavatma so where actually i am right now in yavatma itself so we, over here we are trying to maybe come up with some kind of mod- model for restoration wherein local community can get benefited yeah so for sure at least uh, uh, yeah, we try our best but generally if you see um say on various ngos level or at the government level uh there are not very great effort which are being made so that restoration can become popular uh, at village levels but for sure so at least what i we see in last 20 years maybe 20 years back restoration was hardly known to people but at least now there are few individuals few ngos who are taking interest into ecological restoration and trying to spread at least at their own level do for sure need definitely it has a great potential and can be taken to uh, maybe mass scale slowly 
and but yeah so government is not really uh, the government are the only people who can take it to mass scale i feel that is what is uh, lacking currently <laughs> dr uh, amal i may i may add to that if madam permits uh, uh, yes the sudhir gard sorry dr gardgil committee report on western ghat there is a movement of mm. say western ghat you know and uh, in the process government of maharashtra has taken the initiatives like in government of india also and at least the development plans have been amended that nobody can do and do any damage to the ecology and for construction purpose or other things so certain bans have been imposed as far as the police department is concerned yes uh, public participation means that meeting of the adivasis or villages into the ecological development process most of the roads in maharashtra government of maharashtra has a police department has put a huge grants and plantation is happening along the road side like in the city and that is done by the public participations the roads and the patches of these roads are given to the villagers to take care of or the gram sabha or panchayats you know so the efforts are on and we can see the result also uh, forest nurseries also have been rearing n number of we huge plants is a good plantation of tea like what uh, kitty was saying that uh, monoculture kind of plantation but then restoration of land with the complete ecological restoration may not be happening as she said but plantation per se the number of trees are being planted all across and huge uh, creation of big forest uh, has been happening in maharashtra so the reports of gardener committee are taken very seriously by the state of maharashtra and efforts are on and participation of people uh, even by forest department is on so that's what uh, status of the state of maharashtra as far as this uh, western ghat ecology restorations amended plan so that no construction no resorts and no industry is there you know? that is it i hope you got some of the answers from madam and i said sir are there any biodiversity registers made by the people who are working over there Dr. Ahmad, is that are you are you happy with so you got some yeah. some some okay. some information? Thank you, fine, thank you. Uh, are the biodiversity registers maintained by the people who are working in that okay. area? Uh, you can go ahead if any other questions. Biodiversity biodiversity register biodiversity register. Yeah, yeah. So so to my knowledge, there are many villages who are now uh, working or uh, so preparing their own biodiversity registers. Though it is compulsory for every village actually. to come up with the register mm-hmm. but i think many times they, they lack certain tool to maybe put it or the make the document very systematically so definitely need they know the biodiversity but this process of documentation is obviously is not being done everywhere but for sure because now government has been pushing many villages have made their biodiversity register but what happens just making it uh, becomes uh, just a tick mark activity what they need to do is maybe repeat it after few years that what kind of changes are there in the biodiversity and why so and then assess those and again as i said uh, in the presentation assess them critically assess the species critically and what they indicate is something where i think ultimately we need to take this local people also maybe ngos and experts and individuals definitely can help them but somewhere it is happening but not everywhere yeah just to answer you shortly <laughs> ma'am uh, i just wanted to say the quantum of your work is so huge 15 years of monitoring to to see evident results that we are on the right path it is it is a huge uh, work that is been done my my ma'am my question is what kind of funding is mm. would go into this and um what kind of difficulties have you faced while moving through this journey yeah so so right now there was no external funding which was available it was only atul and his family who were funding this and to certain extent we were trying to contribute it just by ourselves going there and maybe sh- maybe sharing our time to monitor all this um yeah so so for sure if you look at the um 
uh, that how it should go further is definitely because now it is with our trust this particular land so definitely we wish to have more funds so that we can do very systematic research and documentation of this process because what has happened even someone has asked in the chat box that is this kind of work is published so because uh, uh, the work that we've been doing through oikos is mostly for private land owners and it's just for them so uh, say for example atul and his family they enjoy just seeing their land flourishing and seeing birds visiting so we never and we were never into research and documentation and again that kind of funds were not with us so very recently now we are moving towards this kind of research and documentation but yeah so so documentation is there with us in the form of maybe photographs and the listings of the species and few notes but not the scientific kind of papers which are published but for sure in West, for western guards we have one or two papers uh, we can share it with uh, you and maybe you can spread it to your groups for sure yeah i you, can provide the addition something maybe yeah additional yes. information uh, i can give to the student that there are some project format of schemes like you know in a project mode sometimes departments also come forward but sure for mmrd region uh, mm -hmm. the mmr uh, da mmrd is an uh, environment society if you apply mm -hmm. to that a good proposal for a uh, forest implantation whatever it is i'm sure you'll get a good amount of money to carry on a project so approach mmrd at least sure Otherwise, there are few schemes also sometimes launched or declared by the government of India. Like the last one was 150 crore for conservation of medicinal plants in the Kokan region, but people didn't didn't pay attention. So all of us can come collectively together. So at least small projects can be undertaken. But look forward, look ahead for information that who are the funding agencies and they do provide. Sometimes okay. if our funding also is good enough to take up certain projects. Hmm. Yes. Anything else? Or? Um, ma'am, there's a question in the uh, chat box uh, where Chintan Bhatt asks: Landscape artists and garden planners in urban areas are not using natives. What can be the solution for that other than awareness? Botanical gardens for them is planting twenty plants in a row of one species and another row with another species. Hmm. Yeah. So the. The answer to this first question, your first question, Chintan, is for sure. I think it's high time uh, this uh, importance of native plants should be maybe highlighted in the syllabus itself. What happens if you look at the syllabus of architecture colleges, they still talk about all non-natives or ornamental plants. So for sure, to certain extent, use that. Maybe to sure, to certain extent, you can use non-invasive kind of ornamental plants within cities. But for sure, for mass greening, mass plantation is high time we should say complete no to non-natives and this must go into the curriculum. And since last few years, we have been definitely working with many uh, architecture colleges, also trying to work with uh, Council of Architecture or ISOLA kind of bodies so that we can push all these kind of concepts which are absolutely ecological. So that kind of awareness and maybe channelizing all these concepts through very much formal channels or authority is extremely important and at least maybe there are various people who are doing it but maybe it will take some time to get executed and botanical garden yeah so what you're saying is true maybe they, if they, they are planting this 20 plants in a row of one species again you go towards a little bit towards monoculture so, but but if you again visit very good botanical gardens, so botanical gardens are meant for definitely for education. Uh, so, if you plant diversity in botanical garden, that's what is definitely needs to be done, even as a concept. So, so yeah, what you're saying is correct. We need to shift maybe from that kind of approach to having diverse diversity on any land. Yeah, someone has a question, you can unmute and ask, right? Hi, uh, Ketki, this is uh, Srini. Uh, Hello. From, uh, hi, I'm from Anamala Hills, Western Ghats. Just uh, yes. uh, very nice talk, uh, very impressive. 
and uh, i just uh, want to ask you few questions um this is recording so you had showed me a, a showed as a one particular species of the the earthworm you said it's it's uh, it looks like a larger earthworm very body size looks very large hmm so i we have heard uh, there are some uh, invasive species looks like that um is it called from africa it has come from africa uh oh. because uh, we have seen in this uh, particular landscape where we working because they have, i think it brought it for the for the um decomposition for the compost hmm. purpose so oh. uh, have you checked i mean uh, the, the this this is a native species uh, or a um, non native because uh, it looks like for me it's a non native thing but i'm i'm not sure the looking at the okay. size because the scale i can't see there it's just a photograph uh, yeah. yeah um just check that i just want to uh, uh, mention that point the other thing um, um you also mentioned about the uh, planting um, trees so some of the uh, trees also you have planted in your restoration sites right if i'm correct if i not missed so where yeah. do you procure those uh, saplings or the or uh, you have uh, any nursery uh, grow those those plants or uh, you get it from uh, somewhere else yeah so uh, we so just to answer your second question first we have our own nursery in pune pune so we have been maybe cultivating all these plants common rare everything mm-hmm. yeah so we okay. keep on increasing it every year <laughs> propagating it we also pro- keep on propagating Uh, publishing this propagation data on our website, and okay. then answering your first question. So we haven't checked whether the earthworm species is non-native or uh, maybe we we haven't checked. But this mm-hmm. particular village is absolutely so remote, extremely mm-hmm. remote. Because mm-hmm. of course, even then there is a possibility that we might have that kind of species, mm-hmm. but not sure. Means there are no any such kind of compost or anything which are people doing. Mm-hmm. but for sure sri nivasan i think we must check that that what is that particular species but at least that species has been beneficial that's yes. what uh, we can mm-hmm. okay. and yeah but sure maybe uh, we we'll check I, that i, I missed the uh, sorry sir i missed the question if you can answer if i know that please repeat that i was on some call here please. so the first question was i uh, when uh, ketki was showing um, uh, a picture of uh, earthworm Yeah. Uh, it do it do look like for me uh, because this I couldn't. It's a picture. I couldn't see the scale because in our landscape we have seen some of the um, earthworm looks very big. Uh, mm-hmm. Not like a regular uh, earthworm. A regular earthworm will be a native one will be very thin and stuff. But there is other uh, species which is also uh, we uh, we assume that it's. it's a non native it has come from uh, africa uh, which is quite larger uh, body shape the size um, that's what uh, i was just asking her uh, whether yeah, to, a, to, 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 i can only give informations i am not a person from zoology but i know two varieties okay. uh, surface and deep burrowing varieties so okay, size okay. also differs from surface to deep burrowing you know Mm-hmm. Some people are doing earthworm cultivations as a culture, as a professionally, you know. Yeah. So the yes. earthworm culture people they import the varieties and they do mm-hmm. in the trays, like you know, mm-hmm. and they dig into the farms for uh, the work that they require to do, mm-hmm. soil churning and all that. So yeah. the one she has showed is yes, it is kind of the variety which can be imported mm-hmm. and put into the trays, and it is a uh, cultivated. Okay. With, uh, okay. In, in earthworm culture, you know. Okay. Other question was the other question was uh, I was asking about the nurse uh, the plants where she procure. Um, yeah, so we have our own nursery for this. So she uh, she said she has her own okay. nursery. Okay, there are many nurseries. Yeah, thanks, uh, Doctor Kathy. Yeah. Thanks. um ma'am there's an other question in the chat box from a uh, mr ramesh singh and he's asking how can forest restoration help in water or natural water stream restoration hmm so yeah so the moment you restore the riparian forest 
it restores the um, streams it means not only with respect to water actually but there are many aspects to any ecosystem I means stream ecology basically so if you protect any patch and if you have a series of bonds so that definitely does soil and moisture conservation which recharges the riparian zone and at the same time if you do right kind of plantation along the riparian zone the functions just restart right so because the flow is then channelized in a very proper way and if there is no erosion happening within the stream also many riverine or in stream habitats also get shaped just because of this uh, forest on the uh, banks also this forest on the bank filters the water so what say for example there is agriculture along the river or stream and if there is a riparian forest it filters everything and then reaches it also add many nutrients in the form of uh, uh, definitely biomass which is which goes into that particular riparian zone as well as river and water yeah so there are n number of benefits so uh, maybe that's a separate lecture i think which could be just around river ecology and streams <laughs> Okay, so since we're running out of time, that was the last question of the th session. Thank you so much for uh, uh, answering us, ma'am. And um, I'd like to call upon Tanya to go ahead and say thank you to you. Thank you uh, so much, ma'am, for this entire long talk that you've given us. It was really very, very interesting because you only ever hear about the ecological side of it and how it will restore, but you never see what work goes into it. What are the indicators? What is the what are the trees used? How it looks like? What it feels like? It's so thank you for all of the information you gave us, all the pictures and all the knowledge that you've given us today. Thank you so much. Thank you. My pleasure. Thank you so much, Tanya. Thank you so much, ma'am. And um, now moving forward. Small, small interruption, not interruption, but advice to youngsters like you. To understand Dr. Ketki's lecture, you have to move around in the forest area in different seasons, you know, and start remembering what she has all told. We'll come across those trees. Even if you go to the Wada, Shahpur, Mokhada, Zawar, all around Mumbai, you know, you will understand her lecture better and many, many more facets will be revealing, you know, and the way she has told it, you know, it is very, very educative for all youngsters like you. So take around the excursions to the area. Keeping in mind of her lecture, you know, you will find that how fascinating it was. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. Okay. Um, moving forward, our next session is by Mrs. Usha Lachungpa on the topic, Role of Trees for Eco Restoration in Sikkim Himalaya. And for the introduction of whom, I'd like to call upon Mr. Harshwardhan Gupta, a first-year Masters of Botany student. Over to you, Harsh. Thank you, Anushka. Um, on behalf of St. James Institute, I am pleased to welcome Mrs. Usha Rachumpa, who is the founder member and president of Green Circle, Sikkim's first environment NGO and current board member of Sikkim Biodiversity Board. She has devoted four decades of her life exploring parts of Sikkim unknown to scientists and making huge contributions to biodiversity research and conservation in Sikkim as well as numerous awareness and outreach programs all over India. After completing her MSc in Zoology from Mumbai University, she topped the postgraduate diploma in advanced wildlife management and research from Wildlife Institute of India, Dehradun. In doing so, she secured a gold and two silver medals and became the first woman and first non-forester to complete the course. She started as a project officer and went on to become principal research officer under the Forest, Environment and Wildlife Management Department of Government of Sikkim, serving 31 years. She is also the founder member of Sikkim Ornithological Society, IUCN Commission member, State Coordinator of the BNHS Indian Bird Conservation Network and Governing Council Member of BNHS Mumbai. She worked on two projects on hydrobiology in Keola Dev National Park, Rajasthan as a field biologist and traveled across 15 states looking for critically endangered lesser and Bengal floricans. Apart from biodiversity, Mrs. Usha was also a part of experimental butterfly breeding project at Saramsa and Middle Camp in East Sikkim and is credited for the first photographic record of threatened butterfly, Kaisa Rehind. Mrs. Usha is the recipient of some prestigious awards, like the State Award, awarded by the Government of Sikkim on Republic Day, All India National Radio Award for radio feature, Birds Without Binox, Lifetime Service Award, Sikkim Women Factor Award, and Wildlife Service Award. A hearty welcome to you, ma'am. Uh, 
हेलो आई होप यू कैन हियर मी यस मैम दैट्स वेरी नाइस बिकॉज राइट नाउ आई एम इन द विलेज ऑफ लाचुम बिकॉज वी हैव स्टार्टेड आर द न्यू ईयर फ्रॉम हियर दिस फेस्टिवल कॉल डोसर एंड सो वी ऑल हियर इन लाचुम एंड आई होप द नेटवर्क होल्ड and i'm very happy to see sawan ji and uh, siroza ma'am i think we had met during one of the fot meetings in uh, when our governor of sikkim also shrinivas patil ji had come uh, and i'm very i'm really honored to see this huge gathering of people i'm so grateful to dr rajendra shinde for inviting me and for vijaya to uh, coordinate this meeting i'm ha- really happy to hear kt's presentation because uh, we are connected in a way that you know i've been receiving monthly icos calendars in my email from her so it has been really wonderful i mean i'm con- i congratulate you for all the hard work uh, and successes that you've been having and best wishes uh, i'd like to yeah i'd like to just start off because now i think i have uh, the time is over short and uh, i don't may not have enough time so i'll try to keep my presentation uh, a bit short Uh, I'd like to start sharing my screen. Okay. Ah, uh, uh, can you see my screen? Yes. 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 Yes
why we have frequent landslides why we have frequent uh, earthquakes it's because of the the way we have been formed the himalayas as you know the young cold mountains you know we have been uh, still the indian subcontinent is pushing up the asian plate into the uh, into the uh, what is yeah in, into the upper regions the actually the entire uh, eurasian plate that uh, is still happening and uh, the two plates are still pushing against each other the earth crust is still being pushed upward the himalayas are still rising a few centimeters every year so that is known to all and we've actually lost the tethys sea of which a few remnants can still be found you know in the form of fossils so with this kind of background we can see that sikkim occupies a really tiny place in the himalayas in the youngest mountains in the world but we are at the region where we have got the complete uh, coming in of the southwest monsoon and uh, blocked the wind which are blocked the rain which are actually blocked by the tibetan plateau in the north the huge kanchenjunga uh, massifs on the left and uh, on the right we have the chola range separating bhutan from sikkim so all this makes sikkim like a gigantic horseshoe into which the southwest monsoon uh, enter and sikkim becomes the wettest region in the himalayas also because of the altitudinal gradient and the steepness it's like a you know it's like an ecological like a floristic or like a biodiversity ladder where at every altitude you know you get different species of flora and fauna that's some of one of the most amazing things that uh, seen about sikkim and of course we have a piece of ladakh in sikkim the trans himalayas there we have the same kind of species that are uh, represented in the cold desert of, of the the cold roof of the world and here are some of the glimpses of the roof of the world uh, part in sikkim and then as you come down we've got these uh, oak forests and as you come further down uh, we have the sal and teak forests in the lower belt and between the roof of the world and the oak forest we have the temperate zone right now i am in that temperate zone so we've got uh, these uh, silver fir and rhododendron fir forest yak so that kind of habitat so uh, the main uh, importance of the sikkim for the sikkimese are the two river systems which are actually uh, flowing through this altitude altitudinal zone and uh, the tista is the main river of sikkim which is worshiped like the mount kanchenjunga which actually we have a state holiday to worship the mountain so that's something very unique for sikkim and is actually responsible for religion being one of the reasons for protecting the state biodiversity so so a, a few brief, brief glimpses of the fauna of the cold desert and uh, of the community the human diversity of sikkim and the forgotten nomads who are responsible for uh, the largest mammals in sikkim the yak also at the low altitudes we have the indigenous tribe called the lepchas who are using uh, so many of the natural resources in their day to day life so these are uh, a few brief glimpses of the domesticated and uh, the diversity of sikkim and for the wildlife also we have an un kind of uh, unparalleled diversity of birds and plants so you can see the kind of uh, diversity just a very brief glimpse the some of the insectivorous plants that we have the medicinal plants that we have we even have this beautiful plant called the giant rhubarb which is like our own hot house protecting you know thousands of flowers inside those racks hey 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 and uh, the forest department also was instrumental in uh, trying to identify and protect heritage trees in the state so we have quite a few of those which have been notified by the government now after finishing with that excuse me i'm having a bit of family here so here is a small picture of the habitat for the uh, the temperate zone of sikkim you can see a silver fir and a rhododendron forest which are, is the habitat for the yak in sikkim these are animals that cannot come down come below 
this altitude and they don't survive well below this altitude so this is the natural habitat and uh, a brief glimpse of the protected areas which i spoke about we have the highest coverage almost 80% of the state is under the jurisdiction of the forest department and of that about 40% is protected either as the world heritage site the kanchanjunga national park and we have seven wildlife sanctuaries we even have one conservation reserve for an orchid a ground orchid which uh, has survived fire over the years so it, i would say it's a, like a you know it's uh, like the phoenix for sikkim we have identified and recognized important bird and biodiversity areas 11 of them and we have three ex situ conservation breeding sites throughout sikkim the himalayan zoological park above gangtok a rangrang butterfly park in uh, north sikkim and the sikkim tulku bird park in west sikkim so i would now like to for the uh, for the present i would like to talk about these seven example or case studies i would uh, say uh they are the himalayan zoological park which i just spoke about then there is a place called the b2 landslide zone and then there is another one called the lanthe khola landslide zone and this is all along the way to north sikkim along the way to lachung and then there is a meong waterfalls and the landslide zone then uh, the earthquake area the mantam landslide a temporary lake and tree ferns the uh, living fossils of sikkim lema uh, avalanche in lachung in north sikkim again and beyond that the yumthang avalanche and the air blast in the temporary lake i'll talk about that one by one now but uh, to come to that just if you can see all the green spots these uh, were uh, where we had uh, landslide episodes earthquake induced landslides in 2011 So as you can see, there were so many of them almost throughout this the Lachung Valley and other areas. So I will concentrate on these seven examples. So coming to the Himalayan Zoological Park, it's not related to the, not really linked to the landslide and uh, earthquake, but this is the first uh, wooded area for Gangtok. In fact, it's the source of Gangtok's water supply, part of this source because of the forested area. but once this was the grazing land for gangtok cattle and just sensing and declaring it as a himalayan zoological park uh, this has created such a lush secondary forest today that there is more wildlife outside the enclosures in fact people when they walk in our zoological park they are afraid that they might encounter a wild uh, himalayan black bear or you know some other big what they would consider dangerous animal so uh, a glimpse of that you can see the forest outside the enclosure now this is a picture taken from inside the enclosure so you can see the trees they are outside and even in the parking area you can see that there is a whole lot of cryptomeria plantation these are plants that i showed in the earlier slide that cryptomeria japonica is an exotic which was introduced by robert fortune in the mid 90s and this has been taken taken up was taken up very extensively by the forest department uh, about 3 4 oh, decades ago and now they no longer plant this tree because we are all going in for indigenous species and trying to gradually phase out the cryptomeria but see this is another glimpse of the himalayan zoological park the wild side of it you can see the hodgson's giant flying squirrel which is in the wild or this is a view a view a pic photograph taken from the window of the uh, office of the himalayan zoological park so you can see in the second frame a jackal a golden jackal as well as a barking deer in the same frame just outside the window the photographer is my daughter milla who is also named after a bird of sikkim now coming to the second one the b2 landslide zone this is a old picture of the land slide zone from a study and uh, it's it's a huge area about 1 square kilometer and why is it called b2 is because it's near the bridge 2 which is about 12 kilometers from gangtok northwards and you can see the date 1965 july this uh, landslide had occurred because of heavy rain so this is called a rock come debris avalanche and this is the bridge this is b2 this bridge separates the east district which is on the right 
and towards the left is the north district uh, where it starts so this is the bridge uh, on the gangtok north sikkim state highway from which the area gets its name and these are photographs that i took yesterday so from a distance you can see that the road in the middle which is being you can see a few landslides and a few habitations that's the road to north sikkim and this is the patch now after after this picture today's yesterday's picture would be this patch if you can see this patch over here this is a patch which has been colonized by the himalayan alder which is called alnus nepalensis or utis in nepali and this tree is is the best tree for sikkim i would say you can see them here also these trees are the ones that come up like a monoculture in any landslide uh, they are unfortunately fast growing and not very uh, i mean i think they short rooted also because they do fall down very easily if there is a huge wind storm but the best part of them is that they do they fix nitrogen their root nodules uh, are very useful for actually enriching the soil and then making way for the other plant species and other tree species to come up so as you can see this beautiful round patch was the b2 landslide so here are some brief glimpses of the tree and the undergrowth that uh, has and come up because of them especially a lot of bamboo you can see in the second photograph and these are the trees which here at this altitude still have their leaves on them when i take you further north you will have see, you will see that today at this time this is a picture also from yesterday and uh, in lachung also you will find that these trees have no leaves at all because they deciduous we have tried like the local people they go in for divine intervention to try and prevent landslides but it doesn't help when there is more and more uh, road expansion work taking place almost every day because these areas are leading into really famous ecotourism destinations of which lachung is one of them so you can see how densely the tree cover has come up nobody has planted these trees so this is how mother nature is desperately trying to restore herself and how we are equally desperately trying to undo her work so this is another photograph you can see there's a landslide also happening where the jcb is trying to dig and extract rocks for widening the roads and then uh, we have a glimpse of the sacred forest along the way it's called kabi and here you can see some of the really large old trees this is a natural habitat which would have come up uh, on its own i mean hundreds of years ago possibly now coming to the third one this is called a lante khola landslide area so lante itself in nepali means troublesome so the tr khola is a stream so this actually here is a stream lante khola is somewhere in this part of sikkim right almost in the center and lante khola you can see the kind of damage control that has been attempted because this is the main highway i have done all my surveys in the past on this route we've had to walk to do something called transship because uh, transshipping means when the road is absolutely not passable then you uh, walk with all your luggage on your back through the landslide through the water and you never know what uh, you know when you're going to trip and fall in that crushing stream then cross over on the other side try to find another vehicle and then uh, go on to the next landslide through the same thing there so these are very difficult areas that's why this area is called lanche kola it's been christened as that a long time ago and again as you can see this is above the road and this is below the road so you can see how much of the tenching and all has been tried to kind of hold the road up and uh, so you can see this is a photograph uh, which i took on the 22nd of february so this is the same area the same road and now these more and more huge boulders have come but you can see the vegetation has already started coming in and even below the road where these uh, you had these structures now you can see that uh, you know there is vegetation growing mostly it is polygonum in this stage and you can see the utis trees the gyalnus uh, nepalensis coming up so here is another glimpse 
these have already colonized the slopes and uh, the secondary growth uh, i mean the other shrubs have all started coming in and this area is now enriching itself now coming to the fourth one is called meong meong is a huge waterfall and earlier when we had come here in about 1984 again we couldn't cross over so we had to go all the way back down and try to cross the uh, river where it was possible and this was very difficult in fact once and i tried to cross here and my jeep had got stuck here and the force of water was pushing it to the edge so it was really very dangerous and a lot of uh, unfortunate incidents have happened along this route now this uh, photograph is now look it now now looks like this so you can see the drastic uh, efforts that mother nature has taken to try and uh, help herself where we are not helping bridges have been washed away often the boulders have come crashing down you know a lot of lives have been lost and still mother nature is kind of trying trying her best to pick up and using this particular indigenous tree called the himalayan elder now coming to the mantam landslide uh, zone now i would like to actually highlight the role of tree ferns which are the living fossil ferns in sikkim we have got about nine types of tree ferns in sikkim and these are i would, I would like to see show you actually their role on the 13th of august in 2016 we had a massive landslide in zongu which is the heartland of the lepcha tribe that i spoke about and uh, i had published an article in the envis newsletter about this so here was this huge landslide which actually came down and there was a air blast which knocked down hundreds and th hundreds of trees on the opposite slope so this was uh, something that was very scary for the local people because what happened was the debris came down and it blocked off the river which is flowing underneath created a huge temporary lake and you can see the tops of uh, houses here yeah. a lot of the himalayan alder trees themselves were being uh, drowned in this uh, impounded water so what it was uh, described was a wedge type failure near the top of the landslide followed by a translational type of failure in the main body because this was uh, <clears throat> an aquifer in induced pour pressure on the monsoon rains over the years since the 2011 landslide and that stress has actually uh, caused this event but uh, so when we visited this area we saw that this is the opposite side of the landslide you can see that the wash the air blast actually has totally devastated the slope on the opposite side of the river and here in this slide when i visited it on 9th of september in 2016 you know most of it was uh, all damaged but little bits of green as uh, you can see are the ferns and tree ferns they were trying to come up and exactly a month later 9th of october you can see the tree ferns have started throwing out new fronds and the area has kind of tried to stabilize on 19th october also one of these uh, areas you can see the only plants that have really come up are the living fossils so here is how you know we could highlight the role of uh, these often uncared for or you know unnoticed plants that we have in our landscape and which could be used even now i mean they are very endangered itself in sikkim because a lot of them are being chopped down for uh, by orchid growers to plant orchids on because on their stems their orchids grow very easily so tree ferns themselves are endangered but see the role that they are playing here it's just not uh, it's it's just it, you just can't say enough about these tree ferns i mean i i really love these beautiful plants that have been with us since the time of dinosaur you know we had we were not there when these trees were there on the earth now coming to the sixth example the second last one of which i'm talking about is the lema avalanche in lachung which we recently visited after a long time the arrow shows here a huge avalanche that had come now this is 
now this is a photo recent photograph a huge avalanche had come down the mountain and why we visited this place was because this uh, land belonged to my husband family and they used to plant a lot of potatoes and maize in this area himalayan black bear used to raid these uh, crop fields and you can see this side somebody's crop field and the land is still there but this avalanche completely came and covered the crop fields over here so in the past i mean see now what you can see here all these totally leafless trees they are all himalayan elders nobody planted them they've come up like it's a dense forest department plantation okay. an old picture which uh, during the uh, 2011 uh, earthquake this happened during the earthquake so at that time uh, the avalanche had come down and uh, following that the government had tried some uh measures to help the people by giving them employment saying that if you could cut terraces then they would get some money so this was the land that belonged to my husband's family which was totally destroyed by the avalanche and uh, see you can see here that some kind of uh, human activity has taken place after the avalanche but it has totally ruined the area for for the cultivation by the local people who are actually marginal farmers they have very little land on these steep slopes so a little bit of land loss is a huge loss economic loss for the family but having uh, after this then the plantation has come up now this is yesterday's photograph it's a very bad photograph because the weather was not good it was rainy and foggy and there was a hailstorm but still i've tried to just see if you can see this smoky patch this is the avalanche completely covered by himalayan elders now if the it was left to the local people or the government to do this it would have never happened here's a close up view when we went to see this area now this was the old potato farm so you can see this lema avalanche completely dominated by uti the last example that i would like to give you was another famous the uh, rock avalanche that we had in 2015 this is we are at a place called yumthang which is another mm. very popular tourist destination again here the avalanche came down from this slope this slope and it came across onto the other side and thousands of trees were knocked down by the air blast again because of the uh, debris and a temporary lake was formed and here uh, i'd just like to give a little bit of text the 2015 rock avalanche this uh, the blast of air you know this because the valleys are very narrow now la chung now la means pass and chung means small so it's a very small pass this entire valley and so you can imagine a huge uh, avalanche coming on one side it's going to create a massive blast of air knocking down trees on the other side so the temporary lake was actually so big that it was actually christened by the local uh, holy person here and it was named as kipcho kipcho means a good lake and a lot of migratory birds also started settling here on their migratory migration down to the indian plains or on their way up and people were actually photographing them i also have a few photographs and a lot of tourism was uh, it, it, what do we call it uh, uh, hazard tourism you know there is a word for that so that kind of tourism people actually coming to see the landslide and coming to see the damage but then the kipcho also started attracting uh, tourists and this was one more kind of a viewing area for them and by now now the natural regeneration of the rhododendrons and firs have already set in so here is the picture of the temporary lake which was formed in 2016 and you can see that by 2021 it's almost gone and there is a bit there is you can see a bit of greenery still happening around here so here is a view an earlier view of the air uh, damage caused by the air blast luckily there is not much and actually you can see the main river actually running down this way so the avalanche came from this side and has knocked down trees on this side and you can see this is the natural regeneration of the sikkim fir which is ab stensa and this has come up also i mean it also comes up like the himalayan elder you can see the similarity they are all young trees they are not at all old 
trees. So in the youngest mountains, we have young trees and a very unstable ecosystem. So I'd uh, just like to highlight these four species. There are plenty of them, but for the focus uh, of this presentation, these few species I'd like to highlight as the heroes of the day. The Himalayan uh, alder or Alnus nepalensis, the Sikkim fir, Abies densa, a whole lot of rhododendron species. And in the lower altitudes, we have got Simplocos and other species, tree species. So I'm highlighting only the tree species over here. But I would also like to bring in the Cryptomeria japonica, the exotic that says, the book says that they grow, do well in warm climates and that they don't do well in cold climates. But here is a view of our house in Lachung from where I'm actually talking to you right now. As you can see, a few days back, we had so much snowfall that we couldn't move out of this place. All the Cryptomeria trees are just not only doing well, they're also regenerating naturally. We are, these the trees in the foreground, this area was uh, also an earlier uh, cultivable area. But since nobody was cultivating anymore, when my mom-in-law passed away, so there was no one cultivating. So there were some Cryptomeria trees were planted by the department. But now you can, under these, I mean, if you give a closer view to these, a whole lot of natural regeneration is happening and all this dense growth is coming up on its own. So, in fact, people are actually chopping down the trees here. And, and we are just trying to protect a few of those that we have. Though they are exotic, they are very good. I find found that uh, during hailstorms, actually, a lot of birds take shelter in them. But look at the slope behind. I'll show you this slope here on the closer picture. My husband said that about 25 years ago, this area was barren. Then a whole lot of other Lachumpas also said that this slope, when they were young, there were no trees on this slope. But now is it because of climate change or is it because no people are not really going up too much into the forest these days? This is the habitat now. So left, un left undisturbed, left untrampled. You know, the nature has such a way of coming back and trying to restore itself. And all we need to do is to keep awake. Here is an example where we have not kept awake. This area is also the view from my window on the other side of Lachun. This is also part of Lachun, but the, uh, for the defense purposes, to go to the border uh, towards China, a road had to be made. So this entire hill was blasted. When this was blasted, this entire side came down. And this was a good 25 years ago. Till date, this area has not recovered because the road network is still there. People are now building house, buildings and houses over here. And this area is just not being allowed to regenerate. So here is an example of disturbance, which is more or less uncurable. So having said this, uh, I would like to emphasize the importance of these undisturbed areas as wildlife corridors to mitigate human wildlife conflict. We have a lot of them in Sikkim. A lot of Himalayan black bear are today really not only coming into crop fields, but they're also attacking livestock and human casualties have also been happening in the game. So Himalayan black bear, then we've got the barking deer, we even have the national bird, the bee fowl, which has been invading crop fields. We have the giant African snail, which is infesting the lower altitudes. We have porcupines and a whole lot of creatures now because we have disrupted the migratory corridors or the movement corridors for these animals. So this is another important thing to keep in mind that these forests, which we are keeping undisturbed, need, need to be kept so if we don't want conflicts with wildlife. And what happens when we have conflict is uh, known to all. In the whole of horrendous pictures that, uh, that, we, that we have, but we can't show them. Also, the presence of invasive plant species along the roadside forests and openings that have been created for road network, for dams, and for a whole lot of other uh, infrastructure development, as we call them. And it has choked not only the native flora, but it has brought in a lot of exotic, uh, in exotic invasives like Romalina, Eupatorium, Mycenia, Mycrensa. This is my butterfly park. You can imagine it's completely infested by the myelominate weed in North Sikkim. So I'd like to end with this note of caution that uh, a, a whole lot of major issues of concern are also invasive alien species. 
that once they uh, are allowed to have their say just because they look pretty like tithonia diversifolia or they attract a lot of butterflies like chromolina or lantana what we stand to lose is a lot of habitat for our butterflies for our birds for all the tree species that depend on these pollinators to for their survival thank you thank you so much these are the four state symbols of the kim the rhododendron nevium the dendrobium nobili the red panda and the blood prism i'd like to end my presentation here thank you so much thank you so much ma'am for that wonderful presentation we are now open for questions so if anybody has any questions please feel free to type them down in the chat box or ask to unmute yourself so that we can you know let you permit you to ask your question lovely presentation usha loved it <laughs> yeah uh, ma'am i have a question like what do you think is the future of north sikkim you sir you you perceive through your eyes when uh, with respect to invasive species like uh, bromelina and uh, we have the lantana camara too so how can we try to evade evade out those species from our natural habitat uh, i mean the good part of it is thanks for the question the good part of it is that uh, in natural forest areas these invasive species don't do well uh, they come up very well where the forests are opened up so what we want to worry is where the forests are opened up you know whether they need to be opened up and i have i in the ignorance of the people actually is something we really need to worry about because a lot of even foresters they see green cover and they say see last year it was a landslide this year it's become so green then i have to point out as a bee and invasive species this is mykenia this is not native this has come from south america you know it's going to in, it's invader it's not something that we should be proud about but for not second i would say that uh, again it's lack of awareness or you know we need a lot of awareness about these species luckily chromolina has not reached lachung though uh, the himalayan elder has reached lachung now slowly every year i have been seeing that these invasive species are going higher and higher and with more and more tourism coming in with more and more uh, emphasis for defense uh, purposes you know the roads being widened tanks being taken up so the bridges need to be strengthened a whole lot of non native uh, people are also coming in and settling that itself is putting a lot of burden on this already fragile habitat so i feel that the future for north sikkim depends on how we uh, want it to be you know if we want more tourists if we want uh, you know more money then we are going to lose a lot of the natural wealth that has been freely gifted upon us and uh, if we are a little careful and we talk about wise kind of tourism a real ecotourism not just ecotourism in forest areas not just tourism in forest areas but real ecotourism then we have a lot of chance to have the same habitat for a few more decades i i really am not very <laughs> optimistic these days looking at what's going on hello uh, can i speak uh, yeah yes. uh, uh, hello shant this is shashirekha and uh, it was a very nice uh, talk uh, that you have given and uh, you have actually uh, given a jolt that uh, of of the danger that is in store uh, or the natural dangers and how uh, nature takes care of itself i just wanted to know uh, you said the alder species and the tree ferns uh, they uh, occupy the place of uh, the landslides on their own is what you said right now, now uh, correct is it is that what you meant that they no 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 uh, uh, the himalayan alder yes that comes yeah. up uh, very well and very fast in open landslide areas yeah. but the tree ferns already there i mean they got okay. crushed under okay. all the other trees okay, okay. but they came yeah. back you know yeah the so that means all fallen down yeah so that means the tree ferns are the original uh, uh, inhabitants and uh, is there any such patch existing uh, where these original patch of vegetation uh, with the other uh, uh, tree species also uh, uh, identified or uh, found where you can uh, guess ki these are the uh, original inhabitants which are there yes yes i'm sure see because a lot of the area uh, in around above zongu actually the kanjanganga national park Yeah. you know since that been declared uh, now it's over almost 30 40 years ago 
so there is uh, a lot of areas which of course those which are opened up for tourism and trekking and mountaineering yeah. those are not yeah. really in great shape but okay. the rest of the areas where we are not really intruding those would that still do still have good habitat yeah but i i have seen the scriptomeria uh, forest as you say na the uh, secondary forest and it, it I, i used to think that it's a natural thing now I, it's a uh, news to me that it's not a natural one and it's a secondary uh, thing that has come up uh, but is it possible for uh, planting those original species in these places like how we do it in uh, the tropical regions like you know we, even if it is a slope uh, it is uh, sort of uh, not so in inho- inhospitable to go and plant the trees on the slopes and such how how possible is it is in this second kind of landscape yeah, it's possible i mean uh, since the uh, but let me just tell you about cryptomeria cryptomeria hmm. japonica as a, just as a uh, of interest maybe of interest to you cryptomeria yeah. japonica was introduced by one of the maharajas of sikkim they are called chogyal Mm-hmm. and that was to actually they brought in an exotic tree to define the boundaries of reserve forest yeah because it's an exotic you know yeah. it, it would be a living boundary and yeah. uh, that actually uh, was a very interesting thing to have done yeah. but they were coming up so well that yeah. the forest department started planting them everywhere and oh. now we noticed that under the cryptomeria trees they don't allow other trees to grow other plants to grow Uh, in a few I, patches uh, a little bit of uh, eupatorium may come up but yeah. under cryptomeria if you try to dig you find that the root system is matted so much on the ground you know they, it's just not uh, possible for anything else to come up yeah so, yeah yeah they they are very very <laughs> strong colonizers and now okay. their uh, natural regeneration was not happening before it's okay. happening only in the last decade or so okay so they have so, adapted very well yeah it's like many of the tropical plants that we see and we are trying to replace it with native species in the warmer regions so cryptomeria is one such uh, example which makes, which is which equivalent to the uh, subabul subabul type of uh, of uh, tree yeah yeah. Uh, yeah yeah not prosopis uh, acacia Prosopis. auriculiformis 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 okay. yeah yeah so no, that, also i said also, also prosopis is also I yeah yeah it, fast spreading well, fast spreading yeah That, that's really interesting it it has kindled my interest to read more about these temperate plants <laughs> thank you so much yeah okay thank you so much for all of your questions i would like to extend a warm thank you to um usha ma'am thank you so much for showing us so much of sikkim through the slide and also showing us about the damage that has happened throughout the years because of our own faults as humans in a how we keep exploiting natural resources and i hope a few of us present here have learned what we can do in order to you know reverse that or contribute to making less of damage and more of an impact so thank you so much usha ma'am for that wonderful presentation thank uh, you and uh, okay so now moving on to the last session before we move on for a break This session is by Dr. Ranjan Panda and he will be talking to us about Adivasis and Trees, a close-knit family that helps us conserve ecosystems and fight climate change. And for the introduction of whom, I'd like to call upon Ms. Kiran Bhattacharjee, a second-year BSc student and the head of events and PR of the Xavier's Association of Botany. Over to you, Kiran. Dr. Ranjan Panda, popularly known as Bottom Man of Odisha, is a sociologist by education. has about three decades of experience facilitating several initiatives, starting from grassroots to national as well as South Asian levels to promote water, environmental conservation, and climate change advocacy. He convenes two active networks, that is, Water Initiatives and Combat Climate Change Network India. He is a well-known expert on water, sanitation, disasters, and climate change issues, and also a senior columnist. In fact, he can claim to be among the first persons in India who flagged off climate change issues in the country way back in the early 90s. Popularly known as the Waterman of Odisha and also called as Climate Crusader in India, he was awarded by the President of India with the first Green Hero by NDTV Toyota. 
he has many more awards and recognitions to his credit he has got a long experience research and policy analysis advocacy on social ecology water sanitation hygiene disasters and climate change issues dr ranjan is regularly invited to speak in national and international seminars workshops and even universities on water sanitation environment disasters and climate change issues covering both rural and urban areas so this online dais is all yours thank you thank you uh, thank you so much for the introduction uh, am i audible yes sir okay thanks and thanks for the invitation and uh, as uh, my introduction says i'm i'm definitely not an academic doctor so uh, i'm just a common person and uh, uh, the second uh, one disclaimer i start uh, is i'm i'm just a sociologist a social anthropologist and not a botanist as many of you and your college uh, that 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 actually organizes this so that is first disclaimer so my perspectives are from the society from social ecology and uh, the second uh, uh, thing that i would like to say and, and rather Uh, you know, seek an apology. Is I could not uh, prepare a PowerPoint presentation for my my tough uh, schedules uh, due to some family health issues and other field related uh, uh, visits and all. So please excuse me for that. Well, but I'll definitely try to uh, talk in a way that uh, uh, that doesn't you know sort of uh, that makes things you know easier. So uh, the the topic I chose. Uh, was definitely uh, not something that people don't know, uh, but then something that normally people don't discuss when it it comes to you know discussing ecosystems and uh, you know uh, sort of uh, all trees, forests. So it's all uh, it's all uh, sort of uh, a different discussion. Uh, it happens everywhere. So people, uh, tribals, the indigenous communities. they normally don't feature in most of the technical discussions but but fortunately there are certain platforms uh, which uh, we, we never thought they will uh, they will come uh, you know to prominence but uh, fortunately they are coming so i'll come in my presentation but i'll i'll start with a small story uh, you know uh, why why i thought this topic was important in your seminar uh, which talks about trees uh, and i talk about forests so basically a uh, tree tree is a component of forest forest is an ecosystem you you all uh, must have discussed i'm sorry i could not attend the other sessions and i will not also be able to attend the other speakers while they are very important uh, but then i think uh, forests uh, forests are uh, the not only combination of trees and uh, forests are not you know something different from the local communities that reside either inside the forest or nearby nearby the forest so so my topic is like uh, linking linking the both as an ecosystem in, in itself so i start with a story i uh, long long time back i think uh, me and one of my very close friends who is a uh, ardent uh, wildlife conservationist and also uh, is a is very you know referred person in uh, uh, in in uh, the media on ecosystems and all so we were traveling on his jeep and each time he saw a head loader a, a local villager with some a few load you know going to sell in the market he would actually get outraged and he would say that see these people are destroying the forest and they must be banned from you know visiting the forest so uh, each time he would say that i would try to convince him actually that's not the case so uh, you know for like for my own study says uh, for uh, each uh, like several villages we have studied and uh, you know the adivasis are actually the real protectors of forest they might be uh, actually using the forest and that's why uh, they are part of the forest and that's why they are might be protecting or they are protecting for other reasons i will come to that but then uh, but then you know for each uh i also tried to giving give him examples the jeep that you are riding uh the fossil fuel it it runs on you know it it has destroyed a lot of natural forests 
and the adivasi in fact while actually selling some fuel load for his survival uh, or uh, you know uh, just using some of that for as timber in his house that small hut he has built uh, he is actually protecting a lot of forests uh, just just for example there are there are villages uh, where we, we study and we work uh, like just for a village of 40 families you know they must be protecting 400 500 acres of uh, natural forest so you just imagine you just uh, sort of you know uh, uh, make the calculation but at the you know at the city where my friend stays or i stay uh, how much tree actually i am protecting i am rather destroying each day my carbon footprint my ecological footprint is so much high that i am actually destroying some forest somewhere but the tribal but the adivasi the local head loader is actually i am not trying to romanticize of course but then but then definitely a lot of them many of them actually do the protection for us and that's now fortunately being recognized even by scientific bodies so i'll come to that so i start with that story and uh, there is another take to that also sometime if uh, if in the flow it comes i'll definitely say another story so uh, let me begin with uh, you know my talk with uh, some important findings of the latest ipcc report all of you uh, must have uh, actually gone through on 28 it was released uh, the sixth assessment report and that's the most comprehensive one by hundreds of scientists from across the world called the ar6 by the intergovernmental panel on climate change and it wants uh, that any further delay in global action you know to slow climate change and adapt to its impacts will miss a brief and rapidly closing window of opportunity to secure a livable and sustainable future for all uh, you know for uh, for all of us this one follows the publication of the first part of the air 6 that was released last august and that set out how and why the earth's climate is changing so focusing on the impacts of global warming and efforts to adapt to it the report lays bare how climate change is being felt across the planet you know among the findings i would say uh, the report concludes so these are very important i would say uh, things that we must know because we are talking about you know ecosystem restoration and in the wake of a climate change you know uh, regime and era <clears throat> so climate change has already caused substantial damages and increasingly in irreversible losses in terrestrial fresh water and coastal and open ocean marine marine ecosystems uh, it is likely that the proportion of the terrestrial and fresh water species at very high risk of you know extinction will reach 9% or maximum 14% at 1.5 degree and rises to uh, 8 maximum 18% at 2 degree and maximum 29% at 3 degree celsius so the world is now currently trying to you know uh, keep uh, the overall global temperature limit uh, you know against a set you know against a uh, uh, you know a set uh, time uh, to to 1.5 degrees uh, you know all, all of us know that so approximately 3 3 3.3 to 3.6 billion people live in contexts that are highly vulnerable to climate change you know these are the people also who are going to uh, face severe water crisis we already know the kind of water crisis uh, we we face so and where climate change impacts intersect with areas of high vulnerability we we study some of these areas anyway in some other context i will i will say uh, it, it is contributing to humanitarian crisis and increasingly driving displacement in all regions with small island states disproportionately affected not not only in small island states i would say we have studied in the coastal regions of bay of bengal how many people are already facing displacement due to sea rise and other slow onset disasters so the vulnerability uh, of these communities actually are growing and and climate change is actually providing to a force uh, multiplier to that increasing weather and climate extreme events have exposed millions of people to acute food insecurity and reduced water security i will i will come to uh, some of the uh, some of the testimonies uh, in in the last part of my uh, my speech uh, how uh, local community initiatives are actually uh, fighting this how they are actually 
uh, actually by by preserving local natural forests are actually creating local food security and water security so these uh, these uh, imp these impacts are very very relevant uh, to understand so with, with, with the most significant impacts seen in parts of africa asia central and uh, south america small islands and the arctic approximately 50 to 75% of the global population could be exposed to periods of life threatening climatic conditions due to extreme heat and humidity by to, uh, by the end of the century climate change uh, will increasingly put pressure on food production and access especially in vulnerable regions undermining food security and nutrition all all this uh, we already know climate change and extreme weather events will significantly increase ill health and premature deaths uh, from the near to long terms uh, the report wants that if global warming passes 1.5 degree uh, from the threshold limit uh, even if overshooting that global average temperature temporarily before falling back again uh, human and natural systems will face additional severe risks including some of uh, that are irreversible so we are uh, like uh, uh, and, and and commenting on that report you must have heard in newspapers and and, and other uh, you know television channels the secretary general of the un actually said uh, described it as an atlas of human suffering and a damning in, you know indictment of failed climate leadership so this is a failed climate leadership the whole world but there are uh, villages in india uh, elsewhere in the world who are actually climate champions the, the indigenous communities so we will come to that so we are like any delay in actions means actually death so we are all dead if uh, we don't take climate actions and something that is uh, the ipcc is starting to realize and 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 other scientific communities are also starting to realize you know among the um, among the actions that the report suggests there has been a lot of emphasis on nature based solutions you know i i i want uh, actually discuss nature based solution uh, the term at the moment this is being discussed and con there have been controversies people like us actually we call uh, you know ecosystem uh, based uh, approaches uh, rather than nature based solutions but then the ipcc also has discussed this and there have been views on uh, how ecosystem uh, you know based approaches are better than just calling it nature based solutions because in nature based solutions basically you know we are talking about how humans will benefit from nature but then in ecosystem based approaches we basically are we are saying that how this this becomes in harmony with other species so both of both of us benefit from each other so i think uh, that is a separate debate uh, can be flagged off for uh, for later so in fact many sections of the report deal with the effectiveness of you know nature based solutions in climate change adaptation and mitigation mitigation it accepts with high confidence see these are the languages uh, the the report use you know which part of their findings are high confidence which are low confidence which are medium confidence because all these ipcc reports are based on thousands of scientific uh, you know assessment of thousands of scientific uh, research uh, from all across the world so these authors uh, of, of this group like this is the who are working report too and uh, the group two technical reports there are several reports so they they basically accord a kind of confidence level to their uh, their projections they are uh, on on their projections and all, also their suggestions on impact so this this report accepts with high confidence that nature based solutions provide adaptation and mitigation benefits for climate change as well as contributing to other sustainable development goals it uh, i would like to highlight here uh, you know a particular portion of the report that's uh, relevant to this talk of mine it says for nature based solutions to succeed it is critical that they support local livelihoods uh, one indigenous local communities and millions of private landowners or land holders should benefit and be actively engaged in decision making around nbs that's uh, uh, you know uh, nature based solutions so this is uh this is where uh, i said that scientific communities are actually now trying to uh, now coming to this conclusion or understanding that actually nature is there are also you know researches emerging across the world how 
the very concept of pristine forest are actually not very true in many places like in the us and all where colonization happened of several indigenous communities forest and then uh, narratives were built that actually these were pristine forests but then actually many of the so called uh, many of the great forests in the world uh, you know are actually great because the the indigenous communities have nurtured them over uh, a period of time so uh, so that's that's a different debate so it is also important to highlight here that the scientists are of the opinion that nature based solutions cannot be regarded as an alternative to or a reason to delay deep cuts in greenhouse gas emissions so this is another aspect of the same issue and many of many of the uh, that's an important observation in my view uh, uh, you know as most of the highest you know biggest green, greenhouse gas emitting nations are trying to finding an excuse uh, to offset their emissions by supporting uh, you know nature based solution in other parts of the world like you must have heard about the plantation programs you know just destroy forest somewhere else uh, emit as much as greenhouse gas you want do as much as you know uh, grey infrastructure projects you want but then buy some uh, you know provide some support in a different part of the world and say that we are actually supporting plantation so we are offsetting our own emissions so kind of uh, so this this is very important coming from ipcc the largest body of science, scientists and and the most you know credible source so now let us come to another you know debate uh, that basically emanates you know from this and that that is a part of uh, uh, you know the scheme of my uh, my presentation that this debate around plantations versus versus natural forest so we we all have been like that's that's exactly where uh, i started and i said trees are you know, uh, you know uh, all you know trees are not necessarily forest everywhere so so forest provide us with one of the best defenses against climate change i think the ipcc report has agreed Uh, you know year after year report after re report so increasingly however a perception is building at least among part of the policy makers across the world that forests are just a combination of trees that are useful only to bring, bring down the carbon emissions so i think i think uh, that's a perception and uh, we also do a lot of local engagement with youths and other uh, and we interact with uh, the, you know young generation folks we have got this realization that you know uh, plantation of plantation of planting uh, you know trees saplings which is a form of environmental fashion now uh, now is considered as the most favored of uh, you know uh, environmental activism you know uh, you know among the youths so we see everywhere everybody says uh, if even if you are running a quiz uh, running a uh, you know some kind of a competition what are the ideas you have Uh, to combat climate change or environmental degradation everybody says plantation so i think and and everybody uh, you know is very happy uh, I, i don't say that's bad that's very good but then uh, in uh, when you go deeper into it all 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 plantations are uh, not not forests and they 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 are not uh, the kind of uh, uh, resources uh, you know uh, ecosystems we actually need and many places uh, uh you know uh, it's very difficult to actually of course tell people ab about these things are the, the way things are happening and of course there are other studies that have also now you know confirmed that uh, many of the forests in fact wood forests are also being going to be victim of climate change of heat of uh, forest fires and all so uh, at this juncture where it is very important to conserve natural forest and 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 the sapling plantation might not be Uh, an effective uh, way to actually combat but definitely we have no other ways we have to also uh, plant but i'm i'm not trying to say that uh, at that bad that's bad but i'm trying to uh, put it in a perspective uh, in in an economic perspective in, sorry in an ecosystem perspective uh, so it's it's any ways more difficult more difficult to conserve a forest than planting trees so it's very easy so people always go for the easy things and uh, society itself is degenerating in a way uh, and and many of the urban societies would not have the time they, they have left the responsibility of conservation basically to uh, the rural folks the indigenous folks uh, and and they they are they are happy planting trees so i think we all are happy planting trees so that's very uh, that's something that is emerging so enthused by several studies 
governments and many other organizations including ngos have been promoting planting trees as a form of environmentalism more rigorous, rigorously than ever before in order to meet their climate goals so that's also a part of our climate goals uh, i think some of some of you might have uh, read about this uh, report published in science uh, you know just couple of years back and that made uh, that made a you know big that made big headlines uh, and it claimed that there is scope for planting you know like 500 billion trees over an area of 1.7 billion hectares of land that's almost the size of the us this the study claims would suck up more than two thirds of all carbon emissions released by humans you know since the industrial revolution governments private associations and companies have so far placed to grow a 210 million hectares of trees so this is part of their climate actions and much touted uh, climate action so while trees are important as i said to enrich all forms of ecosystems there have been criticisms from various sections of society and experts to the obsession with planting trees and i am one of them let me tell you and scientists and experts have raised serious concerns you know regarding the effectiveness of such drives they have said that the science behind it could be dangerously misleading uh, in in the name of plantation and climate action often monoculture is promoted uh, i know our own experience has also found, found out i have i have made some studies on monoculture uh, you know as part of climate financing and and how they have actually been more dangerous uh, for the local ecosystems and the communities than actually being able to uh, support them so in many places lands such as you know grasslands like savannas pampas and similar vegetation uh, don't ask me about uh, you know these uh, details of this kind of so i'm i'm a sociologist i told you i just have some general knowledge on this uh, savannas and pampas and all so and similar vegetation including shrubs surrounding natural forest uh, you know are just as west westland and fast growing tree species are planted to replace them in order to meet plantation targets so many of the uh, places which actually are important ecosystems like many of the pasture lands the grasslands they they are actually very important ecosystems for their own regions but then they are termed as wastelands to plant trees even there are there have been uh, issues conflicts around how uh, you know forced plantations have been made of alien species inside forest areas like like uh, we we have seen that and many communities have resisted that in many parts of india so in india such efforts by forest departments have also as i said led to conflicts with the local and indigenous communities who protect forests for generations and emphasize more on the restoration of degraded forest with native biodiversity enriching species that to them are much more useful than alien species which are good only for timber value or carbon sink so i think that is where the perception battle is on and uh, the local communities who benefit out of many species and 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 they have they actually derive a lot of benefits from the forest and that's why they protect and and in return uh, they also receive these benefits and they understand the natural resources uh, you know forest much more than uh, the just uh, the carbon uh, you know sinking theory and uh, and i think uh, that's why uh it becomes very important to understand their perspective as well so we have been in fact interacting with several local and indigenous communities in odisha jharkhand chhattisgarh and elsewhere who have been protecting local natural forest for decades in some cases actually century more than a century and we have tried to collect their a uh, wild view on forest so i will uh, get to some of uh, that that at the end of my presentation i am not going into uh, case studies at the moment uh, depending on the time so the indigenous communities who make up only 6% of global population protect and manage almost one third of the pristine forest uh, cover of the world so that's a huge number and for them forestry as i said is much broader a concept than mere tree planting while for most of us sitting in urban areas far away from natural forest trees are carbon sinks and forests are picnic spots for these dwellers and protectors of the resources it, it is their source of food livelihood culture and water and much more uh, it's a heritage they feel they have inherited from their forefathers and needs to be protected not only for humans 
but but for other species as well so before dealing more with the indigenous peoples version of forest let me talk about the ipcc reports views on forest and plantations so i i talked about you know what we have observed from different uh, you know our own work and studies but then now the ipcc the largest scientific uh, you know body uh, uh, the most credible source on this what it what it says on forest uh, keeping existing natural forest standing and sustainably managing semi natural forest is a highly effective nbs that's na a nature based solution the report says with high confidence then protecting natural forest currently contributes between 5 to 7 billion tons of co2 per year uh, you know that's gigaton co2 per year to climate mitigation efforts uh, it estimates the assessment states with high confidence that restoration can be uh, one of the most practical and cost effective ways of sequestering and storing carbon while also protecting and helping biodiversity recover particularly if carried out with climate resilient native or geographically near species it can also help improve water supply and quality in ecosystem and reduce uh, the risk of floods and soil erosion so clearly uh, you know it says that plant is uh, you know uh, you know what's more beneficial uh, a forest or a plantation so what uh, you know mon monoculture basically so wildfires droughts and pest outbreaks count as severe disturbances that can cause tree mortality pushing stored forest carbon back into the atmosphere the report notes this you know disturbances are on the rise because of climate change prompting a need to adapt ecological restoration with diverse species rather than monoculture plantations can help reduce these risks so this is all the ipcc you know saying the report notes with very high confidence that monoculture plantations that fail to plan for their host landscapes do not meaningfully engage with indigenous and local communities or seek their free prior and informed consent can present risks to biodiversity rights livelihoods and well-being as well as being less climate resilient than natural forests so this is where the ipcc the largest scientific body clearly you know uh, recognizes that the right of the local uh, local indigenous communities uh, over their natural forest that they have been protecting as i said as their parents as their uh, grandparents as their family members so that is very important if we want to actually uh, combat climate change through a forestry so in addition the report warns with very high confidence that afforesting afforesting savannas natural peatlands and other areas that do not naturally house forest damages biodiversity and increases vulnerability to climate change so so is not a nature based solution and can exacerbate uh, you know exacerbate greenhouse gas emissions so you know uh, that's another challenge that we face many a places i said there are there are there are places where you don't need, don't need to, you don't need to plant actually but plantations are happening there are many natural spaces uh, you know in india and elsewhere you don't have to uh, actually plant any saplings you just have to uh, guard them you just have to conserve them for uh, for a period of time and then they grow naturally so i think we uh, what we need to do is we don't need to we don't have to destroy them we have to stop destroying them so remote sensing studies can often overestimate this is what the ipcc is saying as i said from the very beginning uh, what kind of you know uh, plantation goals are being set so many a times and and all these high talks of goals billions millions of trees sometimes can actually deviate you from the real climate challenge and give you a sense of security uh, that you know uh, that okay something great is being done we don't have to actually worry about the greenhouse gas emissions we are emitting or the climate destructive practices we are actually following so what ipcc says on this is uh, remote sensing studies can often overestimate land availability uh, land available for tree planting potential as they can fail to distinguish between degraded forest and naturally open areas all that i said about uh, you, know, you know how many of the areas are being actually termed as degraded areas uh, they are they are natural spaces for you know other, with other ecosystem benefits 
they are very important habitats for some birds maybe or they are very you know important habitats for uh, you know protector of some water reserves maybe so there might th this might be some very good uh, you know sacred groves for indigenous communities with ecological values so but then you know remote sensing uh, applications can just uh, you know go by the tree canopy cover like what the controversy around our own uh, forest report national forest report uh, is how it's like uh, designating many of the areas as forest even uh, tea tea gardens you know and and kind of uh, uh, same can happen the other way around you know some of the areas that are actually important ecosystems could be designated as wastelands where plantation can happen so uh, so that is uh, that is what is another issue so then there are pitlands then uh, then uh, the report also talks about agroecology and agroforestry so these are also uh, you know going going beyond uh, natural forest areas the ecological practices many of the indigenous communities are actually uh, practicing agroecology so as i said again i am not romanticizing there are issues there are challenges and uh, you know they, they, by uh, we, with the new generations of the indigenous communities themselves also uh not adhering to some of uh, some of the practices their elder generations had actually started but then overall as i said throughout the globe many of the indigenous communities are still practicing some of the very uh, you know uh, fantastic local natural uh, uh, you know ecosystem uh, based approaches uh, local ecosystem based approaches which are in fact the medicine to many of the uh, ills that climate change uh, throws at uh, uh, throws at us at the moment so while uh, uh, my argument on this again is while i am not against plantations provide uh, provided they are done in the scientific manner and as, and respecting local species diversity geography etc i suggest that we give strong emphasis on restoring remaining natural forest and related ecosystems and in this i would strongly recommend and support the efforts of the indigenous communities there are two facts uh we should recognize in our fight against climate change you know, one is we actually cannot reach climate goals without protecting the sus uh, and sustainably managing the carbon absorbing forest that cover a third of our land surface and the second we cannot protect forest without indigenous peoples uh we know that the forests do better with indigenous and land rights are where where indigenous lands land rights are respected there are studies around it and with lower deforestation rates and carbon emissions currently uh, there are studies indigenous peoples and local communities manage at least 24% of the total above ground carbon stored in the world's tropical forest without them it cannot win the race to save the planet but the good news is uh, there has been actually a lot of changes in the views towards recognition of the role the indigenous peoples actually uh, Uh, play uh, for a healthier planet and achievement of even many sdgs including the goal 13 climate action and goal 15 life uh, life on land and the deeply intervened and rapidly worsening climate and biodiversity crisis have started to convince major philanthropists also of the need to take action and put indigenous people and local communities in the driving seat i am not uh, actually going to uh, 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 a value or sort of judge which philanthropist is good or bad at the moment but going by some of the reports that i studied and i have been observing i have been following this issue uh, you know last september uh, nine grant makers from the uh, uh, you know uh, foundations uh, like uh, uh, the the amazon founder jeff bezos and all they placed uh, 5 billion us dollar for conservation efforts that address threats to biodiversity and help curb climate change and they committed to taking a new approach working with indigenous and lo local communities so there that is there is one example then there there have been positive moves by the governments to recognize and uh, the central role of indigenous peoples for climate mitigation and nature conservation you know world heritage listed uh, listed uh, uh dentry tropical rainforest in north australia uh, uh was officially Uh, we will be officially returned uh, to its traditional owners it, it was declared last year who will who will uh, you know manage 
the area in partnership with regional governments so uh, some, many of these programs could actually they need further scrutiny but they need the intent of it uh, the 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 message that it throws is very important so canada has placed uh, 3 340 million uh, canadian dollar over the next 5 years to support indigenous led stewardship as part of its commitment to covering 30% of the country's lands and waters by 2030 2030 uh, so in many in the us also they are returning uh, uh, a lot of uh, you know native american tribes uh, are being returned uh, a lot of la- their la- you know traditional land for to manage and for conservation so the uk government also uh, has uh, taken some initiatives uh, and at the same time indigenous peoples have increasingly received you know international recognition and been present at the table for major global events 2021 saw the launch of the first major report by the un agency i said the ipcc first report so among uh, this is the second report i was talking uh, in in my the earlier part of my presentation the first report also uh, you know am, among its other findings the fact it says that the fact that due to reduced deforest, deforestation rates territories owned collectively by indigenous peoples have avoided up to 59.7 uh, 7 million metric tons of carbon dioxide and the report says emission each year across bolivia brazil and colombia the equivalent of take, you know taking off 12.6 million vehicles out of circulation for one year so this is a, this is a great recognition just for indigenous communities uh, protection efforts in three countries so Uh, it, uh, and that's coming from the uh, scientific body so there was at this international union for conservation of nature's iucn world conservation congress in september 2021 an umbrella group that representing more than 2 million indigenous peoples across nine south american nation succeeded in having a resolution passed to pro- to protect 80% of the amazon by 2025 finally the un backed science panel for the amazon comprising 200 experts and researchers from the region has highlighted indigenous rights as central for protection of the amazon but uh, a lot of work is yet to be done and uh, you know uh, there are several uh, indigenous groups who are still struggling for recognition within our own country also the forest right act which is uh, supposed to do a justice to a, a historical injustice done to local natural local uh, indigenous communities and other communities forest uh, communities so uh, that is also that needs to be strengthened further so we need to uh, actually strengthen the role of indigenous and tribal peoples uh, they play in forest governance and bolster communal ter- uh, territorial rights we need to compensate indigenous and tribal communities for the environmental service services they provide and we also need to facilitate community forest management only then we will unlock the true potential of indigenous peoples to gli- guide the planet you know towards uh, uh, you know a, tri- a, a climate uh, resilient uh, way so i think uh, that's all at a global perspective or a national perspective i would just then like to take you uh, if i have still time uh, just uh, a few examples of, from our own field uh, uh, you know testimonies that we have collected i'll say uh, for example uh, a 70 year old sasi pradhan uh, who leads forest protection initiative in a village called dengajori uh, under ranpur block in nayagar district of odisha uh, she is one of the leaders in protecting 700 hectares of forest in that area for for her forest is like my parents house whenever we feel stressed we go inside our forest and feel like getting embraced we return refreshed with our with all our requirements from food to fuel and much more this is a testimony uh, from one one person then forest secure uh, you know our food that is what people say and they list out Uh, a lot of uh, thing and during the covid also we did some studies and how uh, many of these forest protecting uh, communities while everybody was actually uh, facing food scarcity they were getting a lot of food uh, from the forest themselves like they were definitely vulnerable because uh, because of you know other issues but then uh, like like for example uh, uh, 
during covid one one of the villagers uh, called jamuna pradhan a 35 year uh, year member of one forest protection committee uh, said that you know that time uh, potato price was like uh, more than uh, more than 45 rupees per kg and but then it that, that, but then it had no impact on her uh, because you know uh, during the time when the supply from west bengal got restricted and the price of potato soared it had no impact on us uh, that's the testimony i am reading uh, we consume even more delicious roots locally called pichuli tunga and kodoba uh, she said so you know she named more than 20 varieties of greens that they get from their forest so uh, some of the names are odongos or odongo sago uh, bhadali bhadalia sago sunsunia sago and kind of uh, also counted 15 varieties of fruits including chironji kendu dates mangoes jamun that the forest provide them with so there are dif- different other you know benefits so uh, so this this variety some varieties of fruits are very local to them so they can name you hundreds of uh, such food and and then the uh, some of them said that forest is the best technology for water conservation water for 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 example malati naik of one village called uh, kapti padar village in korapur district in odisha you know water is better absorbed in the soil thanks to the trees and forest which improve ground water recharge and feed springs rivers that's what she says this is this is a science he knows uh, from protecting forest and and interacting with it living with it for uh, for you know for 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 for, for our whole whole life time she narrated how decades ago our forest you know fell prey to rampant timber smuggling and all our streams dried up i started uniting women to protect forest by keeping the mafia at bay gradually our forest revived and so also our all our springs so that is what forest brings water to them then forest provide jobs they meet they meet many needs so these are all then forest are also rich source of local medicines so this is uh, you know and it is also nurturer of wildlife and livestock i have just uh, finished some of the studies where uh, actually uh, local communities they uh, they do some water conservation if efforts inside the forest just to uh, provide water to the wildlife so many of these uh, you know uh, I, i go back to my wild, wildlife uh, conservationist friend who says that you know uh, uh, communities li- living inside forest are a danger to forest and wildlife but then i have seen many communities who are actually a friend to wildlife they 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 live with, with them of course there are challenges conflicts and they are also agitated sometimes but in uh, in most of the cases you know they are uh they are they love that they actually can nurture the forest and wildlife and they live together so there are many contrary argument running all around uh, about uh, uh, you know the local communities and and the forest themselves so uh, as the debate continues uh, over what's a better solution you know between plantations of new trees and restoration of naturally grown forest in many places with support of local communities to restoration of forest in order to meet our climate goals these indigenous women and their community members certainly vote for the second choice i have uh, we we actually uh, have been studying and uh, talking to them and they definitely always feel that uh, uh, you know forests are actually the natural forest are the solutions to many of our uh, problem uh, you know one thing is you know is established that growing trees is essential but then the uh you know we lose size of a soccer field uh, uh you know every second every 6 seconds uh, tropical uh, loss of mature tropi- tropical forest has been uh, we lose them so much and that's a big concern so uh, uh no matter how scientifically they are done the plantations with whatsoever socio cultural and ecological factors have been taken into consideration plantations cannot replace the mature forest there are studies as i said you uh, you know forests are also being the, uh, you know uh, are being impacted by climate change now and and um, more new plantations means the more vulnerability they are to the increasing heat and and uh, 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 you know wildfires and other things so it's always better that you have matured uh, forests uh, as much as possible keep them intact 
and their their biodiversity their ecosystems intact otherwise i think uh, we will have a lot of problems then uh, as as the, as the women we talk to uh, they they told us you know a, a healthy forest actually can retain water to prevent droughts provide food for local animals and people and keep plant warming carbon dioxide from being released into the atmosphere forest account for 75% of fresh water resources worldwide so water is better absorbed into soil thanks to trees and forest which improve ground water recharge and feed springs and rivers so kind of uh, this is how uh, i would say that you know we need uh, we need a lot of natural forest to to be standing on uh, on earth we just cannot uh, you know see uh, we cannot just vote for plantations always and destroy the na- living natural forest and at the same time we should not you know displace uh, many of this uh, indigenous communities from their forest instead try to improve their living conditions and other uh, giving them economic opportunities at their own places because they have been the custodians of almost like uh, you know 3/4th of the forest uh, uh, you know throughout the world and they have been one of the cl- the best climate champions i would say so i would uh, you know put my talk to an end here and uh, would welcome any any questions or feedback thank you so much Thank you so much, sir. We are now open for questions, so please, if you have any, type them down in the chat box or raise your hand so that we can unmute you so that you can ask your questions. Uh, hello, um, uh, I'm Dr. Shashi Rekha. I just uh, uh, I, it was a very interesting uh, information that you have uh, shared with us about the Adivasis and uh, the indigenous communities and the forests, which is very very important for us to understand. Now, uh, during your experience, uh, was there any such uh, kind of interactions which you can uh, tell us about? Because generally, uh, people living in city. uh if they go into the forest and com- encounter these uh, uh, tribal people uh, it it's almost like a kind of a very uh, they kind of a interaction like they they are scared to talk to us and such kind of a uh, experience can you share it with us people are not very ready huh? hello you are muted sir you are muted Yeah, I think your voice is. Uh, I'm hearing you so low. Uh, can you please? Would you mind repeating? Uh, uh, yeah, yeah. I, I. Sorry. I. I can sorry. you hear me now? Yeah, yeah. yeah I just wanted to uh, understand if you have any such experience where you would have uh, uh, where you which you can share with us. Like generally, when uh, city dwellers go into forested uh, areas and interact with the tribal people. the tribal people are more uh, scared or withdrawn they don't easily uh, come out with their information or such uh, thing so to gain their confidence they, it takes a very long time so did you face any such kind of uh, experience during your uh, uh, report making or whatever yeah 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 thank you so much i think that's a very important question and uh, uh, i don't i don't think that there is one kind of a tribal population so there are different kinds of uh, population so we have also been to areas impacted by the naxalite movements we have also been uh, traveling to areas where uh, the mining and other uh, companies are uh, trying to encroach upon so there are also areas where tribals are more sort of uh, sanskritized and they are very nearer to the uh, urban areas and uh, uh, their language skills and others are uh, very you know very good so there are different kind of uh, uh, you know experiences we have so many places where people are apprehensive of uh, you know some new development is coming or some mining is coming or something is coming to encroach they normally don't open up yeah. but then uh, for us uh, for us actually 
being being a social anthropologist has helped because uh, i have personally been interacting with many tribal communities for the last 30 years and we have visited many areas uh, uh, what you have to do is you should have proper you know communication with them you should have reporters and you should have uh, you should have established uh, you know some contacts many of us visit uh, just to do picnicking and uh, many of people they just go to overnight get an experience of what tribes yeah. have what kind of knowledge they have so it's not so easy uh, in in all all the places right. and 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 uh, uh, the first thing you should go my my personal request is the first uh, thing that you should do before visiting a tribal area is to just set your all education that you have got because mm. it's a completely different world view in many places uh, right. and uh, it's and it's it's a it's a hugely beneficial learning uh, you know uh, uh, to our always uh, visiting these people because because the kind of knowledge they have uh, yes, and and in fact my climate change uh, my interaction with uh, the climate change advocacy started with uh, with my interaction with communities so right. in indigenous communities so they only uh, you know sort of in a way we will teach you uh, many thing that because they have lived with the nature of over centuries and uh, we we as urban citizens have not been uh, we don't we don't see nature in that perspective in any way right. so i think i don't have a right uh, uh, you know black and white answer to that but then i would request that always go with a learning uh, yeah uh, learning attitude and uh, definitely will start learning many yeah. many a times i question these people who go and teach ca- tribal people on uh, you know how to live a greener life to combat <laughs> climate change that's very laughable and yeah. uh, in fact they are they are the future in my opinion they are the future uh, and again i say i'm not romanticizing i'm not, not trying to say that everything is same everywhere but then there are a lot of examples which are uh, which have the key to our uh, you know our the climate challenges that we are facing now yeah Thank very you. true there are so so many examples i don't remember all the names i have been seeing these documentaries of one uh, tribal person showing so many different varieties of uh, the greens vegetables and which can be uh, used and all which obviously the city dwellers are not knowing so much of it except for certain yeah. uh, uh, non conventional foods and and so on so this kind yeah. of awareness has to be more uh, learned by us uh, stay yeah. here uh, yeah. so that we can it, so that we can communicate to the tribals in their uh, language or their uh, kind of a uh, same tone i should say <laughs> uh, it will be helpful to understand restoration of forest in that manner instead of just exactly. going and planting exactly. yeah, yeah. Yeah. Thank you so much. It's very, very interesting. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir, for sharing your thoughts and giving us key insights on Adivasis and trees. On behalf of everyone, I would like to thank you for your patience and time. We look forward to collaborating with you in the near future to help our future batchmates learn from you. Have a good day ahead. Thanks so much for inviting. It was great talking to you. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you so much, Kiran. And uh, we will all now disperse for a short lunch break. After which, we will meet back here using the same link. The remainder of the session will be hosted by Mr. Shubham Patkar, the Vice President of XAB. Thank you, and have a pleasant lunch. And we'll see you again at one thirty p.m. You can either leave the uh, leave the meeting and join back, or you all are most welcome to stay on. We will be stopping the recording for now. and see you again at 1:30 pm good afternoon everyone and welcome back from the lunch break i hope you had a wonderful meal and are now ready for the second half of today's seminar the first session is by shri shrinivasan kasi nathan and for the introduction of whom i'd like to call upon aditi agarwal from fibsc over to you aditi he actively participated in national service scheme in the international seminar on biochromatography and nanotechnology at the vellore institute of technology we welcome you sir the online dais is yours now so um, i'll be sharing my screen uh, please let me know um,
can you see my uh, screen yes sir it is visible okay is it in uh, presentation mode right yes yes sir it is in presentation mode yeah so um, so today i'll be mostly talking about on uh, tropical uh, rainforest um, um so uh, so i'll be um, talking um, the restoration which we are carrying out in the um, some of this uh, tea dominated landscape in anamalai hills and uh, before that uh, uh, i also want to um, say what is anamalai mean so it's a literally anai anai is a elephant in uh, tamil they will call anai is a ele uh, elephant and malai is a peak so that's how this uh, word comes from because uh, this hill is a uh, uh, filled with of lots of uh, elephants so with that uh, i'll be um, uh, begin my um, uh, our work so before i Uh, get into my work i also want to give a brief about on tropical uh, rainforest why it's important how uh, the recent pressures on this forest um, um uh, across this tropics so um we know um tropical rainforest or uh, uh, if you look at this map for example um the tropical uh, forest is More, all uh, all the way it starts from central america to uh, southeast asia so it it uh, it lies in between the tropic of cancer and tropic of capricorn and uh, the rainforest why it says rainforest because uh, if you look at their uh, the, the forest it gets high uh, uh, rainfall uh, uh, for a uh, in uh, in a year also it has a high diversity uh, diverse terrestrial ecosystem and also at, uh, also it consists of uh, uh, at least some 40000 to 53000 uh, tree species but um, now the tropical rainforest or uh, um, suffering from substantial loss of uh, forest and it's also converting um, uh, becoming a fragmentation and convert uh, and uh, various con uh, because of various other conversation uh, for the land uses um, there have been studies have shown that uh, nearly um, 2.3 million square kilometer of uh, forest we have lost in 2000 between 2000 to 2012 this is major driven by uh, by logging agriculture mining and, and other various infrastructure um this is uh, for major to major uh, reason to concern to protect the tropical forest one is a loss of uh, biological diversity diversity and carbon emission and loss of carbon storage uh, the deforestation is often linked uh, within the uh, with the carbon emission and there have been studies have shown nearly 250 gigatons of uh, of carbon or store in the tropical uh, rainforest or vegetation um, which which strongly influences the global uh, carbon cycle and plays a crucial role in the regulating the concentration of uh, greenhouse uh, um, gases in the atmosphere um there are two uh, significant effect of the uh, uh, forest fragmentation uh, in their changes one is the forest structure the other one is the community uh structure uh when you look at the forest structure uh, uh when when the uh, forest uh, has been become a, uh, the large patch of continu continuous fo forest uh, by various degradation it become a small uh, small uh, forest patches like a island uh that uh, affects the larger it, it decrease the larger trees and also uh decrease in the regeneration that leads to uh, uh um, decrease in the uh, biodiversity um also i was uh, mentioned there's a changes in the co uh, community structure like um when you uh, when there's a degradation happen you see uh, 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 more um pinus species and invasive species like lantana uh, chromelina and uh, mycenia so various other invasive uh, species take over in this degraded uh, patch 
also there will be a very less um, uh, old growth forest species or uh, regeneration or native species that leads to the loss of uh, carbon uh, storage so coming to uh, uh, um, um, the restoration uh, ecological uh, what is a eco ecological restoration when you look at this uh, uh, diagram uh, picture so when the forest over the period uh due to um um um, um decrease in the fo forest cover such a changes uh in the biodiversity here the question can ask the ecological uh, restoration can help to recover their uh, um the forest covers so according to the ser uh, it's called uh, society for ecological restoration in 2004 they defined the uh, uh, the process of assisting uh, recovery of an ecosystem that has been degraded damaged or destroyed but uh, here i want to mention uh, um, you we have heard about uh, there are lots of uh, uh, talk um, on planting there are lots of program on tree planting um, uh, across the global or across the country but uh, planting a few species or uh, a single species uh, it's not doesn't make a uh, a complete forest ecosystem so um, that's where uh, um, we coming to my study area so you know um, we know very few rainforest patches are found in india so um, like western ghats um, northern uh, part of uh, northeast uh, part of the uh, india and as well as in the andaman uh, nicobar island um but our work is mostly focus on uh, um focus focus on the western ghats particularly anamalai tiger reserve which is in the southern part of the um, uh, western uh, western ghats so you see uh, there's a palaghat gap below that there's a uh, you can see this arrow where our uh, most of our uh, work uh, take um, take uh, take place so coming to the uh, anamalai hills uh, if you look at the um, anamalai um, hill range when you include the hill range it is nearly 5000 square kilometer which includes tamil nadu as well as the um, uh, kerala uh, forest uh, boundaries but when you come looking at the only anamalai tiger reserve it is comes around uh, 1000 square kilometer within um, anamalai tiger reserve you see this light green which is called uh, what we call is valpara plateau which is mostly a uh, 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 plantation and uh, the area of this uh, plateau is 220 square kilometer which is highly fragmented by historically the forest are converted for the uh, uh, for the uh, commercial purpose the plateau is also mostly dominated by tea coffee and uh, cardamom plantation so you see this dark um, uh, green color uh, what we call is a uh, rainforest fragments which is completely disconnected from the larger uh, patch of forest and most all this uh, rainforest fragments are floating in be between the uh tea plantation um um we have identified nearly 40 plus uh, uh such a rainforest uh, fragmented of uh, rainforest fragment distribute across this valpara plateau the most of this uh, um uh, rainforest fragments are uh, belongs to uh, different uh, uh, private uh, companies there are uh, four major um uh, corporate companies own this uh, uh, tea plantation here one is uh, tata coffee um pari agro uh, bombay burma tea corp uh, tea corporation and the other uh, one is a um, um uh, woodbrier so these are the four major group that uh, um owns this um, um properties um so this is how the landscape looks like uh, on the um uh, topmost picture you see on the right side it's a fragment one of the uh, restoration fragment and you see in between there's a t 
and uh, on the left side you see the contiguous forest patches which is on the uh, anomalic tiger reserve where relatively undisturbed so when you look at this uh, other uh, uh, fragment you can see the um, forest fragments uh, around surrounded by uh, a plantation called tea or uh, uh, eucalyptus so you can see some of this uh, some of the eucalyptus patches here and this corner so this is of the landscape uh, uh, um, uh, orient uh, looks like in uh, valpare so coming to the um, the type of forest in the uh, anamala hill so when you uh, from the bottom of the hill uh, it has a different uh, type of vegetation it starts from uh, dry deciduous moist deciduous and rainforest uh, then uh, higher will be a shola grasslands so most of our uh, uh, work and research are uh, focused on mid elevation of the rainforest which is like uh, around um, 700 to 1000 uh, uh, 400 uh, meter uh, above sea level uh, as i said um, uh, anamalai tiger reserve is a big reservoir of uh, um, uh, for many um, endemic and endangered species like um, Uh, large mammal to smaller mammals like uh, elephant um, uh, leopard tiger gaur um, wild boars uh, and endem uh, endemic species like um, nilgiri tar um, uh, endangered species like lion tail macaque cloth bear sambar porcupine and other some of the endangered species like um, hornbills and um, malabar grey hornbills so and 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 also some of the amphibians and reptiles um coming to why we need to restore so um to restore these patches for mainly to hold the biodiversity and also to improve the uh, improve the condition of the forest and uh, connect this forest patches uh, where um, within the uh, landscape and conserve the outside a uh, protected area that's our main uh, goal so how to start the restoration um, in this such as such a landscape uh, so what we have do before we start any um, uh, restoration activity we before we start uh, planting uh, in a degraded uh, site we do a assessment uh, we uh, scientifically we go we put a plot and uh, we measure uh, uh, tree density uh, uh, and the species com- uh, species community and the open um, canopy open and the uh, and invasive species so we have a, a, a list of assessment to before we plant the any uh, ca- carry out any planting uh, in the site then once we decide where we want to plant then we will choose the Uh, but uh, tree species for particular site again uh, this uh, plateau is also as a even though within the plant uh, within the plateau it has a uh, um, um, various uh, um, uh, gradient like uh, as i said it uh, starts from 700 to 1400 so within this uh, elevation also we, there are species composition differ so we have to be very carefully choose Uh, where which elevation we are planting, and some of the uh, species they have very diverse uh, uh, elevation uh, distribution. Um, yeah, so once we decide where uh, what kind of species uh, uh, we need to plant, then we start preparing the plot. Uh, where uh, the plot preparation basically we ta- remove the uh, invasive species very carefully because um, some of these sites also has some uh, natural regeneration. and uh, we uh, don't want to disturb those uh, regeneration because uh, there are 100% survival um, uh, better survival than what we plant there so when we are doing our uh, um, plot preparation uh, during weeding and all this uh, activity we are very careful uh, maintaining the regeneration also while we are involving uh, during the, our prop, plot preparation uh, we always involve the uh, local community uh, 
who knows uh, who are very knowledgeable on the plants and they uh, very carefully uh, remove this uh, uh, remove the, all this um, weeds um also always it's uh, good to have some um, um, kind of uh, sustainable supply of planting material um, and it's uh, crucial for any planting based uh, ecological restoration project locally sourced uh, seeds are ecologically and uh, genetically appropriate for the planting sites so we have our own uh, nursery and where we raised our own sa saplings for the restoration so it is a uh, year round uh, activity where uh, we start collecting the seeds from the across the forest patches more on uh, road sides and trails forest trails so uh, our as i said our collection will stick around our uh, roads and trails and the uh, forest edges we don't disturb or we don't collect any seeds from inside the forest because uh, the naturally whatever it's coming uh, uh, we don't want to disturb so whatever the seeds which have fallen on the roadside and the trails they are uh, very likely to be germinate and more damage on for the on the uh, vehicle passing all this uh, kind of things so we carefully collect the seeds and uh, we bring it to our nursery as i said in our nursery we have uh, very knowledgeable uh, indigenous people they will ca carry out uh, uh, the seed processing and here we don't use any chemical treatment or uh, to stimulate the uh, seed Uh, germination we want to uh, see the our uh, uh, germination process uh, uh, how the naturally it's happening in the forest conditions so once it comes to the uh, to the nursery we process it like cleaning up uh, um, uh, the pulp and removing the aril all those uh, uh, things so once we are done uh, cleaning up and then we sow in the bags the the soil here what we use from local soil and uh, again we don't use any uh, um, uh, uh, chemical to to mix with the soil we use biocompost uh, and we buy from the agriculture department and also we have a small compost uh, area that we collect uh, uh, from our nursery and put it there and over the period we'll do composting so and uh, also we use some uh, coir pit to uh, make it soil loosen because the, the rainforest species are they 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 the way they uh, root uh, it is very deeper and also widespread so it needs some kind of like a loosened soil uh, to uh, easily penetrate and uh, after we so we also uh, do watering during uh, summer peak summer it will be uh, as i said as i said earlier it, it, it uh, throughout the year we uh, uh, monitor and uh, um, continuously using this uh, activity and uh, so once we uh, so there are different stages in the nursery like it starts from uh, seed collection area sowing and the uh, various stages and as they grow um, larger it move keep moving to each section and uh, once it comes to certain age um, then we keep it aside for ready to plant and here we nearly we have some uh, under to 120 uh, native species and uh, we have around something like 20000 saplings ready to uh, plant for every year um yeah so this is a uh, one of our uh, first uh, restoration sites in 2002 so this was given by a, a company called earlier hindustan union unilever but right now the company has changed and uh, it, uh, owned by other company called woodbrier so we got a one small uh, uh piece of land for restoration this was the 2002 and we planted there and uh, after some year 
the whatever we planted they all come up so as i said earlier you see this uh, uh, some of this large uh, white uh, leaf it's called clerodendron uh, which is a pioneer species uh, also it's a secondary for a secondary forest species where you when you disturb this species particular this species come up uh, very uh, fast it is called pioneer species and uh, it also help us to uh, give us some kind of a shade because rainforest species um, lots of species uh, need a shade so what we do is in a in a open conditions we always uh, plant uh, uh, some of the tree which withstand the uh, sunlight more sunlight like a loraceae family like acnodaphne um, uh, lithia those kind of species and trichelia those kind of uh, species we plant so once uh, it, the the first layer of the forest forms like a, a good shade then we put uh, uh, the mature forestry which is more uh, um, shade tolerant species so after few years you see this the same patch how it uh, come up currently uh, the forest Uh, present condition looks like this and this is other site called injipara so sorry this is a uh, site called uh, mada junction uh, this is other site called injipara which is um, again behind this uh, earlier forest patch it can uh, con- uh, uh, connect so in 2002 again uh, it was like this and uh, after some time uh, like this currently it Uh, looks uh, like this so there is another patch in another uh, um, uh, company which is called airpadi top um, when they given this particular uh, um, patch it was completely uh, invaded by the lantana so we carefully we removed the uh, um, lantana by uh, not damaging as i said earlier not damaging the Uh, naturally regeneration um, uh, uh, saplings or seedlings so in 2005 we got this uh, site uh, after some time after some year it was looked like this and presently it was looking like this um yeah so i say after um, um so what we did we went back to into this restoration site to look uh, as this restoration helped to recover uh, some of this uh, site so what we did we compared uh, restored and unrestored site so you see um, this is a restoration site um, adjacent to that there is a unrestored site so in restored site it's uh, actively we uh, planted like removing weeds and uh, planting um, uh, native trees um, but in the unrestored site where we um, uh, it's, it's a passive restoration where we don't do any uh, intervention um so um where um, so and also we compared with the uh, benchmark where the reference site so uh, we went to this uh, all these sites and we assessed so what we have done here is uh, we did a plot uh, with uh, uh, measuring height of the tree girth of the tree and uh, girth which is above 3 cm dbh and we also identify the um, uh, tree species so uh, the result was uh, if you look at the first to um, uh, figure the tree density and the species uh, richness um, in the restoration the light green is a restoration site um, in the restoration sites it uh, both tree density and the species richness is recovered in the recovered uh, uh, in higher uh, recovered in higher uh, uh, in the restoration site then in the uh unrestored unrestored site but it's not up to the uh, uh the uh, benchmark but we are towards the uh, to the reference uh, um, site 
but uh, when you come to the carbon storage it appears to show a higher uh, uh, carbon in restored uh, site than compared to the unrestored site but due to the lots of uh, variability among these sites the, the the difference are not uh, very uh, significant so though we are uh, restoring so we have been working in this landscape and restoring many uh, sites uh, last uh, more than 20 uh, more than two decades uh, we have been restored some we could manage to restore only 100 hectare but we have uh, identified nearly 1000 hectares um uh, planting more than 1 lakh uh, saplings but um still very few uh, compound component only we could restore because uh, if you look at the uh, the, the complete uh, ecosystem of the forest um it takes really really long time uh, so it's it's uh, better to uh, protect uh, existing ecosystem native existing ecosystem and uh, re- uh, during the restoration activity it's it's uh, recommend to plant highly uh, plant i diverse uh, native plant species in your uh, sites uh that will help you the um, um in in, in uh, reverse the habitat loss uh so uh, these are the uh, what i was talking earlier it's all our uh, larger restoration program but uh, apart from the restoration uh, uh, program we also uh, do lots of uh, long term research uh, activities like uh, tropical tree phenology uh and uh, forest dynamics so tropical tree phenology is nothing but to you you uh, studying uh, um life cycle of the uh, uh or reproductive uh, li- uh, cycle of the uh, uh, trees like uh, looking at the uh, uh, flowering and uh, fruiting so it's also uh, there are many researchers like climatologist are focusing on this particular uh, type of studies because it's it's Uh, directly uh, related to the climate change so this is a long term study it's also helpful to look at the um, various uh, um, uh, things on uh, how the climate uh, change uh, impact on the on this uh, uh, changes in the reproductive uh, um, uh, cycle in the trees also it also directly or indirectly helpful as to know what are the fruits are fruiting or flowering what are the trees are fruiting or flowering uh, and particular that season it will help us to to collect our seeds for our uh, nursery and also we uh, generally we also know what are the uh, uh, species uh, will attract the birds and other wildlife also we uh, study on forest dynamics again forest dynamics also uh nothing but we looking at the how the forest changes uh over the period uh in the regarding to the climate change um so uh, also i recommend uh, if somebody is interested on in our work uh, please uh, go and uh, look at the uh, uh, there's a documentary called a dream of trees it's, it's uh, freely available in the uh, youtube uh, it uh, about our uh, restoration work in anamali hills also there is we also run this uh, program called season watch it's a in india wide uh, citizen science program on uh, uh, tree watching uh, again i said like a phenology uh, it will also helpful uh, for the uh, people to know the common species uh, their uh, life cycle so it's a open uh, source data you can go on to this website and people can contribute so people uh, students or anyone can participate in this uh, activity and uh, also we have a, a nature information center anomaly nature information center it's also uh, free to everyone tourist or uh, anyone but here uh, mostly students the local students college students school t- students visit here 
we have a nature club and they come and participate uh, um, go around this uh, information center and uh, supporting and uh, funding agencies and thanks to my um, our team and the uh, field staff yeah i ready to take some questions uh, thank you sir thank you so much sir for the wonderful session we got to know about the annamalai hills its biodiversity and the restoration uh, process and i am sure there may be many students who might be planning to work in restoration projects in future so the session is open for any questions if you have any questions uh, you can type in the chat box or raise your hand um, <clears throat> hello yeah um, you said you are working with the uh, tea plantations in the uh, forested uh, area the the ones which are yes. fragmented because of tea plantations but yeah. was the soil examination done there to, uh, to see what could be the changes that have come due to the tea, tea plantations before yes. uh, doing the restoration uh, going ahead with the restoration so we have done some of the soil uh, analysis but uh, we haven't put it uh, um, because it's a large Uh, yeah, yeah. of things we have done yeah. uh, various uh, um, for the various purpose but it's all uh, uh, you know it's yeah, a large can... data and we could we are uh, finding uh, some expert to because we don't have any expert on the soil um, yeah i can understand because yeah. that is part of the uh, uh, growth of the tree na so uh, yes, yes. and as it is there has been a lot of uh, uh, degradation or maybe deficiency of nutrients because some nutrients must have been uh, removed yeah, because absolutely. of the tea plantation but yeah. uh, vegetational cover i saw in your images there were only the trees standing like you yes. know uh, undergrowth uh, plantation is also important Yes. So wh what about uh, that? See, uh, that's what uh, it's. It's very difficult to grow some of these rainforest shrubs. Uh huh. So, uh, but we also assume that once this forest come up, that climate creates right. Once that uh, proper climate creates, hmm. um, the the other uh, plants shrubs, will come up. Yeah. Um, uh, climbers or. it will take over in the over the period but we want to create the first the condition the the condition of the forest because it mostly open all year at least now you see some kind of layers we have created i okay. think over the period it will all uh, come back but it takes really long time but yeah, it will, it will. Uh, the sites we have seen uh, earlier we couldn't see uh, any of the birds or any wildlife at least we have seen right now some of the grey hornbills have started visiting some of the nilgiri langurs have started visiting oh. so it's, it's a really um, uh, uh, good to see that yeah. they are coming back but other things it will take some other uh, some yeah. more years because to create this layer only we took 20 years oh my god yeah uh, but still we have a lots of pressure on this particularly on this patches like a uh, are uh, removing yeah. people comes and cut the pole uh, trees whatever we planted and uh, they will collect uh, firewood and while they collecting firewood they also trample lots of uh, seedlings Seed saplings <clears throat> and uh, various issues but to reduce that pressure because it's it's not easy to come be, bring it zero right uh, at least i we can minimize the pressure by engaging with the local communities uh, in the yeah. local community in the sense i'm saying um, the tree workers the, they are also one of their stakeholders um, by because they are very marginal people through the tea uh, they earn per per day it's a way, per day wages is very less so by if you look at their price of lpg gas and other uh, things it's very high they cannot afford uh, all this thing so we are trying yeah, to that is so i think i think you are coming the canopy way 
you are creating a canopy and then uh, expecting the other layers of vegetation to come up don't come you on. think it will be easy when you started bottom wise first cover the ground and then uh, so some of the species to germinate yeah, yeah, yeah some species some of this uh, shrubs we are uh, not able to grow it in the uh, nursery uh, no, some grass like... species will be there which will on its own grow now you can just so cover the uh, uh, ground cover the ground uh, uh, so that the water retention soil gets improved yeah, yeah so grasses again we are not very expert in the grass but we also did a grassland restoration again uh-huh. i was telling we have a grass shola grasslands uh-huh. but there also we couldn't do any planting thing there we did a uh, just removal of wattle There's a oh. invasive of wattle, uh-huh. acacia, uh, melon, something. I forget the name. Melon or xylem? Ah, uh, no, not melon or xylem. It's the other one. So that species from Nilgiris to here, it is completely invaded. Mm-hmm. There we didn't do any planting. There we just okay. remove the wattle. So okay. some places, uh, see, we are not very expert in growing grass or uh, uh, shrubs because we we managed. to grow the rainforest trees mm-hmm. largely but very uh, limited uh, uh, of shrubs yeah but uh, we think that it will over the period it will come up by yeah. its own but and related growth study for the trees must be being done na no? yeah we are done that uh, survival rate and all uh, yeah. we uh, have some 60 to 70 percentage of survival very good very good yeah. yeah there are papers i can share those uh, papers yeah, yeah sure sure yeah yeah Uh, if there are any other questions, uh, it's open for the other people. Uh, yes, ma'am. They yeah. have texted me directly. Uh, Ramesh Singh is asking, sir, what is the website name? Of uh... Uh, Ramesh, uh, would you elaborate more? Which website are you asking? Citizens that uh, he's asking. Oh, Season that. Watch. It just ah. uh, Season Watch India. You can put. Mm-hmm. So it will appear in the Google Citizen yes, Science Program. Sir uh, Rashida Atta is asking. Could you please elaborate on the carbon capture calculation? Is there a formula to you? A formula you used for that? So I uh, it's a <laughs> big formula. <laughs> I don't know whether you can understand. <laughs> but i know i i'll tell how to because it's also differ for each and every species of the species density so it calculate on the uh, density of the uh, any particular species so basically what uh, require is the basic requirement for the carbon estimation a carbon storage uh, height of the tree and the girth of the tree okay these are the two main Uh, uh component that you put it in the formula and also the species what kind of so there is a global standardized so each and every species hold some kind of uh, it's a density uh, tree density what you call is a tree density so that also you will use in this formula so it But is I the can, first uh, it is the first of all forest density calculation yeah. then species density calculations then the leaf size measurements and then the canopy and then calculating surface area and then the rest of the cal- there are various formulas okay yeah, but this are, is fundamental yeah. yes so these are the fundamental uh, thing you need to collect uh, from the field to estimate the carbon storage so also rashid is asking also if you could inform on the major two to three keystone uh, keystone species of undisturbed annamalai forest uh two three keystone so oh, i good question uh, good question <laughs> yeah so the keystone species are uh, here for represented for the rainforest which is mesoferia uh typical rainforest species mesoferia palacom elliptikum and uh, um there's one more species called uh, um, palacom elliptikum I, I forget. These are the two major species uh, uh, represented the um, rainforest, and there are many. But uh, this, uh, the, um, like for example, uh, um, um, there are uh, species which grows in the very open area, like uh, Laurasia. I was mentioned, like Acnodaphne. Uh, there are uh, um, 
trichelia uh, lithia so these are the open species where you find in the uh, very larger uh, distribution scale and there's another species uh, so uh, also i forget to mention we also does a survey on um, uh, uh, endanger and critically endanger species survey there's one particular species globally there's only one location globally only only location by iucn as listed from anomaly which is called philanthes anomalyano which is a endemic and endangered species critically why endangered is it because of exploitation or it is a climate change so no uh, propagation happening why endangered uh, reasons so reasons uh, uh, it's it's very difficult to say that's why the iucn has listed as a critically endangered and they have not given um, maybe it could be a, a i don't think so it's exploited because uh, um, or it could be a regeneration there will be a less regeneration uh, issue but uh, in so IUCN, that is a that is a climate impact then yeah so species uh, come under extinction because hello? of climatic factors climate changes hello sir sorry yeah so this is yagnet so my question is can you elaborate more on the uh, thing that you are selling the uh, starting uh, from iisc bangalore the s the students conference that is there and how do we make become a part of it uh so it's uh, you can't be a, become a member for that uh, thing but it's a co- conference but uh, then if you are in the social media like uh, instagram facebook all this thing it always we keep posting the conference update so one okay and how do i become a part of the student co- group like something like that mm, this so there's, there's no group for particularly in this so you can follow the uh, conference update like mm. a workshop so there are multiple workshop happens in this during this conference so it's all we will post in the website or in the in the uh, instagram or facebook so you can follow that so you can't be a member of that but you can follow all this uh, um, post so then you can apply for the uh, uh, workshop or uh, any talk you want to uh, attend or if you want to present your work also you have to send a abstract and there's a various uh, you know uh, procedure to finalize your uh, abstract there are committees uh, all those things are there okay so what is that name s yes c c yes i can put it in the chat box uh, okay sir many people are asking how to pronounce is just yeah. and sir also my question is uh, how do you what are the special challenges that anamalai hills are facing nowadays as compared to rest of the entire indian subcontinent region with respect to uh, over exploitation of tree species um see anamalai has been uh, in anamalai hill uh, within the anamalai hill this walpara plateau comes which is the 220 square kilometer and uh, it's it's exp- uh, it's it's been um, um, completely um removed the forest pa- uh, uh, the continuous forest patches and they have converted into a plantation during the colonial period so and as i mentioned that um, all these fragments are belongs to different private companies right now they are uh, not uh, encroaching any existing forest patches they are all because uh, each and every company also go for this multiple audit so one of this audit call rainforest alliance so like uh, you need to keep certain conservation uh, biodiversity um, uh, conservation area within their property because it also adds their uh, um, like a, it's like a star giving a star rating for their product so most of the companies are they try to protect their uh, land uh because they are also um, um the department is also very strict in on that and uh, whatever the cultivation area they keep shifting their cultivation that's not a problem in the larger context uh, 
um, we don't have that kind of uh, problem encroaching into the whatever the existing uh, forest patches. So we were trying to uh, convince even even some of these coffee estates in the uh, in the uh, for example Tata as a holds the largest uh, coffee plantation in Anamalai, Valpare. Uh, so they brought um, so coffee need a shade, hundred percent shade for the because it's a berry, it's a fruit crop, and it need a more uh, shade. So they brought earlier uh, fast growing trees. For the non-native fast grow fast growing tree, now it's a big uh, sure. uh, problematic in the landscape because it spreads everywhere and suppress the native trees, native seedlings or saplings. So what we are uh, trying to convince the people, uh, uh, company to go for a native shade rather than the non-native shade for their coffee uh, share, uh, coffee plantation. Uh, for even for the tea, we are recommending them. Am I answered for the question? And see, in addition to that, now it is not free for all. There are various now very strict regulations of the Indian Forest Department, State Forest Department, Section 35, under which you even cannot do developments of our own land around the forest. You can't do expansions and orchards and the tree coffee plantations unless there is a certain kind of regulations are met with. So it's not like earlier, decades before, a few decades, a free for plantation in your own land. You know? There are a lot of regulations have come. You, know? you can't build a house in your own land now if it is adjoining the forest. So the regulations are controlling all that. One question was that, that uh, coffee plantation, normally you have only silver oak type of trees there, you know, inside the plantation. So there you are thinking of bringing the native trees for the eco restoration. I think that's a good suggestion. Yeah, so the silver oak is mostly on the tea, sir, mostly. But yeah. coffee as it is... Uh, so it is in between, the, in between plantation. Yeah, yeah. So tea as a... You large see those, you know, at every 1,000 uh, meters, yes. there is a silver oak. So those in the silver oak in the tea plantation. Yes, coffee but that is a part of the eco-restoration. So there's no yeah. landslides like, you know. Yeah, but in the coffee, if you see instant... They hold, a, they hold the soil. Soil doesn't wash away. So these saplings do, don't wash away, they don't fall, so they grow. So it's, it's a part of eco-restoration, restoration of soil. So, but coffee has mostly misopsis zemini, which is from Africa. And it's so... I know that is a different issue. I am saying the plant ecology, the girl asked that uh, in a coffee plantation, planting of the trees is better to get a native species, like you also said. And this is brought from Africa. So why not our trees... I would ask you, a uh, Tectona grandis has been well studied and the South India, it is growing very well. Today's presentation, I didn't find anywhere any mention of a Tectona grandis. It is a heat-loving, moisture-loving plant. And so that is a very good for eco-restoration as well as it is a good uh, 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 furniture wood under regulation. So if silver oak can be replaced by the Tectona grandis, they also grow very tall. Has but anybody the, tried like this? People the, like uh, conservation activists should try this. And that's a native plant. But the problem is, again, technical grandis is, comes under the economic uh, thing. So that's you know, I, was, I was just going to say that. So what? But don't cut it. Don't, don't cut it. You can plant it somewhere else. But here, to hold the soil and ecology and maintain that purpose, you grow the native tree. Yeah. So that's why we... So, Tectona grandis won't come uh, here. It's completely cultivated uh, um, variety come become. Uh, but yeah. Anamalai has a mostly various uh, diverse plants. So native plants. So that's why we re and also it's, it's also good for the soil as well as the wildlife. That's it. Yeah. But there's no wildlife in your plantations, you know. So there is. No, so, yeah, but the that's what I said. Even though it's a Valpare plateau is highly degraded, you see all sort of uh, wildlife from elephant to tiger, leopard, everything. But this fragments are the home for this uh, arboreal wildlife. species. Yeah, when they are moving from one fragment to other fragment, yeah, they need a 
proper uh, corridor 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 so i hope there are no other questions so you can yeah. see with them you can go for the next Yes, thank, you. No thank, thank you. Yeah. 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 Thank, thank you, you, sir. Thank you, sir, for enlightening us with your insightful talk. Uh, we appreciate having this topic: uh, ecological restorations of uh, degraded uh, reforestation clarified. Thank you, sir. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Aditi. Our next session is by. Professor Dr. A. D. Savant on the topic trees as phytoremediators in ecosystem restoration. To introduce him, I would no, like no, to no, no, no. I have been already introduced to the audience, and you can read my name when I there is a first slide. So if you are only left out, so let's save that time, you know. So straight away go to the. Uh, can you share my slides uh, before I just start talking about? So at least a a picture is in front of you, so that by the time I speak, you can. observe what i am going to speak uh, well uh, this is a different type of lecture our theme is uh, tree eco restoration and we had wonderful lecture lectures uh, how the natural and man made uh, forestation of uh, forestations and protection of the natural ecology and restoration and the role of trees uh, wherein you could see the water bodies rejuvenation takes place then uh, uh, as the uh, eco restoration that is the symbiotic way of life that animal birds and uh, insects and all uh, wildlife has to be there including the role of people's involvement like say, adivasis to the farm laborers and workers because we are also part of the ecology and trees are very important for us ecologically as the speaker mentioned that uh, they give the livelihood to many of the adivasi and every day they is a question of uh, harvesting uh, the wild produce and marketing it you know so the poor people farm laborers or adivasi or tribal people they are also dependent on forest so they are also part of ecology so the trees have a great role in uh, restoration or in, in ecology the problem is that we are talking today restoration of ecology uh, and the role of tree so i shall be strictly speaking some technical aspects of the trees which normally we don't talk in a general sense but it is a kind of science and engineering chemistry biotechnology biochemistry and uh, we have talked since the morning what has caused the distortion of ecology so we are talking of restoration so i would say the main factors that uh, population explosions and uh, then coming into development economic stakes uh, then going to for industrialization and that is uh, many industries like uh, chemical industries mainly i am a chemist so i know what dangers the chemist uh, chemistry can do to the environment you all been experiencing uh, cement industries for there plenty of fertilizers you can say refineries mining and nuclear industries you know in fact this uh, phytoremediation technology merge emerged more after world war 2 and then lot of productions of the nuclear missiles weapons and then uh, mining of uranium and all nuclear things so for energy and including the disastrous bomb making like you know so there is a problem of dumping nuclear waste and they were looking for undeveloped countries where they dumping when they became alert they also stop and so nobody can dump the nuclear waste anywhere chemical waste anywhere fertilizer waste anywhere so there are regulations now but then what to do with already lot of heaps of this waste have been dumped you know so the issue emerged that how they can be restored because mechanically doing that would cost large lot of amount so natural process of restorations and then scientists came forward that yes plants that we have been talking today they are the best one for eco restorations and when plant survives uh, while surviving it can not only cleanse the soils and atmosphere but it can also uh, make survive other small plants and small trees and shrubberies and itself and so the insects and birds and other things can come into and then that is how actually the role of trees in a 
eco restorations and this is uh, in this presentation we will not see any animals or a lot of greeneries and rivers and all those but after talking fundamental aspects of role of trees in eco restoration of their own survival and survival of the rest cleansing of the lands and atmosphere is a part of ecology and then we will see that what mechanism occurs so all of us have been normally looking at the trees as an aesthetic sense in environment sense as a greenery beautification gardens and all those things and uh, the commercial aspects and plantations you know but what is happening below the soil just sashirakha doctor was talking about is also the part of ecology so a common man normally will not think of what is the factory and the, what is happening below the ground so we are going to we are going to have a look at that aspects of it so all the students are botany and the botanists would look into that in aspects because chemistry is everywhere engineering is everywhere so this aspect of that uh, eco restoration through plant i will be taking you across that and this is not theoretically actually is an experimental i can cite so many examples and the work done there are few slides i have deleted most of those work presented here and there but uh, as a representative that which of the lands in the world wide have been cleaned with the uh, plantations and the kind of plants kind of trees these are a very specific like a particular or specific birds or insects or animal they would like anyone we for a choice of our purpose select the tree environment the trees similarly here also that the particular trees does a particular job and this uh, selectivity of uh, remediations or selectivity of eco restoration is a new facet that the scientists have revealed and that is why it brought it to the application so next other two slides also now here let me tell you see the tree here is taking uptake you can see below the ground uptake of what the minerals and nutrients including toxic metals which have been there in the soils and the dumps this does biodegradations you can see that below again contaminants also it takes care of and further in the biomass we'll say accumulations and in accumulation they would also the physical chemical process will be doing degradations also volatilizations most of the organics get volatilized and even some secretions of the plants on the surface of the leaves they have a capacity of degradations or disintegrations of the chemical pollutants this is the facet of the trees so this part of the ecology restoration of trees is very very important very vital the next two slides also will be talking because these are the picked up from the light or google but they are of the falling under substance and the theme of the phytoremediation go to the next one here we can see a lot of issues that uh, we know the photosynthesis giving us either carbon dioxide or oxygen you know but then you can see in the detail this will take about if you look at the underground co2 h2 equation is valid inside the ground because that chemical process just like in a vessel it's an earth vessel you know it's happening up you know so the respiration of the roots also very important so that phenomenon goes on you know and then once that happens organic chemicals also they can go up and the metabolic activities and mineralization also can happen releasing all these elements inside so basically hydrogen carbon dioxide in the organics they will work on and bring the process of mineralization with the secretions of the root enzymes from the roots of the plant and you know from plant to plant the different enzymes and therefore from plant to plant different type elements get mineralized and they are uptaken you know it's not a universal like you know so when this process of mineralization happens underground on the top you can see the reactions going on from through xylems and phloem the conduction bands and all those transpiration takes place emission i mean you, uh, release of carbon dioxide or oxygen takes place and phytochemical reactions happen including the photosynthesis so that you all know very well because 
to study in the earlier standards what the photosynthesis is. Now the next slide will talk about transition mechanism in plants. Next slide you can go. A transition mechanism in plants for metal accumulations. Can you go for next slide? That will indicate you. Next slide, please. Hello. No, one more. One go one back. One one slide behind. Yes, yes, yes. Now here you can see on the top. Let's start from the top. Phytoholidization. Why phyto? It is plant related. That removes all toxic elements from the leaf surfaces once it has traveled through the plant body. Now, if somebody asks you, why do you do tree plantation? Everybody does tree plantation. Any celebrations, tree plantation. Then, what environment day observation? The easiest is tree plantation. Under CSR activities, any activities, tree plantation. We also do tree plantation. Then we say the beautifications. It's a very commercial important. It can give you fruits and all that. But that is not the way. When you somebody asks you why do you tree plantation or environment day, so we say that they environmentally they are important. Not only creating a shade and greenery and uh, cooling the climate, you know, but it has a chemical role also that they do decompose the chemicals. So they will do phytodegradation. You can see on the stem, it is written phytodegradations and the plants, they bind contaminant soil, which results into the immobilization of the toxic contaminant. Say a chromium-6 or chromium-3 or a nickel, whatever toxic element is there, is taken, it will hold it. It will not allow to go into the fruits. It will not allow to go into the environment by volatilization. It will just hold it on, and is just part that becomes a part of the biomass of the plant. And the toxic element is stored into the plant. Now, if you see beneath the ground, the plants have natural substance in their roots. I was talking about the enzymes, leaves, and stem that can help them to break down as a toxic contaminant. So this rhizodegradation, we can call it. Who does it? Not by heating, not boiling, not nitric acid, not hydrochloric acid, not aquaregia. But this natural system, rhizo, can do that. In fact, nowadays we have been using some kind of the culture, even to mineralize the minerals, you know, I mean, dissolve them so that you less acid. You know, there is different aspect of them. So all these uptake takes by the plant. And if you look into the Next slide, please. Composition of a soil, you can see the minerals, we talk about it. You can see the threshold concentration of pollutants in soil. You can see molybdenum, nickel, copper, zinc, manganese in the first column, but most of them are toxic, um, uh, essential element, and some of them are toxic. This one slide is a symbolic, giving you what is the micromole concentration per gram on dry weight of the soil and magnesium, sorry, milligram concentration, PPM terms in the soil. If you take a soil sample, the PPM concentration, we're just talking about this mineral concentrations and you can see how the ratio relative number of the atoms. So this is how the earth's composition is there. So this is very important. And this, when these elements are inside, the mineralization process happens. Now we we'll take you to some kind of chemistry. Just next slide. Not a lot of, not not many much chemistry, but a very simple chemistry. I have not gone into very complicated aspects of this. I just want to say that when you water, it gets moisture. Water also that provides the, the medium for mineralizations, the chemical reactions, enzymes are there. So when you put a fertilizer, then mainly for essential elements are C carbon, hydrogen, sorry, this uh, uh, NPK, nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium, very essential for a plant growth, fruiting, and flowering. But in addition to that, these minerals also are there in the soil, and they could be uh, naturally, but we are not going to shift on this focus on the dumping when it happens, industrial pollutions or deposits or dumping inside the soil. And thousands of hectares of the land is either reclaimed, I mean, used for dumping or for dumping of the chemical waste. So this process happens inside the ground, and we can see you don't have to go into the all and potentials and all those. What are you requiring? Study in chemistry. 
laser redox potential operating inside the ground also. And you'll find that the, the, these are happening and this mineralization process will see that the metal has come to ionic state. And unless it's the ionic state, let it be toxins or essential element, it shall not be uptaken, you know. No sodium, potassium, phosphorus can be taken up by the plant directly unless they are mineralized, meaning unless they are in ionic form. If you say toxic mercury, if you eat, nothing will happen to you. Till mercury converts into ethyl, methyl or ionic mercury. Same is true with any element, chemical element. In inert or ground state, it will not have activity or reactivity. And so that this mineralization process, uh, the soil is making in a conducive soil for that environment. If it is there, this mineralization of toxins inside the ground and say that ground, we are talking about say this dump site, cement waste, fertilizer waste or chemical waste or nuclear waste. Can we afford to have calcium 45 isotope in your water, leachate, soil or a plant? No. Can you potassium, sodium, all the radioisotopes, if they are in dumps and their calcium is often, is one of the fusion fragments. So any, in for that sake, radioactive or non-radioactive, the toxic element, if they spread into the ground, water and the crop, in a food chain, the recycle, you know that very well. So by accumulations, and then you shall be eating the toxic element through the food chain. But now these mechanisms, you know, now the next slide will tell you formation of a dense root mat inside the soil. Can you go to the next slide? Which will tell you in a diagrammic fashion that inorganic heavy metals, if you look at the bottom, and organics of various uh, chloro and all those phenols, then metal organics, they can be broken, rhizophos mechanism, mercury, selenium, or toxic metalloids also, they can be mineralized. So this is just a representative uh, uh, slide, which tells you the fertilization process also can transfer this into the atmosphere because, you know, selenium, tellurium, uh, they're highly volatile elements. Organics are volatile. So, even those one, mercury is also holotile, osmium is holotile. So many of these metals and metalloids, they are normally holotile. If you just look into that without heating, they can go into the atmosphere. So plant can do the uptake from there and they can go to the different parts. They can hold on or they can decompose them or they will not be allowed to go into the water bodies or they will not be allowed to be the part of minerals so that your Edible crops they get into and it goes to doesn't go to aquatic environment, no bioaccumulation, aquatic animals or even a fish like Minamata Mercury disease, you know that. So this is how uh, binding them, holding them, uptaking them is a cleansing of the land that leaves the soil a uh, fit enough for a soil ecology. The life of the various creatures, insects and the grass and some small seedling germinations and the grass, anything that ecology have been talking about. And that is why the factors determining selectivity of the plants, this is important. Now we are shifting to the technical aspect of this lecture. So next slide, please. That uh, climate conditions of the area is important. So we'll see that how we have done the experiments, you know, certain plants were talked about good phytoremediator. With great difficulty, we could get them from Himalaya range or uh, northeast side. But then I said, why not try our plants? Because nobody has worked, nobody has studied on that. So I'll tell you, uh, very uh, interestingly, you'll be surprised to look that kind of plant also is a very good fight as a phytoremediator. So climatic condition necessary, but we tried and dared to being a populace here in Thane. And we could show it successfully, and I can show you that. Otherwise, nobody was talking about the populace being trans uh, planting here in uh, this part of the country. It has to have high rate of evapotranspirations, you know. It must take a lot of water, thirsty. And then more the water it takes, more transpiration takes place. So more mineral, I mean, more of the uptake of the elements will take. Then type and extent of contaminations that is uh, there in the soil. If I have the lead mines, if you have manganese mines, nickel mines or chromium mines, 
or nuclear waste. So I know what are the elements inside it there, what are contaminations are there, and there is a, then comes the plant selectivity. The root structure is also very important because the area, the quantity, how much it can take up, sensitivity of the plants toward the pollution. I will show you one that did not survive in that area. We show the one which is flourishing in that area. So this is how selectivity of the plant towards the pollution. Some plants well, are sensitive to particular kind of pollutant. They are antagonist to each other or there is uptake selective of that. I don't know, but the Institute of Science work done, Dr. Shinde Masbunoi, Prof. Chafekar and all, Dr. Latu, if he's there, this typha and then cypress plant, cypress will take selenium and cadmium. Selectively, mango is a vangifera indica, is a bioindicator for SO2 pollution. So this is selectivity. So once you know that, and if you know there is atmospheric pollution, what should be planted? If the ground pollution and what kind of pollution, which species should be planted? Then also important, they should be local and exotic species. It also should look good. And because you are talking of the ecology, trees in eco restoration. So the birds and animals and other things are also attracted, you know. And ease of availability, they should be available. Growth rate of biomass, it should be also quite large, not a very slow growing. Trees like a teak, which is very slow growing, but depends on the art of cultivations. If you have, uh, it is said it is a heat and moisture loving. If you can irrigate the teak, it will be something different for you. You irrigate the gardens, you irrigate the fruit trees and flowers and banana plantation, coffee plantation. But Somebody has written Encyclopedia of the Teak, I forgot the name. He has written that to Indian Teak, Teak is a moist, heat and moisture level. And we did the experiment, a plantation of Teak was done in a barren open land, coppiced or coppiced stumps of the Teak, one year, two year old, planted but irrigated by drip irrigation. And believe me, we could achieve the height of the pole of the tea, 10, 15, 18, 18 feet. And that kind of the pole getting without any branches on that, it is commercially very important. So that's not the issue. Therefore, these next slide, please. So soil conductivity is very important. Plant response is very important. This is all studied, like the Srivas was talking about. You study the conditions for which plant, what selectivity soil conditions require, minerals require, what location it comes from, and what is the response. And that is all studied. And then only you select that plant. Now you'll find next slide. Typical plant species, you know, phytodemitation. Now this is uh, information to, if you are not studied in a botany course, I do not know, but information to you. But for me, it is very difficult to know the plants. This is just the data collected. What we have done is, a, next slide we can see, next slide please. So these are typical plant species for their objective applications, phytro transformation. If you have a lot of volatile or organic chemicals, organic pollutants, you take the plants which is a phytro transformation, fast growing, in a soil, groundwater, landfill, leachate, land applications in the wastewater. Now here I come to, tree falling takes place in Mumbai because you know we don't bother about the ground ecology of the Mumbai city area. We have planted the trees, then you want to have drains, gutters, this and that, not what not to you know. So the first X falls on the big, big root system which is coming in the way or grown toward the roadside, you know. And what is the roadside we throw into all, not only pathogen, wastewater, your all house wash, all chemicals, phenyls and chlorine and what not. And their roots will try to move towards the, the hydrophytes, you know, they will try to move toward the gutter. And in return, what do they get? Not water, but toxins. 
and these toxins when start accumulating in the trees of the mumbai on the gutter side big trees with little or heavy rain or wind or kind of cyclonic monsoon you have you have seen hundreds of trees they fall this is the main reason because a lot of phyto accumulation with the phyto the threshold limit is crossed after threshold limit is crossed they start dying root system will die and when roots are dying support is gone the tree falls no matter what accidents it does so the contaminants like herbicides we use them aromatics the full of the house is full of aromatics chlorinated aliphatics we are using biphenyls we are using nutrients also coming from the detergents like uh, phosphorus and nitrogen and uh, this is ammunition waste this is a different story but i'm talking about the city kind of environment and so the typical plants here you can see the first in the list is the popular and worldwide in us and europe where where nuclear energy nuclear power is more there are more problems of managing nuclear waste they are given selective sites for dumping of nuclear waste now even that is also being banned they have to store into concentrated pre concentrated pre concentrated and put into canisters and bury them hundreds of meters down so even nuclear explosions cannot break those canisters and radioactive will not come out so the fir bhi you can see her poplar willow cottonwood aspens then grasses like rye bermuda sorghum legumes so till we had this regulation we were always advising to have the mustard and kind of plantation not plantation but the crops to be taken around not as a crop just so this mustard around a nuclear power plant so any fission emissions coming out any radio nucleates coming out including cesium 137 fusion products and radioactive carbon dioxide and carbon and hydrogen these these uh, mustard plant is a good accumulator for that and so that is good if you go for uh, you can go for a fast if you go for uh, rhizosphere that kind of uh, technology you want to use soil sediments land applications of wastewater so they can be used phyto rate technology we have been talking in a small sense and doing experiments everywhere like we did phyto remediation phyto rate plant in mumbai university take to give best treatment of waste water coming from the colony and then that uh, could work and we could get a clean water uh, inside the pond where you could must have seen the academicians in university campus uh even the duck and the fish and everything is surviving there so for a phenolic type i am uh, the mulberry is a good phyto remediator grasses with the fibrous root system they are like a rye and all that so they will and if you go to the next one quickly phyto stabilization they will stabilize the pollutants into the soil they will not be allowed to leach out they cannot go into water flow minerals or the crops and so soil sediments can be ameliorated you know uh, parameters like lead cadmium zinc arsenic copper chromium uh, so no that should not be something uh, uranium so uh, could be sulfur so these these elements can be well stabilized inside the ground by the plant it will take this poisons inside it but the tree will not die they are phyto remediators so they themselves will kill this take the poison but not get killed so hydrophobic organics polyhydrate hydrides and polyclorinated biphenyls and dioxins these are the highly highly carcinogenic compounds coming from chemical industries particularly petroleum refineries and organic industries and organic chemicals so they are the real culprits of environmental pollution that we are all talking about facing up about and they are the real enemies of our environment and they are carcinogenic and so root systems of hypoprite uh, uh, erodes and transpire large amount of the water uh, hydraulic control the grasses fiber so this is how the type of we go quickly to the next of hydro extraction extractive type of mechanism after mineralization they can be extracted and happening inside the soil in brown fields and sediments and metals you can see in the third column that they are metals like all those toxic elements i will not read them again uh, and uh, they, they are the part of holization like the selenium and all that 
See, sunflower is a phytoremediator. Indian mustard, repo seed, bear, uh, barley, uh, good year, serpentine plants and artists. So when you plant these trees, you find the wastewater coming into your garden or kitchen garden or around the house and giving you stinks. You can plant these trees for a phytoremediation. Rise of filtration, the groundwater, water, wastewater, metals, you can see again, almost same metals. So all aquatic plants you can see. So now if you see Thane Lake, they have been doing this experiment of phytoremediations on the raft they are fitting into the potted plants with this kind of aquatic plants and they can keep they keep, keep, move, they keep moving around uh, the lake body and they will do the absorption, absorption further. And phyto extraction you would say that. Now the next one is uh, some examples of metal hyper accumulation. So for a botanist, this is too important. And next slide will show you. And you can see the references there. You can share this presentation and you can get the references. The people have done work on this. Next slide, please. Next, next slide. We go to the color slide. Some examples of metal hyper accumulation. Next one. Oh, sorry, 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 sorry. So here, I think the color is changed from my this. <laughs> now here you can see, you can educate me better rather than because most of you are students are botany. This Talsby and uh, top one is uh, Cardaminopsis, uh, Hilary. Uh, then I even difficult for me to read these names. Minorita, Verna. So you can see, uh, just have a look at this. I will not move this slide quickly because most of us are botany learning and botany students here. And what is more important is that should metal concentration, can you believe microgram per gram? We can say almost in milligram, 13, 10, 12 milligram per gram. So that's 8, 9, 10 percent mass content, weight content of the wood of the plant. And so this is the work done. Look at the references. They are not very old one. Now, last few decades, this has accelerated this technology because they say cleansing land, uh, removing that soil is more costly and time consuming than uh, this natural remediation. So you see that most of our Delhi or here, many places, the Municipal solid waste dumps are put into, say, Gorai and all those places. And so there, the technology is that slowly, slowly they get compressed on the top of that. They do this kind of plantation so that the pollutants inside the dumps and the dumping grounds, they are also taken care of. And ultimately, we get almost a flat land and, or maybe small hillock like and full of vegetation growing on that. Uh, so you can see species, salix, populus has come again, brassica, cannabis, and hellenhuts, and typha, and brassica, juncia. Uh, all these, uh, even uh, glaceria uh, lutians, so these, these are the plants. And what the work they do? Heavy metal extractions, nickel, soil, somebody for some for radionuclides, heavy metal, I'm just reading the middle column. Uh, cadmium in the soil, lead and cadmium soil, manganese, copper, selenium in uh, or mine or, or I, I was to tell you the how mining has done a lot of damage to ecology. So mine trailing is a big issue of these toxic materials and metals. So heavy metals and heavy metals and mine trailing of wetlands and we have also worked on that uh, ready mines uh, mine trailing. We studied that and silicate formation. The paper received the national award. The different story, but. Uh, this mind telling is an issue. Now look at here technological advantage of various processes in a phytoremediation. See, we're all centering on plants, trees, trees in reforestation. Reforestation begins with the cleansing of the soils and atmosphere. So almost all factors here can be performed with minimal environmental disturbance. I'll not go to right, you can read the right hand column. Applicable to the broad range of contaminants, including many metals, heavy metals, possibly less secondary air, and they don't produce secondary pollutants. Organic pollutants may be degraded into just carbon dioxide and water. What is your, uh, what is this catalyst used in vehicles nowadays? 
so that you don't throw out the carbon dioxide it is broken down sorry you don't throw out the the hydrocarbons like you know uh, methanes and all those they are all broken down to carbon dioxide and water so from toxic to non toxic is also cost effective and you see these technologies like uh, all that i mentioned almost all places this technology is a positive so it also does at places migration control so phytostabilization so look at this transparency again that uh, these technologies are working for various aspects then next slide please when you do that the top soil is left in a usable condition you can go in for agriculture plantation fruit trees plantation orchards making and all that soil can be left in site uh, after contaminants are removed rather than having to be disposed or isolated just leave it there you know it is a cost effective for large areas having low to moderately contaminated surface soils reduces volume of contaminated uh, materials Uh, to be landfilled in uh, incinerated so no incineration no holotrizations and uh, can achieve remediation goals without using toxic chemicals if you want to remove some chemical you do something in industry we use scrubber so again we use material if you want to absorb the gases you have to have the lime tank full of those and pass the gases to that again the chemical then slurry is made the slurry is to be required to be dumped somewhere you know you you do the gases absorptions in the pollution control you know uh, fume absorption technologies you take into some media liquids so ultimately how we created the tank of this even the industrial pollution control there is a etp necessary for every industry effluent treatment plant then the common effluent treatment plant so this etp doesn't function properly nor industry want to make it function properly do it cost then it is allowed to be go into the common effluent treatment plant cetp that is also broken because of excessive waste because nobody is treating it primarily so all the acids and uh, materials toxic things and corrosive material that flows to the pipe and in a year or two or three the pipes leading to CTP common effluent treatment. They are all corroded and burst, and then that will flow into the farm yards or farm lands, agricultural lands around. The worst example you want to see: go to Tarapur MIDC and see what has happened to the Nawabpur Creek. Truckloads of fish were dying every day. Now they don't die because there is no fish left around there. So. now now they are happy they say as if the pollution have gone you know so at this what tarapur site or you were uh, patalganga or you were vashishti you were in lote prashram same story no ctp plant work friends 113 ctp plant in the state of maharashtra midc claims we found the assessment and we found the report what the report they will never tell out of 113 only Three are working. Hundred and ten CTP plants are burst, cracked, not functional. Anyway, that's a different subject. So we go to the status of hydrometeorological studies carried out in the world. I will not spend much time on this slide, but you can just see that. Payanonj, that is the name of the location project. on the first column you can see you can see even uh, blue stream landfills belsteel in the fourth column bopper's nobel british steel south uh, bunker hill these are the projects like we have project based on the uh, corporate sectors you know size of area 100 square feet 3 acres next 18 hectares Next is one thousand fifty acres. Primary contaminants: heavy metals, radioactive levels, leachate, pesticides, herbicide, coke oven effluents, heavy metals. Median properties: soil, substrate, all these effluents. Vegetative type used for phytoremediation: cleansing bag, Indian mustard. 
Pfizer is only for the company brand. Hybrid propeller, they did hybridization. Trees and wetland plant, soil based reed bed, mixed herbaceous species, and data plantation. And you can see this is not very old, but recent past. So these are under execution. Next slide also will tell you uh, our interest is to look at the trees in phytoremediation, native trees and shrubs, mixed grasses and legumes, hybrid poplars, parrot feather, I don't know what it is, turf grass. So these trees are herbs or grasses, they can do phytoremediation because once the remediation is done, soil is restored. And once soil is restored, it's free for every species to flourish or grow or do your plantation. The next one is also, I'm interested in the kind of the amount of land. You can see earlier side, which was uh, one, two, five, seven acres. Can we go to the now uh, next slide? Next slide, where 240 square miles. The next one, flash landfill. This was a big problem of flash. Now let me tell you, technocrat scientists and next generation citizens. Way back in early 80s, there was a big problem of IEA Vienna. They are concerned with the global environmental issues. The issue of the flash uh, management. So many coal-fired thermal power stations, they produce flash. West has gone uh, for energy by nuclear over 50, 60, 70%. We are depending on the coal-fired thermal power stations. We have cement plants also. What to do with the flash? Indian coals have 40% flash. And then we determine, when we analyze uh, thermal power station in Bombay, I will not name it. We did find radionuclide into the flash because that is all mineral remains and radionuclides are not devoid of to be in a deposits into the coal mines. So we did find holmium like uh, radioisotope, which is a carcinogenic. So we gave the report, Mr. Hazar gave the report that the flash cannot be used anywhere around the water bodies, bending, brick makings, because if you make a brick with the flash contained uh, in the wall, you are likely to have re radiation in the house all the time. If you use for agriculture bending, that can leach out into the agriculture soil and it can take the radioactive to your body. Now, to our shocking surprise, problems of dumping, you can't solve it. Now, there's a queue of the trucks for a flash. The plants who had a problem of dumping flash. Now, there's a queue of the trucks by entrepreneurs in brick making and everywhere, and even cement plants, government of India has allowed 40% flash to be added into the cement. Well, if somebody has a radiometer activity, radioactivity measurement, hope the houses are not sounding radioactivity into that. Anyway, that's different and very sensitive issue, but I don't know who, who made that decision, and now flash has come into Indian cement. Now look at the column, the last uh, is, uh, is uh, you can go to the next slide and you can see that uh, in the last column, the trees, hybrid poplar again. So everywhere we found poplar is very commonly used. I didn't bring those pictures to show you in US how huge is, is the poplar's plantation. And Kruger, in Europe, I could see that the Kruger plantation of the trees for paper making, the papers are not edible. They are on the phytoremediate lands and uh, hundreds and thousands of hectares of the land with the Kruger company plantation. I forgot the name of plant, but it's phytoremediator and it goes to paper mills. Look at the land areas, in acres and hectares they have been used for phytoremediations, you know. And if you see the last slide, uh, that is uh, East Lavendil in Yorkshire, UK. 
next slide yes uh, is that okay uh, no one before that yeah you can see uh, 17 uh, this is one uh, land field finland yeah where well, you can read it uh, the locations and uh, Amount of land, the earlier slide you could have seen 240 square miles. One slide before in a Yorkshire, UK, they have done phyto remediation. The plantation they have done there, you don't have to go back to the slide. Uh, that's a soil based, some kind of vegetation, including hybrid poplars. Uh, and this one, uh, Tunis, New Jersey, uh, two acres and 46 acres, two sites. Orotile petroleum, uh, groundwater contamination, they are immediate again with the poplar. So poplar is very common and it is, we call it mastic wood, you know, and it is a uh, northeast, a lot of growing all along the national highways, uh, GT roads, you can see a lot of poplar plantation, it grows on very well. So in short, uh, all these slides will tell you, I'm not going to more details of those. In some and substance, these trees uh, in this, there are plenty and this PPT you can take and find out. My point is that roll up trees in a phyto remediation to restore the soil. Soil means ecology. Ecology means all kind of the life surviving on that. And then restoration of the land and no land spoils, all that can be remediated. So this is a real role of trees, not machines and machineries and powers. For a phyto remediation, via that you restore the ecology. So once you improve the soil, the ecology gets restored. Otherwise, if they are not removed, they will flow into your environment outside. We not go into land, water, rivers, soil, agriculture orchid crops and rice and barley and all those. So after all this, we thought, why not we do in a project mode and experiment and find out whether our industrial pollutant land can be restored. So we selected the Bombili MIDC area uh, near Gharda chemicals. And we found, I don't have all slides of those to tell you how it was, but in some and substance, we selected the plot there, small area. You can see that it is marked 0.5 by 5 by the scale. And that is a plot we selected here for a phyto remediation technology. When we did the plantation, so I'll go uh, for the slides of the pictures first and we come back to the tabular uh, data. Go, go to soil elaboration is using phyto remediation. Just go jump, jump. Yes, yes. Now here you can see the industries. Don't really am I DC. You see, like in a NAC, NAC college accreditation, it is called amelioration technology. So you don't put on higher and fire and say that okay, you change slowly, do better, 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 better. Don't say you have done something very bad. So it is a amelioration approach of improvement academics in the institution. We always say NAC is an ameliorative principle, you know. No matter that some academic peers and experts, they go and fire and start shouting and ask principal, why this, why not that, and all that. That's not permitted. Anyway, so you can see that uh, lever, he's uh, uh, digging the land. Look at the type of the vegetation, they're almost not there. The grass is all, you can see, uh, scorching has taken place or deposits so our project fellow uh, we, we we procured these plants uh, popular from the northeast one fellow from tiny nursery man he obliged us uh, ordered them and brought them like he was used to get plants from Dehradun for his nursery uh, sale he, he obliged us and but I told him to prepare seedlings of the Ain, Terminalia Katapa, right? Ain. And I said, let us try this hardy plant also. So you can see the next slide, uh, the plants there. Next slide, please. You can see, yeah. Then pit making by the side of industry. And you can see the 
shape of the plot we had to do this fencing also and the, all the effluents flowing through by the sides and you can see on the right hand of the pole it was all sump of the waste water where we dumped the all the debris waste and industrial heaps around outside the factories we told them please we are providing the landfill site you can dump your waste there they are so happy and everybody brought their deposits uh, debris and uh, heap up the waste solid waste industrial waste and we got it filled we wanted to test really all kind of chemicals organics inorganics metals non metals and then we had to put uh, our board and you can see the growth of poplars you can see one tree the native there slowly started dying because we bought lot of the west into this peat but in our trees our saplings they did not die they started growing now see the same site here this uh, barrack type down two story building you can see the plants the greenery you could see after two years you can see this terminally are growing like this next one you can go on go on so this is what uh, the site we and this is what the plant they have been uh, uh, growing there and as we see uh, this all landfill the next slide we can go yeah you could see this terminalia catapa grown so well on the same industrial plot full of uh, debris put into chemical waste and the next slide will show you next next one also can show the yes this we can see how well they have been grown and you can see the crow also there indicating ecology is restored and uh, we are so happy to see that uh, we could restore the ecology of the industrial spoiled land uh, given amidst the industries not that industries are closed they are working but anybody can see the dombili mrdc site and find that now what the question was what does it do inside go back to the earlier slides where you can see the table concentration of various toxic metals in the roots of the plant species yes so in the leaves of poplar the column is there initial concentration of lead and the final from 0.6 into that when we planted and the growth we find after 3 years is a 5 in terminalia arjuna arjuna that this this also is a good phyto accumulator for the lead because from the literature survey we found poplar is a good accumulator for heavy metal we also tried our native tree and that is working for cadmium it is a good it was not there earlier but we could find nickel another toxic metal you are the students of science need not be told what are the toxic and heavy metals you no know, nickel so uh, the concentration of 10 mg 7 mg like you know and the chromium also the most toxic one even the smallest concentration of chromium we don't require in our body and when it goes to organic chromium chromium 6 ionic state then it is a definitely a carcinogen and we have so many industries which are making uh, chromium compounds chromates dichromate potassium chromate and all that so be careful when you handle in laboratory chromium salts you know they are they are quite carcinogenic nickel salts also quite carcinogenic you know then this is concentration next slide uh, roots here right yeah so in the in the stem lead concentration you can see it is just three years two year three year plan we did regular monitoring and now when they have grown the tree i am sure they are the storehouse of this toxic metals and nobody is going to eat fruit they are not fruit. trees which can be edible like no part of it like you know so you can see that cadmium nickel chromium they accumulate into the stem also earlier we have seen in the leaves also now next slide you can see a root also so look at the from root system to the stem to that of leaves we can account for how much of the heavy metals 
is accumulated by the plant and once this process is continuous as the canopy grows tree grows naturally the process of accumulation of the heavy metals is a continuous process and so at the end of years few years 10 years 20 years 30 years we are not harvesting anything what have they done they are decompose they are phytostabilized they are phytoholidolized they are holding it and uptaken so the rest of the land which is a part of your ecology other vegetations or resource materials right from atmosphere to the aquatic water ground water crop water irrigation water river water at least they are made free from this you know and we applied finally the test of this concentration verification let's not concern with this part but we wanted to know how our readings are the best so it's called tclp test it is called when you get the analysis of tclp done uh, uh, the last slide of the table you know always when you do the experiment you must confirm that your analysis results are standardized with the control or in this by environment called tclp test in some material will not go deep into that what the tclp test you make an extract uh, with this contamination stretching and then extract out and test it and find out what have been added uh, uh, triture is the same thing that you get and then from that you know your analysis they stand to the test and without that your data will not be accepted by any agency uh, or any control measures or even publication part of it for this kind of test leachate test of the dumping grounds that you all must be working on solid waste management will not be accepted unless you confirm your system is uh, standing to the standard of tclp test so this is what i was to tell you uh, i wanted to tell you that how plants are not for every one of us as they are the part of the beauty of this world so many uses ecology on the ground gardens crops vegetation what not you know and uh, they will be such a harmful now we go finally next what we have done if i said in the morning what causes ecological disturbances just go to the next slide next 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 yes i i just found this on the net so when we said the root system the trees role in restoration of ecology look how strongly it holds the soil so this root system is very very important and when you cut it say this is your gutter coming here road coming road widening goes up to here now how much that i show you and these roots will give them their secondary roots later on once you cut the gutter cut them and put the gutter so these secondary roots coming here they will be uptaking the toxins they will be uptaking the toxins and they naturally poisoning of the tree starts so this importance of tree root system even a bombay ecology is very important they hold water they will allow the movement of water molecules they will maintain the porosity once you have porosity not like a cement that the water will percolate down and once you remove that and put the cement even the porosity is lost you compact the ground porosity is lost if you keep the roots they will create the porosity and so the issue it results into falling of the tree and disturbing our ground water eco ground ecology of the city wherever you have done this plantation or cutting those and then the damage in urbanization next slide one next slide please ah uh, this is where this is opposite uh, shopping mall dadar near plaza urbanization leads to this tree was growing so well you have put the house or how this has grown on the house wall i don't know in the process of making house and all that now when next building comes this will be cut off this is a native tree you can see a similar picture the bus stops also now when you remove all that the ecological sanctity of the atmosphere above the ground for birds and insects and all those you know 
is gone. So urbanization leads to destruction of trees. No matter you put a condition, if you cut one tree in building making, you have to plant 10. And nobody does it. So this urbanization is issue of disturbing ecology. Just representative. Next one. This is the site I was talking in the morning. Now look at this. There are around 10 villages. They're all having agriculture here in this area. Recklessly, industry department, pollution government department, MPCD have given permission to run this factory here, this house from where I had taken this video <coughs> and photograph. Is a full of dust deposits of the ingot making aluminum, tin, and lead. And people around are breathing it. Complaints have now started. People have started showing the symptoms of the metal poisoning. They have spoiled agriculture in the area. So what happens to ecology? No bird will be going there. You know. No crows, no sparrows, nothing. Agriculture cannot be grown there. And like this, chemical industries, cement industries, power stations, they are spoiled our vegetation if you look beyond the city that we are living into. We had a big fight of a thermal power station I will not name. Now they have done such a good betterment after so many conditions. They have been growing very good vegetables, lush green gardens and flowering very close to Mumbai, we should visit. So industries does not mean pollution in the environment. There is a technology that one ppm of the pollutants come, can't come into the environment, but they don't want to do it. And so the people suffer the damage. Here is a live example, this photograph of 4th February. I have taken from industry making problem to about 10 villages. We'll take up the issue later. We have taken it up. Next one. See the damage it has done to ecology. Such a lush green, this is what, can you identify what tree it is? The rain tree, I named it. Look at the deposits, complete defoliations on the road, public road, and now it's almost going to die. You see the rain trees in Mumbai in this season, they are not defoliated. You don't see the, the skeleton like the tree like this, it is still alive, one day it will die. Next one, if there is any, yes, there will be. Mangifera indica, mango. Can you see any mango bearing taking place here? All inflorescences are scorched, burned. Normally, when the inflorescence start withering, you can see small bead like a mango bearing. Then they grow what you call kairi, and then they grow like Alfonso mango, you see. Now, are you going to see any fruiting here? No, it's gone. This is how they outweigh the ecology. I made a statement in the morning, industrial development, urbanization, they outweigh the ecology, and this is it. So let's see, if you go like that, you will not have mangoes, it really continues like that. Next see. The sensitive plant like a banana. Next, probably the last slide. Yes. You can see the surface deposits. All leaves are torn up. No control authorities, pollution control board. They can't see this. So this is a problem. So this is ecological disturbance. One of the reasons is industrialization. See, if dumps are there, you have phytoremediation. The trees which will survive here, they can hold the ecology, but not the one which cannot phytoremediate for particular kind of pollutants. We are not approaching towards that, and that's why the damage continues to happen. And then who will come to restore the ecology, eco restoration? So destruction is so fast against the restoration, and that is our problem. So that's why small contributions by NGOs like us, college like yours, probably. We do a bit of it, so and to be happy with that you have done plantation, done something, talked about it, seminar, meeting, conference, spread the knowledge, and any one of you become industrialists or coming from the house of industry, you shall put the condition to your parents or when you are owning the industry, 
that you are not going to do ecological disturbances by your industry. We have many industries all over the world and no PPM level pollutants in the atmosphere they do. So this uh, sense and sensitivity and principles have to be applied and that's the only way you can restore the ecology. But trees are the center point. With this, uh, thank you very much. I think I have finished in time. Seven minutes more, uh, two minutes more I have taken. Thank you very much. If there are any question, I shall be happy to answer. Thank you so much, sir, for the wonderful session. Uh, the session is open for any questions. If anyone has any questions, please use the chat box or raise the hand. how chemistry and botany are close to each other, right? <laughs> and this exchange of knowledge and ideas. And when you do the plantation next, not only selection of the plant, what you like, but its purpose also can be looked into, you know. Yes, any questions? Uh, yes, sir. I would like to ask one. Sure. Um, after the metals uh, get absorbed, or that is phyto uh, absorbed or adsorbed, whatever it is, uh, it's uptake, normally not huh? at, not absorption. There are absorption, absorption, accumulation, uptake, accumulation. Yeah, by accumulation. That means it, it gets break, broken down into non toxic. Uh, uh, no, no, no. Your question then, is good. Huh. They are in a mineral mineralized form. Say unless chromium six or three in ionic state or lead plus two. It is mineralized and uptaken by the plant. Okay. Yeah. So when it moves as a mineral inside, just like sodium, potassium, and all, they are gone to the particular kind of uh, uh, functioning they do. Now here in the metal, once they are in the woody part of it, they they again can be in any form. It's hydride, oxide, or ionic form. It can reside over there. It can settle there. It can precipitate there. So it yeah. will be not be flow flowing medium like water. So they will be bound there. It was stabilized there, you know, and there is no chance of them using them out, you know. So that is how what happens. Bark itself that gets bound. So like Minamata disease, you know, mercury was used for as a catalyst in acetyl dehyde plant, and they are throwing as a waste. Yeah. A Caesar river, yeah. and it started accumulating organic mercury in the fish. And when you eat fish, you get organic mercury. So that was edible issue that the fish eating, you know, through water. So Minamata disease occurred. You know it very well. The worst example of world's pollution, you know, metal pollution. And now here, this metal resides into the plant in such a way that it will not come into fruit, which is edible. Populace will not have the fruits which will be edible like you know so arjuna katapa say which we experimented they will reside into the body if you log it out and ashing yes get some percentage of metal ions into the ash that is called phyto extractions you know that way yeah. is it clear yes sir I think most of the woody species uh, uh, can be used for phyto remediation is it right Question. Woody, woody, the woody trees. In yeah. fact, if I may add over here, sir, with your kind permission, that uh, this accumulation can uh, occur at three places. That is at the please, please, level. Please. I'll put the mic, micro. One this uh, accumulation one second, one of this uh, heavy metal takes place. Uh, no, one second. At the roof level. Uh, please repeat your question, sir. Uh, I have a question. Hello. Yes. Yeah. So my question is, uh, what is what do you think uh, will be the role that heavy metal will play in developing tolerance in uh, in in various plants like poplar and all? Because recently I I I read up on phytochelatines and metallothermines. So what do you think will be the course of evolution from now on? Uh, yes, these, uh, as far as the, these trees are concerned, this uh, bioaccumulation uh, of these uh, heavy metals 
the lethal level concentrations have to be looked into but they are not they are growing well adjacent to that you could see the native plant over there that has been perished because of the heavy toxins so uh, uh threshold limits if there are any calculated i do not know but uh, your question that uh, what is uh, or you can you repeat it you you you, are, you said about uh, that uh, will it affect yeah. the plants is so, it uh, so how does it affect the course of evolution of such uh, chelating agents or uh, accumulating agents oh no no there is no question of chelating agent these metal ions taken into they are not chelated okay they are mineralized and uptaken in ionic form then they settle in any form like you know maybe metal hydride metal oxide whatever it is okay. but the one okay. which is evapor transpirated say benzene nitrobenzene maybe nitrobenzene dinitrobenzene will be broken into simple benzene a benzene will be also further fragmented nitrogen oxide will be converted into nitric acid like you know or hydro, uh, nitric acid and rain precipitation so these long chain compounds uh, aldehydes or aromatics uh, chain chain compound they are broken into so once you break the compound you are right once you break the compound then its toxicity will be lost there you are like you have you have the nickel or uh, copper a uh, copper shall be toxic mercury can be toxic lead can be once you come to a point a chelation see edta ethylene diamine tetraacetic acid is a chelating agent so you complex it so when you complex the metal ion it it slow changes the property so from toxic it becomes a non toxic so here there is no question of converting into non toxic that toxic element they are inside the plant body But what is evapor transpirated and decomposes? In fact, it decomposes a larger molecule, known for their toxicity or carcinogenicity. They are broken down to that. Once they are broken, the toxicity is lost. So this is how the technology or theory or the natural therapy the works. You know. You can ask a question if you. Hope you have answered your question, and if I understood that. In fact, uh, I would like to add a little bit of information with your permission, sir. Yes, sir. <clears throat> yes, many many years ago, in fact, uh, this work of hydroremediation was actually begun in London by a scientist called A.D. Bradshaw, and that time certain uh, mine waste was just lying barren, and then he. Conducted certain experiments, uh, which I don't want to go into detail, but he converted it to a good football field, so Absolutely. which was a barren line, and by using simple nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium combination of fertilizers, and same work was carried out even in Rajasthan by Dr. Chafikar at Institute of Science, which is popularly called as Zawar Zinc Mines. So this, uh, and another thing, while you were showing me the table. we had detected aluminium along railway tracks to 12000 ppm in the roots and shoots so there is considerable amount of uh, yeah, this is how it has to be observed and yes. to be brought into like see simple seedling like the mustards also they do such yes. a uptake of the calcium 45 cesium 30 37 radioisotopes and is a boon to radioactivity department uh, radiochemistry a cleanser like you know so like that there will be plenty so you can see that reference experiments done by people after knowing that this uptake or remediation takes place uh, chafekar sir used it for some mine he was he was going traveling uh, frequently and some zinc mine he was working yes. so he he must have used some plants for showing that the pollutant can be removed like you know like in prosopis prosopis dulciflora So and that then, is phyto. That is the phyto remedy. And cyanodon normal grass. Don't know what we call. Even the cypress he did in a nala uh, waste water. It was Safekar's experiment. He just quoted. You know, yeah. uh, it was uh, Safekar and uh, Halder doing uh, this work. So they could find uh, 
cypress micro statue something uh, it is a good uptake of selenium and tellurium so exactly. that was a very uh, big thing and very good is plant a, is water hyacinth for water pollutants good phytoremediator uh, which has been carried out successfully yeah. and then they harvest the water harvest uh, water hyacinth that and uh, you but will also do the making. same thing now the technology now this is here we are talking about tree in a larger sense hundreds and thousands of hectares of the lands dumps which were to be considered as a no man's land to be not to be utilized yes. for anything no crop no agriculture nothing so that has become permanent wasteland because you can't dig it out and throw somewhere where you will throw you will contaminate that land so the contaminated land restoration to the normal land it's a great great work done by these people by this phyto remediation and over years later it becomes a normal land you can have like a krugers are doing in europe that plantation they phyto remediates and then land is used for then they move to the next plantation and the this plant is used for paper pulp paper making this paper prints yeah. I don't have any more questions. So I would like to call Angel to deliver vote of thanks. Thank you, sir, for sharing your thoughts and helping us gain the key insights on the technical aspects of trees, its restoration, as in phyto remediation. I am lost for the right adjective to describe how much we enjoyed your session today. We look forward to collaborating with you in the near future to help our future batchmates learn from you. Thank you so much, Professor. Okay, it's my privilege. Thank you. Thank you, Angel. Our final session is by Dr. Nikesh Joshi on the topic "An Approach to Mitigation of Dust and Noise Pollution by Plant Species." To introduce Dr. Nikesh Joshi, I would like to call Vishali Gorbole from Second Year B.Sc. Over to you, Vishali. Dr. Nikesh Joshi has worked in the Department of Botany at Prisby College of Arts, Science, and Commerce. in mumbai for the past 31 years he is an associate professor of botany with a phd in botany he has also worked as a post graduate teacher in plant ecology at the university of mumbai for several years he has directed students in plant ecology urban ecology forest ecology phyto remediation of urban ecosystems and forest as pollution sinks He has several papers and books published, like "Green Spaces: Create Your Own," as well as has worked on an UGC major research project in 2011 that studies on monitoring suspended particulate matter using urban plants and understanding their green health potentials. He has also worked on Dr. S. B. Tafekar in an AICP project, air pollution in and around Bombay urban area. at institute of science mumbai sponsored by moef he has also completed a project called studies on phyto remediation of particulate matter through roadside hedges which was financed by university of mumbai bucd 2010 it's an honor to welcome you sir the dais is all yours thank you very much i will start sharing my screen before i start i am trying to look out for the yeah my topic as you all know is uh, dealing with the uh, remediation of dust okay. can you start share my ppt if you have yes sir yes sir we'll do that Okay, thank you so much. Thank you. At the last moment, you know, you find it difficult to wear your <laughs> kept it. 
<clears throat> since there are many students also over here i will not go too much into the detail of experimental work etc in the sense uh, references etc uh, can we have the next slide please and uh, since our uh, topic is mainly pollution uh, i will not go much into detail with what is pollution what are the different types but we all know that it is very harmful not only for as human beings but for even the plants as well as biological organisms and even material objects can we have the next slide please so these are the different uh, types of air pollutants and what are the effects on your uh, human beings in fact if you are following the newspaper very closely can we have the next slide please if you are following the newspaper very closely the, the ipcc report on climate change has been released and it states that uh, amongst all the different types of uh, pollutants it is the particulate matter what we in common language we call as dust and dust you know since all of some of you are our students are classified on the basis of their diameter some are very large so they are pm10 and some are small so they are pm2.5 this pm2.5 they are saying that it is uh, causing more death deaths in our own country roughly 1.6 million that's what i read today in the morning and uh, apart from the various air pollutants our focus over here in my work today is largely dust can we have the next slide please and this work originated actually this is the basic trend of spm in in mumbai and at different uh, locations you know monitored by the mca gm see th these are monitoring agencies the municipal corporation of greater mumbai central pollution control board these are the agencies which monitor and now you have applications called as suffer also so where ready made you have your data in front of you and we can see that the bombay city has a, a different type of distribution in different uh, wards with the bombay mumbai as we call it is divided into different wards definitely you can see a trend in dust uh, spm can we have the next slide please so it was uh, around in the 80s you know my guy dr tafekar who had conducted the first work around 1978 80s and that time in fact i was reminded of this when dr samant so showed the slide of mantifera indica the mango leaves if you observe very carefully it has a very typical phyllotaxy so they at that time they used mango leaves to monitor pollution in different parts of the city and um, in even in my work in 1990 i had used certain plants which were growing along road side to monitor lead in those days uh, lead was used as a anti knock agent and we found good concentration of lead on the leaves now we have super refined oils and petrols so lead is not a main component so what we thought that uh, why not use these existing plants which are there in our own city for two purposes one is whether we can monitor dust more uh, more actively you know as we say and uh, two if they are good dust monitors these some of these are even proved to be good dust capturers so roughly we had surveyed 20 different sites throughout the year and we had a, a huge amount of data in just to know which are those plants they are collected from the road dividers from the road sides on the edges and uh, studies were carried out can we go to the next slide <clears throat> yeah so see the, uh, what, the reason why i'm sharing this with you is some of you students can carry out certain experiments uh, your own self and also what you can do is that uh, you can involve maybe certain other institutions along with it and have a coordinated project you collect dust this in fact this experiment is also there in the post graduates of mumbai university where you collect the dust from the leaves and you get it to the laboratory you clean the leaves and collect the dust in a filter paper which is pre weighed 
and subsequently you once again weigh the dust by weighing the the filter paper the difference between the two before and after will give you dust next slide please and then in order to collaborate that dust into you know grams per centimeter square you need the leaf area uh, and then convert it into grams per centimeter square in fact this was a, this is a project which was carried out uh, by the resby college under the major ugc project and unfortunately we, you know normally you have to measure leaf area by using a planimeter so it didn't fit in their budget so we had to do with uh, Uh, graph paper method, and uh, there were several plants we studied, in which we found. Now these are herbs, if you see, and some of them are shrubs, calotropis. Uh, some of you may be non-botanists over here. I am sorry that I am using some botanical names, but uh, nevertheless, I think some are very common garden plants: calotropis, ixora, ficus benjamina. Pedilanthus thymeloides is a very interesting plant. When uh, during our course of studies, uh, this Dr. Samant was also talking on phytoremediation. Pedilanthus has even been proved to accumulate chromium at very high concentrations. Nerium odorum current, what is most commonly commonly known as, and Zizippus, that is boar. These have very high dust capturing capacities, and these plants we can easily grow to monitor. Dust and maybe even as uh, dust capturers. Can we have the next slide, please? This is another area. The reason why I am showing you this slide is that when you are having ecological studies, you collect large amount of data. It becomes very necessary to project your data statistically and what are the statistical significance. We had screened more than one hundred and thirty plants for dust. and uh, we had carried out this study uh, in all the 6 months in uh, roughly 100 sites we could isolate four plants that is bougainvillea uh, ficus benjalensis nick then uh, nerium odorum and uh, pedilanthus thymeloides we found that ficus benjamina is extremely good of course all these four plants are very good the best one of course the nerium odorum Uh, ficus uh, bengalensis, uh, Benjamin, uh, sorry, and Pithelium, Pedilanthus thymeloides. The lower graph, if you see, the one, two, three is the months, and this is uh, showed collectively by all these four plants. That is the December, January, February, March, April, May, and then there is the monsoon period. So we did October and November. Can we have the next slide, please? Nerium odorum was one of the plants which we used to monitor dust throughout the year. Now here there there was a slight change we did uh, in monitoring. That is the leaves were uh, washed on the field thoroughly, and they were you know with a rubber band or something they were marked. And after eight days, once again the leaves were collected and dust was estimated. in terms of grams per centimeter square that this is what we call active phytomonitoring this is what we call active phytomonitoring and then from that we collect we constructed a dust map by using nerium odorum and i you see if you coordinate with other institutes it's very easy to do some uh, work something like that because uh, i believe the student community is the most strongest community and uh, in fact we, some of them can even find out variations and improvisations on the current uh, methodologies also can we have the next slide please and needless to say for may may was the dustiest month and uh, as expected highways were very dusty and all these plants which are mentioned over here calotropis ixora coccinea ficus benjamina Benjamina, Pedilanthus thymeloides, Nerium odorum, Jujuba, that is the boar. They are excellent as phytomonitors, and in, since they are excellent as phytomonitors, I would even further put it that you can use this as very good hedges, edges, so that 
some amount of dust can stop flying. See, here a word of caution has to be thrown. Uh, people say, grow more trees, reduce pollution. I think it's only unfair that we throw this responsibility on plants. It is our own uh, failure that we cannot control pollution. Yes, by growing plants, we do make things beautiful, but uh, let's not throw the whole responsibility on them. Let's see the next slide. We had enlisted several trees, shrubs, herbs, which can retain dust, which can hold dust, and which can just capture dust. So, network issues, please. Yes, uh, sir, still to have lost network. We'll wait for it for some time. I thought I lost my connection. <laughs> I hope he has realized. Can you hear me now? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, sir. Yeah, can you hear me now? Yes, yes, yes. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, I will just repeat that the dust chamber was constructed uh, using a plastic uh, sheet, uh, which is 93 centimeters in height. Uh, I will show you the photograph. It is there in the next uh, slide, please. Yeah. So, question comes out to standardize a dust chamber. All right. Can we have the next slide, please? It's so once if I, yeah, this is the dust chamber and uh, you can see there is a funnel attached, which is attached further to a pulley and uh, dust was thrown in this conical, uh, this funnel. You needed to standardize this. So standardization was done by place, placing a greased slide below and with the help of the pulley, you placed some 100, milli, 100 grams of uh, we started with talcum powder and uh, dust was allowed to fall through a sieve. Um, based on trial and error experiments, it was this, they found that number of strokes which were ideal were three. Uh, you know, the grease plates were initially weighed and then they were weighed after uh, giving them the talcum powder. And the difference between that naturally gave us what is the amount of uh, the dust fall or the powder fall. And subsequently, it was standardized. Which, and later on, a plant was kept. Alongside the plant, even a grease plate was kept. You can see uh, in this slide, a slide containing grease plate so that you could uh, you know, subtract the values after the experiment was over. I mean, there is it's a, it's a difference between uh, the amount of dust uh, present on the leaf and on the breeze slide. This was a normal experiment under still conditions. Then we used windy conditions by placing a small fan inside, which, which uh, blew air at the rate of 4 kilometers per hour. So having done this, we, next slide please, we uh, screened more than 150 plants. Can we have the next slide? Yeah. This is the whole procedure uh, which I was just mentioning it to you. 
in case if you all are interested uh, i won't go through this whole procedure uh, which is what i just now told you and it was follow based on the work which was done by uh, a r manchakar of pune university in 2001 and we improvised it uh, by by giving wind or what you call simulated conditions next slide please now you had to dust fall index and uh, dust retention index dust fall index is the amount of dust on the leaf without fan and dust retention index is with the fan so this was what exactly uh, the two formulas mean what is the dust fall index and what is the dust uh, retention index can we have the next slide please and based on that we classified these herbs shrubs climbers uh, on the basis of their percentages that is into uh, excellent good moderate weak these four categories were there so there were roughly uh, what we are interested for phyto monitoring you can say is dust fall index and dust retention index is for say maybe green belt developments so you had eight species three species four shrubs and four herbs including one climber which are good dust very very good retention that means even if after there is a wind slight amount of breeze flowing the dust will be kept on it Uh, so 127 plant species belonging to 52 families were exposed to dust in the dust chamber and the last list was comprised i am not going to give you the full list but nevertheless let's have a look at the list next slide please so this is the list you had and uh, uh, we have prepared histograms so one is dust fall index one is dust retention index and you can see that there are uh, various plants for example azar directa indica has got good dust fall index uh, ficus bengal uh, ficus bengalensis has got do the good dust fall index you had even vilaiti imli what you call pitocolobium dulce uh, very good uh, dust uh, uh, retention as well as dust fall index under shrubs if you compare these histograms and you, you can see lantana camera now keep this plants is, i mean i mean i don't know lantana camera is a very common plant but don um, botanists may not know uh, what it looks like uh, it's a very good common uh, even in gardens they grow nowadays ecobolium is a very good plant for, for dust nerium is one of the best which is there in our studies nerium is grown very widely in bombay along the road sides on traffic islands etc next slide please similarly you have plants like uh, in in this histogram pedilanthus and uh, ada thoda zelenica uh, br- uh, some these are mainly herbs uh, you may find even uh, surprisingly tithonia there is a plant called tithonia it has good amount of dust so normally when we say which plants to grow it has you know many of them give you suggestions we wanted to be sure scientifically that uh, how do we screen this plant so this was a small effort which we did and we could have done it in a still more sophisticated manner Uh, where we consulted certain engineers etc but it wasn't falling into our financial grants so we had to devise uh, certain uh, methodologies which can be scientifically accurate also and for which we had to use certain uh, statistical methods also can we have the next slide please so one of the experiments subsequently which we did was by studying plants which were growing under a tree canopy and uh, we had placed the four plants nerium uh, 
pedilanthus, etc., under tree canopies, and to find out what exactly is the role played by the tree canopy. Can we have the next slide, please? So the, we had selected roughly these six plants, six trees under which that is Delonyx, Ficus bengalensis, Ficus religiosa, Peltoforum, Rain tree that is Samania, uh, Badam tree that is Nunnalia Katappa. And we placed uh, these four ornamental plants, Bougainvillea, Ficus benjamina, Nerium, Pedilanthus. We had placed these under the tree canopies and come after 10 to 12 days and find out how much amount of dust there is. Next slide, please. We had to calculate the canopy area also of the trees. We had to calculate, yeah, yeah. next slide, please. Yeah. So, if you see this histogram, that ficus religiosa, uh, ficus bengalensis, these two are the best canopies. Uh, under which the dust can be accumulated very nicely. So they, they intercept dust uh, very beautifully. In fact, uh, there is some other, uh, we had extended this work and found out that how much amount of dust can one entire tree actually capture. And the amount is significantly very high. If you are growing a tree next to your house, something, it definitely helps in reducing some amount of dust pollution next to your area or maybe, you know, many of the trees, sometimes these grow where they grow very tall. They help in blocking the dust coming into your house. Can we have the next slide, please? So, the cap capacities of tree canopies in capturing dust from more or less are expressed as Peltoforum is one of the best and uh, followed by Religiosa, Ficus Bengalansis, etc. Next slide. So, in general, ornamental plants, they, we can use them as green beds. Two, on roadsides, the ornamental plants can be used as a simpler tool for phytomonitoring. Phytomonitoring, what do we mean by phytomonitoring? Monitoring pollutants with the help of plants. What we just learned is monitoring. And uh, I've written dust and heavy metals because this street side dust contained in certain areas, they contained even chromium. We did one electron uh, diffusion spectrum analysis of dust also. And we found chromium, very little amount of lead was there, but yes, chromium was there. A good amount of uh, aluminium was also found. So, different plants have different dust capturing capacities and trees. They are canopy shapes. They are branching pattern. They also play a very critical role. In fact, when Dr. A.D. Samad was mentioning Mangifera, if, indica, and if you just uh, imagine the leaves, See, they have a very typical orientation. And if you see Mangifera indica leaves around June, April, May, you will find them very dusty. Only the trouble with collecting leaves from trees is how do you reach? So we did manage to do, use a stick, etc. But it becomes difficult. Therefore, we thought that why not use certain herbs which, and shrubs which can grow at the ground level and near traffic signals, etc. We can easily monitor Next slide, please. So, <clears throat> different kinds of factors like leaf form, leaf size, leaf orientation, leaf texture, all these play a very, very important role in, in helping us decide which plants to grow, including uh, what you call as uh, the tree architecture also plays a very important role. So, next slide, please. So, the three main criteria which we would suggest is that trees, shrubs, they should have dense foliage. Evergreen trees are naturally more effective. And species must be resistant to pollutants. The last point is slightly 
how do you know what is resistant and what is not it becomes a completely different topic of uh, of a lecture but they have a list of trees which are tolerant which are sensitive under under a heading which we call it as air pollution tolerance index this uh, is actually something which students also could also do in the labs by collecting the leaves estimating ascorbic acid content ph of the leaf water content of the leaf and that is a formula and you calculate what we call as a pti so that's how you decide what is resistant and what is sensitive etc etc next slide please so this is this is the application value that some of these are very ornamental plants they are easy to grow and they can easily be grown by cutting method and a common man can also serve the nature by growing suitable small ornamental plants and students can be motivated this one of the main interest uh, in me is that uh, students should start taking active participation right from first year level and uh, you know you start developing a scientific attitude and you all you all you all should work in a group rather than working in an isolated manner uh, distribute work among yourselves uh, yeah next slide please so this is another big problem in cities noise nothing is quiet in fact right now when i am talking there is a road construction going on behind i will not go much into detail of the noise levels what is bad what is good but we all know noise has a very bad impact effect on human psychology human beings also and of late there are certain multinationals also who have developed interest in indoor plants in fact some of you may have read certain posts on facebook or something why most uh, definitely you should have these plants in your uh, office or house they reduce pollution and etc uh, etc et let me tell you don't uh, throw the responsibility on the poor plants to reduce pollution noise yes to some extent it can help in the house and not only in the house but even around your house uh, a research has shown that if there is a huge belt of trees and your flat is next to it noise is definitely cut off so any object this is the, this is the, the whole theory that they put sound absorbers nowadays along roads and highways also you may have observed and there is a lot of noise generated around us whether it is indoor noise etc but it becomes difficult to have sound proof walls chambers etc so let's see whether we can use plants that that was uh, the project uh, next slide please uh, that was one of the projects uh, ugc projects by dr ambika joshi and her student uh, payal rani where they had you know they had done noise mapping so we were just contemplating that uh, what else can we do we'll have to find out uh, some methodology uh, where how do we decide which plant to grow and this idea resurfaced in my mind when i was visiting a physics laboratory where they have what is called as an impedance tube i think in first year bsc they have this experiment and by just casual conversation i asked the teacher and he said that there is an impedance tube uh, on one end of it you can generate noise and from the other end uh, it can uh, monitor it if it is connected to a oscillometer let's see the next slide what this particular slide is showing you the same thing so uh, the yeah. can we have the previous slide i if, if you don't mind yeah see this on the left hand side you can see and below there is a tube this is the impedance tube which is on the right this cardiogram thing what you see is the oscilloscope and it is collect connected to a, a, a generator and converter noise is introduced on, from one side by and it is absorbed on the other hand by a very sensitive microphone which is called an omnidirectional microphone 
uh, and leaf material. So you, we, we place the leaf material, sound in terms of hertz is generated and then it is calculated by measuring the lengths of these waves. Can we have the next slide now? Of course, we needed a science person. This is exactly what I just described to you, that it is a closed system and the plant is placed in between a omnidirectional speaker and a moving microphone. And sound is introduced at different frequencies with the help of an amplifier. Now, this incident sound is released through the speaker, passes through the leaf which is collected on the microphone. And the collected sound is interpreted using the standard wave pattern on the oscilloscope, which I told you. And these wave heights are used to calculate what is called as sound absorption ratio. And this is where the science person, the physics person helped us to find out what is the Sabine's formula. So can we have the next slide, please? So uh, this is what that we place different leaves of different plant species. And we studied that. Can we have the next slide, please? We studied sound at different frequencies from 500 hertz to 1 kilohertz. Uh, for normal human sensitivity uh, of the ear is 500 hertz. So for the sake of discussions, we had kept 500 hertz as the main uh, frequency. And the microphone was kept in the middle of the tube, which was connected to the CRO, which gets con con converted into electrical impulses. And for better sensitivity, a crystal micro microphone was used. So I have already described that how the material was placed on and voltages were studied before and after mounting the specimen. Can we have the next slide? This is giving you the details of what is the diameter of the tube, the length of the tube, and, and for all the frequencies, the distances of the microphone of the speaker was noted. So you, we took values of a blank and then we took values of leaves. And especially if there were compound leaves, then the leaves were stuck on a thin paper and the readings were taken with the paper and leaf and of the paper only. So every time this was done, next slide, please. So at every frequency, we used to conduct this experiment. Now, I won't go too much into the physics part of this, but uh, sound absorption coefficient of different plants was studied at from 500 to nearly 8 kilohertz. Next uh, slide, please. This is what we had to, for calculation, that is amp1, amp2 divided by amp1 is what is our sound absorption ratio is, which is, this is the main formula which we relied on. Lower the ratio, higher is the absorption, which is what the conclusion was. And so we had around 50 to 60 different species and we found out what is the sound absorption ratio. Can we have the next slide, please? So, Ficus elastica, Agalonima, Polius, Ixora, Pedilanthus, Nephrolepis, Chlorophytum, Bougainvillea. Next slide, please. And uh, these are the various readings. And uh, lower, see, uh, our focus was 500 HZ. Lower the ratio, better the noise absorption capacity of the plant. So here you have sensibilia, that is mother's tongue or mother-in-law's tongue, I don't know. Who knows. You can see the value 0.33, polius 0.33, very good. And uh, sensibilia has thick leaves. So if you place these plants indoor, especially if it is an office, uh, why I say office? Because office normally has a closed system, the air conditioned 24 by 7. There is some reverberation, so in order to reduce that, you can always uh, use certain plants like these, which is mentioned over here. Ficus elastica is the best one you can uh, see from this uh, particular table. 
natural area, it's the rubber plant and thick leaves. But what we needed was a good scientific evidence. You know, people say, oh, use this plant, use this plant. But we should be scientifically proper in our conclusions. Next slide, please. So, this is what I said, that lower the... Sir, we can hear you. You can hear? Okay. So, you can hear now? Yes. Sir. Yeah. So, plants like Ficus elastica, Coleus, Ixora, Pedilanthus, Sensivaria. And keep in mind, if you know these plants, they have a... Hello? Yes, sir, yes. Sir. Yeah, can you hear now? Yeah, I think it's the video. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Okay. So can be placed in offices with water. Can can we have the next slide, please? This was in fact, my gratitude to my guide, Dr. Karmakar, Dr. Jafikar, Dr. Payal Rane, who has done the work on noise pollution, and Dr. Alkama Faki, my student, whose work was on dust chamber. And, uh, you know, you have to thank your wife also. Of course, her contribution was over. Uh, thank you. Any questions, please? Thank you so much, sir, for such a wonderful session. If anyone has any questions, can you uh, please type in the chat box or you can raise the hand. Um, no questions. I guess there are no questions. Yeah, I, I, uh, Dr. Joshi, uh, I just wanted to ask you, yeah, if I remember you have worked on highways, you could have, uh, you, can you just highlight on what uh, trees or plants uh, can be used for a particular situation? It, it, can you uh, highlight on that? Hello? Again, you lost? Yeah. Yeah. Oh. Well, you heard my question. You can hear now? Yeah, yeah, we can hear you. Um, okay. Yeah. Well, um, just to highlight on those uh, trees, a certain species of trees or uh, plants which can be specifically used for highways or uh, certain uh, places where there can be a lot of uh, dust pollutions or air pollutions. Kind of. Right. So, uh, See, it depends on where exactly you want to grow this particular... Uh, uh, if you are talking about Bombay, etc., uh, uh, the list which we have generated, uh, Nerium is an, an excellent plant. Uh, to some extent, even Thespatia is a very good plant. We are talking about trees. Yes, yes. On mm -hmm. highways, you have multitude of areas. You have, On the side, you can grow trees. In the center, you can grow shrubs. And depending on your uh, availability, etc. You can select the plants from the list which is mentioned. I prefer to grow even pedilanthus because it is a xerophyte, doesn't need much amount of water. In fact, I tried not giving it any water for nearly 15 days, it survived. So, pedilanthus is a very good one. Ixora is a very good plant. Uh, it, it has been to, observed. To capture dust. Uh, <clears throat> yeah. It has been observed the scap of trees and then... Uh... 
Saptaparni, that is Aristonia scolaris, and all Aristonia. these things are very commonly grown all along the divider, right. especially right. in Parla. Do you right. think it is right? Yes, yes, it is. See, um, the morphology of a tree plays a very big role. Alstonia has, I think, world phyllotaxy, if I'm not mistaken. World, world, yeah. Right, and uh, Nerium also has world phyllotaxy. Yeah. So these plants um, definitely has a very good uh, capacity. Nerium has an added advantage that it has even uh, hairs, trichomes, yeah. etc. So it can capture dust. So leaf morphology. Leaf orientation, the Mangifera indica is an ex excellent example of how leaf orientation plays a very important role. However, um, it is not to use more, you know, green belts, etc. Now that becomes a different issue of social forestry, that what are the objectives, etc. Mm -hmm. And leaf surface area too. Leaf surface area also plays an important role. Mm -hmm. Yeah, many places the nerium has been uh, planted in uh, uh, rows, like you know, it's, it's a, a, a very effective. And very noise, effective. yeah, noise pollution scale, I think uh, the bird banyan uh, and such evergreen plants are uh, generally. They, both these are even xerophytes. Nerium also doesn't need too much water, and we have a severe problem of water because we do not have a proper watering system still in our cities or even on our, on our highways. Maybe they are watered once in three days, something like that. So uh, there are several factors we have to keep in mind and then start growing. Unless if there is some, uh, you know, company who's looking after some yeah. certain patch of land or uh, that that is different. In earlier days, I remember even now why Godrej also yeah. has sponsored. Yeah. They adopt, adopt a certain area. And then, yeah. Yeah. Now I don't know I, uh, whether the rules have changed or no. But nowadays you find very less. Uh, Adoption people <laughs> for <laughs> traffic islands. <laughs> no, when when it is adopted and then being cut for uh, various developmental projects, then uh, the very purpose for planting itself is defeated. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. So anyway, that is the current uh, uh, thing, uh, current developments. But uh, they were uh, especially I have been noticing the trees that are standing in in front of Mithibai, and all of them are facing hacking because of the metro project. Yeah. Mithibai is the area since I know that place. Mm -hmm. It was the third most dustiest traffic island. Yes, yes. There was a small yeah. traffic island in between. And uh, we had collected, I think, those days pedilanthus and some Ixora species were growing. They keep changing this every six months and all that. Yeah, yeah. And, and plus construction activity was going on That's in 2011, 12, 13 of, of that particular road. Yeah. So my my objective was that at school and college level, college level, you know, colleges like Xavier's are there, they can coordinate maybe along with your know, Xavier Institute, colleague systems, schools, uh, so these small experiments of dust, you know, you can improvise also. I always believe if you want the best ideas, go to the students and uh, out of 100, you will definitely find four or five who are genuinely interested. And they may, and in fact, some of my students have already submitted something in uh, uh, that um, the university, Avishkar. Mm -hmm. Though the, some of them get disheartened, uh, sir, everything is biochemistry. That doesn't mind. You have to, you, 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 you do work and uh, don't bother about the results. Same thing about some, some students are here, I can see, and uh, they can start work on their own. And yeah. do some reference work. I am always available if you need any help or guidance for that matter. Feel free. Uh, Dr. Shinde knows me very well and you can contact me. Even phytoremediation with Dr. Savant was talking on. Students can conduct small experiment on seed germination or an effect on different heavy metals. You can do certain experiments on petri plates, petri dishes, etc. All right. Yeah. That's a good suggestion. So thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much, sir, for giving your insight on such a meaningful topic today. It was indeed a really amazing experience for me that I got to learn so much from you today. I would like to thank you for your patience and time on behalf of St. Xavier's College. We look forward for future guidance and collaborations with you. It was a pleasure to have you, sir. Have a good day ahead. Thank you. Thank you.
Thank you so much, sir. Thank you, Rushali. I would now like to call upon Dr. Sashi Rekha Suresh Kumar to read out the rapporteur's report. Dr. Sashi Rekha is a former head of the Botany Department, Miti Bai College, Associate Professor, and member of Senate from the Teachers' Constituency. The teaching experience of around thirty-two years, and areas of interest in mycology, angiosperms, and medicinal botany. She has presented about twenty papers and published around six. With multiple MSc and PhD students learning under her, she is teaching students new things every day. She is a lifetime member of the Mycological Society of India, Indian Association of Angiosperm Taxonomy, Indian Botanical Society, etc., and is the chairperson of the Mycological Society of India (MSN) Mumbai. She is also executive committee member of the BUCTU since 2010. It is a matter of great privilege to have you with us for this session today. Now this online dais is all yours. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much. I just wanted to make one correction. Uh, uh, the experience is thirty-seven years. Uh, probably that is the uh, uh, one which was given earlier uh, that we had taken. That's uh, that's okay. Thank Sorry, you. Sorry, ma'am. Yeah, no, no. Are you? Thank, thank you for the introduction. I didn't expect the introduction for a rapporteur. <laughs> okay. Tree eco restoration is an apt uh, title for the present uh, uh, seminar, the, uh, uh, our national seminar of Friends of Trees, and uh, this is so suitable because the current situation prevailing throughout the world is uh, it is the hour need of the hour that we need to understand uh, the science behind eco restoration and the use of trees for such a purpose, and. Uh, This uh, session began with a wonderful uh, presentation of prayer song, which which depicted the nature and the problems that the nature is facing, and it was a lovely song. And the word, uh, uh, the line which went on, "Ki uh, chaya dunde dundan jala," that is actually what we are doing. We are going searching for shade uh, in in the urban areas, and a uh, lo uh, lovely uh, presentation of the prayer song. and um, after that was the inauguration by uh, principal dr rajendra shinde dr firoza goldrej who is the uh, uh, present emeritus of uh, friends of trees dr ad sabal a uh, president current president of friends of trees now all these uh, topic the eco restoration topic uh, was very uh, thoughtfully the speakers were selected for this and the, all the speakers were um, wonderful in their presentation and such a lot of information was shared i'll just uh, try to uh, brief us uh, uh, the sessions that had happened uh, initially we had the uh, ecological consultant that that is dr kethi rate uh, who is the ecological consultant of icos and she spoke on understanding ecological restoration that is she actually explained it in such a simplified manner where uh, the necessity for uh, uh, eco restoration uh, was very clearly uh, explained and that most prime most mature ecosystem were lost that is what she pointed out that the most mature ecosystem mature ecosystem is what is a climax natural uh, stand that is uh, that was uh, there and that is very few of them are uh, existing in their primary conditions and all that we see as forests in many places are in the uh, secondary uh, ecosystem or secondary forest conditions and um, this was actually related to, to the destruction in the view of continuous development and um, the eco restoration was is an attempt to uh, correct the damage done so uh, that's what uh, is the main uh, uh, the thing for definition of eco restoration and that's uh, she explained it very well she pointed out that existing uh, forest in many region is a secondary ecosystem as i just mentioned and this is the activity uh, for the eco restoration is purely human centric is what she pointed out and her observation is absolutely correct because most of the afforestation and implantation that happens here tree plantation that happens are mainly uh, uh, related to a certain uh, economic uh, uh, requirement or many a times it is unscientific in whichever place it is being planted and that is what she was uh, she expressed her uh, uh, opinion that uh, uh, if it was more towards the restoration of the ecological conditions that would be better when we do such kind of plantations and it is necessary to understand 
the regional requirement regional uh, understanding the regional ecosystem so that the choice of species are uh, done in such a way that the social cultural uh, practices are also taken care of she uh, went on to explain the case study of her uh, uh, western ghats and sacred groves where she pointed out there are two types of species that is the generalist species and the specialist species the specialist species she mentioned that are the ones which are originally present there and it they indicate the native ones which are uh, which were existing right from the beginning and the generalist species are the opportunistic ones which uh, uh, come in wherever there is a uh, removal of the plant species or degradation of land they manage to grow there so this was an interesting information even to me and uh, if we are able to uh, distinguish between these two and uh, uh, give more preference to uh, the, the plant species that are present there and conserve them and start the plantation after we conserve the existing species was uh, what she had uh, pointed out and um, this implementation um, she went on to describe uh, uh, the uh, the importance of the soil that is uh, necessary to be um, uh, restored the, uh, once the soil is restored it enhances the functional processes ecological processes and biological communities automatically are revived and uh, it, it, it is uh, the place is restored and this helps in uh, retaining the soil moisture and uh, uh, the eco restoration process is a success uh, it also prevents the um, erosion and uh, such thing the social benefits like you know when the plants are uh, selected for eco restoration the social benefits of the tree species uh, for a local person is also taken into account and whatever uh, 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 after plantation is uh, uh, of benefit it is uh, shared and she pointed out one uh, contribution of uh, dr uh, mr atul kulkarni who is an actor and uh, he had he had donate on uh, donated his land for this kind of eco restoration process and i really appreciate a uh, person like uh, such persons who are donating their land for eco restoration purposes it would be really uh, good if many people if they are having such uh, uh, land uh, which can be used for this purpose maybe we could uh, do a little bit of more greening uh, around in uh, the place um there are lots of things she had discussed she discussed about the urban biodiversity parks where the, uh, the floral diversity and the considerable uh, choice uh, uh, consider the choice of species which has to be considered accordingly uh, uh, it should also be related to the faunal diversity it's not only the floral diversity that should be connected to the faunal diversity also that will be a complete eco restoration and uh, uh, obviously the distribution of the plant species that are uh, done is based on the climatic conditions which have to be obviously uh, studied before any plantation is carried out this was uh, followed by uh, uh, the talk by dr usha lanchung lanchung pa who is a retired principal chief research officer uh, department of forest environment government of sikkim and she spoke of role of trees for eco restoration in sikkim himalayas now here she gave such a wonderful explanation obviously the terrain itself is different what we see in the tropical region what we see in the temperate region and what we see along the mountains and the mountain slopes are absolutely different and the tree species distribution of tree species are also very different and here she specifically spoke of the areas of uh, as a uh, area of landslides and avalanche she specifically spoke of a, a place lanchum which uh, had more of these landslide landslide uh, occurrences landslide and avalanches and how dangerous it was for the vegetation as well as the uh, property and people around and uh, how important uh, uh, it was uh, to um, uh, be very careful of uh, planting the uh, trees uh, i mean tree species there and because this area she spoke of was mainly the importance of forests in human wildlife conflict because of uh, these various things um, the uh, forests were used for various developmental projects for example blasting the uh, uh, area for ro building roads and many uh, such kind of developmental uh, uh, process she went on to tell about the history of himalaya uh, mountains which are still rising and she described it as a young mountain and a young uh, sikkim mountains as a young mountain and uh, 
having unique climate uh, uh, for flora and fauna and uh, a specific habitat for uh, uh, tribals and yak, hab yak habitat which cannot be uh, paralleled with the other areas and she also said there was a lot of uh, different types of birds that were observed in that places and um, having uh, more of uh, wildlife uh, sorry, obviously these were, uh, she spoke of the secondary forest that uh, uh, arose in such areas, wherever there was landslides occurring, she pointed out there was a species of alder, alder uh, uh, species and along with a bamboo uh, type of uh, uh, bamboos which grew uh, on uh, such uh, spots and they grew naturally. That means there were some species which naturally occupied the area of landslides. Uh, landslides. That is, this is a natural behavior of the uh, earth, mother earth to uh, recoup and cover the area that has been scarred. Okay, so automatically these alders were occupying and uh, gradually wherever the landslide is occurring, these secondary forests have uh, uh, come into existence. So uh, in certain places, uh, which are difficult regions for restoration, physical attempts have been made to, by putting boulders, which can uh, stop the soil erosion and retain water and also uh, encourage certain uh, vegetational growth. She pointed out the tree ferns, uh, which are uh, native to such areas, were uh, also uh, one of them, which automatically, uh, I mean, uh, which uh, naturally regenerated in such uh, places along with the elders. Um, and uh, this explains the uh, association uh, between associative behavior of probably, if I, 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 in, in my opinion, the associative behavior of the elder, elder, plant, elder trees and the tree ferns, if they are present in the same, uh, could be of a useful uh, this thing. In, in short, she said, ki in Sikkim, the ecosystem is very unstable because of these occurrences. And uh, in spite of all these, there, uh, there was a lot of eco-restoration activity which, has, uh, uh, which she has been doing in, such, in those areas. And she also pointed out the cryptomeria species are the exotic species, uh, which was planted earlier by, uh, uh, from, uh, I, forget, I forget the place from where it was brought, but this is an exotic species, but it's a fast colonizer. And because of that uh, uh, factor, it was constantly being planted and the most of the slopes in uh, uh, Sikkim were, are occupied by scriptomeria, which uh, forms a, a kind of a secondary uh, forest. So in short, Sikkim, uh, she, she actually uh, portrayed the um, problems that the uh, slopes are facing in, in terms of uh, uh, specific eco-restoration activity, but still there, there are uh, various uh, types of uh, uh, um, eco-restoration happening there. Now, this talk was followed by Dr. Ran Rajan, uh, Ranjan Panda, popularly known as Waterman of Odisha, uh, first Green Hero awardee of uh, Convene and Convener Combat Climate Change Network India. Now, he actually brought, on, brought in to, uh, he highlighted a, a very important factor for eco restoration. We are talking about plants and animals. He spoke about people, <clears throat> that is the uh, tribals, Adivasis and uh, trees as a close-knit family. He actually uh, uh, explained how closely they are related to each other and how, uh, how we will be at home, like uh, protective of all the members uh, present in the home, uh, present in the house, and how we would try to fight any kind of adversities. In the same way, the Adivasis are more protective of the forest that they are totally dependent on and they are more concerned with uh, uh, conserving the uh, ecosystems and they are uh, capable of fighting the climate change. So here mainly it is social ecology uh, which he uh, focused on linking the Adivasis as a part of the ecosystem, protectors of the forest for their basic requirements and they highlighted uh, and he highlighted the facts of dependence of human on forests the climate change eff uh, effects, that is water crisis, food crisis, and the local initiatives to combat these uh, food crises and sufferings. These indigenous community obviously will have to be uh, uh, understood and the coexistence of the people and wildlife has to be properly understood when we talk of eco-restoration. So uh, the ecosystem-based approaches 
uh, for the conservation is a better solution rather than uh, uh, selecting a species and uh, going uh, doing its plantations in terms of uh, economic importance only or in terms of certain specific uh, plant species to have a successful uh, um, eco restoration and also which is useful for the local communities. <clears throat> the Adivasis consider the uh, forest as a heritage rather than plantation. So they don't feel that the plantation is necessary. Natural regeneration happens in the forest. So they believe more in that way, uh, that kind of a, uh, a regeneration of important trees and they protect the forest ecosystem and natural uh, forest. <clears throat> so I, uh, they, uh, uh, she also pointed out that instead of having mass plantation of a particular species in the forest region, which totally disturbs the natural uh, uh, ecosystem, natural setup of the ecosystem, structure of the ecosystem, and it also causes serious concerns uh, of ecology of restoration. That is the very uh, um, purpose, for, uh, purpose for which the uh, forest uh, is standing there that is lost when you have these kind of uh, mass plantation or monoculture plantations. So um, there are some uh, places uh, that she also pointed out that, uh, sorry, he also pointed out that uh, there's a ray of hope that is recently in uh, countries like UK, US uh, and Brazil, I think he mentioned, uh, traditional lands are being returned to these communities in con uh, and giving them recognition as an indigenous part. So this is a very nice move and I hope uh, uh, in India also such kind of uh, um, activity happens and uh, uh, the, the tribal people or the indigenous people are also benefited out of this. So facilitating community forest must be encouraged um, and this actually calls for studies in ethno-anthropology and ethno-ecology to empower students and people working with uh, EIA, that is Environmental Impact uh, Assessment for Developmental Projects. So this is just a, um, uh, my opinion that I have put in here because he was uh, talking of uh, community forest and actually the study has to be carried out to understand the relation and uh, the eco restoration has to go along these lines where each one of his, uh, each uh, uh, individual in a trophy, in a food chain or in the ecosystem is benefited. So identifying committed individuals for such of such communities uh, who are having the knowledge of alternate species, food species, like uh, he mentioned an uh, uh, incident where uh, certain food uh, species was not available and uh, people in the forest region, the tribal people did not have any problem because they knew key if uh, uh, potato he mentioned, if potato was not available, they have some other food uh, which is uh, having the same kind of uh, uh, thing, properties that can be used. So no, these knowledge of food species in a forest is also very important. So working together with uh, such uh, uh, individuals of the indigenous community along with the scientific community is going to be a wonderful success uh, towards eco restoration. Okay, this was followed by lunch. And I should say, I really missed the lunch of St. Xavier's College because I had to eat my, one, uh, my own food here alone. And I would have enjoyed it if it was an offline uh, seminar, but uh, uh, and that's it. This is how we have to, uh, when we had the uh, online <coughs> uh, sessions. So, since it's an online seminar, we have to face it. So this was again, the second session started with uh, Sri Srinivasan Kasinathan, who was a, who's a project associate of Rainforest Restoration Program, Nature Conservation Foundation. He spoke on ecological restoration of uh, degraded rainforest in Anamale Hills, uh, Anamale Hills in Western Ghats. And he actually spoke of the um, actual uh, method of uh, 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 investigating and uh, working out, uh, assessing the place for eco restoration and uh, assessing the extent of damage, degradation in the rainforest, its implication, and the investigation investigations were. Uh, uh, focused on change in the forest structure and the community structure. And uh, the area of study was Anamale Hills, which uh, had the uh, problems that uh, was facing in that place was uh, fragmentation of the habitat. 
that is fragmentation of the forest separated by tea plantations, which are owned by private companies um, and also eucalyptus uh, plantations. So there he uh, went on to explain the uh, specific uh, uh, requirement of the rainforest uh, tree species, which uh, where certain species have almost become uh, critically endangered because of the change in the habitat, because of the change in the habitat conditions, it, uh, certain species are uh, uh, getting endangered. Uh, and uh, not only uh, plants, also the animals which are specific, uh, which are endemic to that area. So now when we are uh, planning these e eco restoration, uh, this thing assessment has to be also focused on not only the tree species, also on the uh, animal species, uh, uh, which will help us, uh, which will help the eco restoration process is what he uh, pointed out. And he said ki, uh, they had also raised a nursery where they pointedly collected the seeds which are outside the forest region so that the forest, uh, the seeds inside the forest are allowed to uh, re regenerate naturally. So those seeds were not collected and those which are outside the forest uh, uh, regions were uh, collected and a nursery was maintained to uh, uh, plant more uh, trees inside the uh, in area. Uh, Another thing which he also pointed out he, uh, in the nursery packets, the soil had to be less compacted. It should be less compacted since it's a, a rainforest species. It needs a loose, uh, uh, much porous kind of a uh, soil, which uh, this is a very important when we do these nursery management. And along with that, tree phenology was also studied and forest dynamics for a long term uh, research. Now, so far, we uh, the discussion was focused on uh, um, forest areas and then restoration in the forest areas. Uh, Dr. Savant he spoke of the urban urbanization and the problems caused in the urban areas. That is the pollution, the uh, uh, the other uh, related uh, damages caused due to urbanization, and uh, he spoke on that and how trees play a very important role in combating. Uh, uh, this, uh, this, uh, uh, all these uh, damages caused. That is, uh, as a phyto remediator, as a phyto remediator, he is focused mainly on metal pollution, uh, which is uh, present in the soil, the and the dust filtration, which uh, happens where uh, where the plants are, um, he uh, plants are grown to uh, mitigate the pollution in the soil and. Uh, uh, yeah, and the trans, uh, transition mechanism in the plants for metal accumulation. So the plant as a uh, tree species involved in phytofiltration, phytoextraction, phytostabilization and accumulation was what he had explained. And he also um, uh, cited certain experiments which he had carried out uh, to examine the tolerance of plants to metal pollution. And finally, um, yeah, finally, we had uh, Dr. Nitesh Joshi, Associate Professor of Botany at Rizvi College, um, uh, who spoke on an approach for mitigation of dust and noise pollution using plant species. And this was very interesting because this is also connected to the urban uh, situation. And he spoke of uh, the uh, investigation that he had carried out uh, uh, to uh, 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 evaluate the air pollution, the level of air pollution and types of particulate pollutants in Mumbai um, and also heavy metals were in, uh, assessed. Investigation of existing trees for dust capture was what he focused on. Uh, see, just to see the, all those trees that are standing there and how much of uh, um, dust capture is happening and that uh, those experiments, he explained it very well. And um, he also uh, 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 highlighted the certain species of trees which are e effective dust filters, screening of which we had done. And then he added up, added it up to with the description of the plants as a uh, effective noise absorption, effective for noise absorption. So many plants uh, can also be a effective noise reducer. So uh, it, this highlights the different roles of trees uh, and appropriate tree species which have to be uh, selected and uh, planted in, uh, in correct sites so that the purpose for reducing the pollution is uh, fulfilled. And, uh, and uh, the many plants, according to him, were uh, uh, he had screened uh, and identified as effective noise reducer. So um, this was uh, overall a wonderful 
uh, seminar of uh, understanding the trees in the natural situation and in the urbanized uh, situation. And uh, I'm sure all the students and uh, participants would have benefited by this uh, seminar. And I'm very thankful to all the speakers for giving us such an enlightened enlightenment. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Sashirita. Uh, now I would like to request Mr. Saif Khan to come and give a vote of thanks and end the session. Over to you, sir. Yes, sir. Am I audible to you? Yeah. Yes, sir. You are audible. Okay. So, good evening to one and all gathered here on this wonderful evening. I would like to present my vote of thanks. I take this golden opportunity to thank our patrons, Dr. Firoza J. Godrej, President Emeritus, National Society of the Friends of the Trees, and Dr. Rajendra D. Shinde, Principal, St. Xavier's College Autonomous, Mumbai. I would like to thank our convener for the seminar, Dr. Vijaya Lobo, Assistant Professor, Department of Botany, St. Xavier's College. And then I would like to thank our reporter for the day, Dr. Sashirekha Suresh Kumar, former head, Department of Botany, Mitiwai College. I would like to thank our speakers for the day who made our day very informative, Dr. Ketki Gate, Dr. Usha Lakjumpa, Dr. Ranjan Panda, Professor Dr. A.D. Savan, Dr. Nitesh Joshi, and Shri Srivanavasan Kasi Nathan. I would also like to thank members of the St. Xavier's College who helped us in this seminar, Professor Kevin J. De Cruz, Associate Professor, Department of Botany, Mr. Alo Gure, in charge head, Department of Botany, Dr. Rajdeo Singh, Assistant Professor, Department of Botany, and Mr. Praveen Kale, Assistant Curator, Latin Herbarium, St. Xavier's College. Uh, I would also like to thank Anushka and Shubham for managing the en this entire seminar so well. And last but not least, I would like to thank all the students and my colleagues of St. Xavier's College and other colleges as well for attending this seminar and making the day fruitful. Thank you so much once again. Thanks to all FOT members, the managing yes. committee of FOT for supporting this activity and giving us the opportunity to conduct this seminar on our platform. Thank you, Dr. Godrej, uh, Sakina ma'am and uh, Savan sir. Thank you very much. Yeah, now you've unmuted me. Thank you very, very much. I think host had kept me muted. It was really a... <laughs> wonderful uh, whole day entire day and uh, i'm looking forward to reading the articles dr rajendra the entire team at xavier's vijaya anushka you anchored very well and all the introductions were very succinct and good i greatly appreciated it thank you i just missed the one after lunch but i was on the others as well thank you ma'am thank you thank you ma'am ma all the very very best and Hopefully, as you all said, next year we'll It'll do it yeah. <laughs> in the college. Yes. In the college, yes. Yeah. But I'm glad we did it. Thank you so much for all the hard work. It's really hard work. All, yeah. uh, all of them, Sikkim, everyone, Kitki, everyone was very, very good. Yeah. Thank, Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye. Bye, ma'am. Thank you. Bye, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you, Vijaya Anushka.